Poems and Prologue to Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One by francois rabelais translated by sir thomas urquhart poems and prologue to the honoured noble translator of rabelais rabelais whose wit prodigiously was made all men professions actions to invade with so much furious vigour as if it had lived o'er each of them and each had quit yet with such happy slight and careless skill as like the serpent doth with laughter kill so that although his noble leaves appear antic and gottish and dull souls forbear to turn them o'er lest they should only find nothing but savage monsters of a mind no shapen beauteous thoughts yet when the wise seriously strip him of his wild disguise melt down his dross refine his massy ore and polish that which seemed rough cast before search his deep sense unveil his hidden mirth and make that fiery which before seemed earth conquering those things of highest consequence what's difficult of language or of sense he will appear some noble table writ in the old egyptian hieroglyphic wit where though you monsters and grotescoes see you meet all mysteries of philosophy for he was wise and sovereignly bred to know what mankind is how it may be led he stooped unto them like that wise man who rid on a stick when his children would do so for we are easy sullen things and must be laughed aright and cheated into trust whilst a black piece of phlegm that lays about dull menaces and terrifies the rout and cajoles it with all its peevish strength piteously stretched and botched up into length whilst the tired rabble sleepily obey such opiate talk and snore away the day by all his noise as much their minds relieves as caterwauling of wild cats frights thieves but rabelais was another thing a man made up of all that art and nature can form from a fiery genius he was one whose soul so universally was thrown through all the arts of life who understood each stratagem by which we stray from good so that he best might solid virtue teach as some gainst sins of their own bosoms preach he from wise choice did the true means prefer in the fool's coat acting the philosopher thus hoary aesop's beasts did mildly tame fierce man and moralize him into shame thus brave romances while they seem to lay great trains of lust platonic love display thus would old sparta if a seldom chance showed a drunk slave teach children temperance 
thus did the later poets nobly bring the scene to height making the fool the king and noble sir you vigorously have trod in this hard path unknown ununderstood by its own countrymen tis you appear our full enjoyment which was our despair scattering his mists cheering his cynic frowns for radiant brightness now dark rabelais crowns leaving your brave heroic cares which must make better mankind and embalm your dust so undeceiving us that now we see all wit in gascon and in cromarty besides that rabelais is conveyed to us and that our scotland is not barbarous j de la salle <sighs> rabelophila the first decade the commendation musa canas nostrorum testimonio amorum et gargantueas perpetuata faces utque homini tali resultet nobilis echo quid quid fama canit pantagruelis erit the argument here i intend mysteriously to sing with a pen plucked from fame's own wing of gargantua that learned breech-wiping king decade the first <laughs> one help me propitious stars a mighty blaze benumbs me i must sound the praise of him hath turned this crabbed work in such heroic phrase too what wit would not court martyrdom to hold upon his head a laurel of gold where for each rich conceit a pumpian pearl is told three and such a one is this art's masterpiece a thing ne'er equalled by old greece a thing ne'er matched as yet a real golden fleece four vice is a soldier fights against mankind which you may look but never find for tis an envious thing with cunning interlined five and thus he rails at drinking all before em and for lewd women does be em and brings their painted faces and black patches to the quorum six to drink he was a furious enemy contented with a sixpenny with diamond hat-band silver spurs six horses pie seven and four tobaccos pate rotunding smoke much had he said and much more spoke but twas not then found out so the design was broke <laughs> eight muse fancy faith come now arise aloud assembled in a blue-veined cloud and this tall infant in angelic arms now shroud nine to praise it further i would now begin wert now a thoroughfare and inn it harbours vice though it be to catch it in a gin ten 
therefore my muse draw up thy flowing sail and acclimate a gentle hail with all thy art and metaphors which must prevail iam prima oceani pars est praeterita nostri imparibus restat danda secunda modis quam si praestiterit mentem daemon malus addam cum sapiens totus prodierit rabelais male volus reader the errata which in this book are not a few are casually lost and therefore the translator not having leisure to collect them again craves thy pardon for such as thou mayst meet with the author's prologue to the first book most noble and illustrious drinkers and you thrice precious pockified blades for to you and none else do i dedicate my writings alcibiades in that dialogue of plato's which is entitled the banquet whilst he was setting forth the praises of his schoolmaster socrates without all question the prince of philosophers amongst other discourses to that purpose said that he resembled the silenes silenes of old were little boxes like those we may now see in the shops of apothecaries painted on the outside with wanton toyish figures as harpies satyrs bridled geese horned hares saddled ducks flying goats thilla hearts and other such-like counterfeited pictures at discretion to excite people unto laughter as silenus himself who was the foster-father of good bacchus was wont to do but within those capricious caskets were carefully preserved and kept many rich jewels and fine drugs such as balm ambergris amomon musk civet with several kinds of precious stones and other things of great price just such another thing was socrates for to have eyed his outside and esteemed of him by his exterior appearance you would not have given the peel of an onion for him so deformed he was in body and ridiculous in his gesture he had a sharp pointed nose with the look of a bull and countenance of a fool he was in his carriage simple boorish in his apparel in fortune poor unhappy in his wives unfit for all offices in the commonwealth always laughing tippling and merrily carousing to every one with continual jibes and cheers the better by those means to conceal his divine knowledge now opening this box you would have found within it a heavenly and inestimable drug a more than human understanding an admirable virtue matchless learning invincible courage unimitable sobriety certain contentment of mind perfect assurance and an incredible misregard of all that for which men commonly do so much watch run sail fight travel toil and turmoil themselves 
whereunto in your opinion does this little flourish of a preamble tend for so much as you my good disciples and some other jolly fools of ease and leisure reading the pleasant titles of some books of our invention as gargantua pantagruel whippot fessepint the dignity of codpieces of peas and bacon with a commentary et cetera are too ready to judge that there is nothing in them but jests mockeries lascivious discourse and recreative lies because the outside which is the title is usually without any farther inquiry entertained with scoffing and derision <coughs> but truly it is very unbeseeming to make so slight account of the works of men seeing yourselves avouch that it is not the habit makes the monk many being monisterially accoutred who inwardly are nothing less than monarchal and that there are of those that wear spanish capes who have but little of the valour of spaniards in them therefore is it that you must open the book and seriously consider of the matter treated in it then you shall find that it containeth things of far higher value than the box did promise that is to say that the subject thereof is not so foolish as by the title at the first sight it would appear to be and put the case that in the literal sense you meet with purposes merry and solacious enough and consequently very correspondent to their inscriptions yet must not you stop there as at the melody of the charming sirens but endeavour to interpret that in a sublimer sense which possibly you intended to have spoken in the jollity of your heart did you ever pick the lock of a cupboard to steal a bottle of wine out of it tell me truly and if you did call to mind the countenance which then you had or did you ever see a dog with a marrow-bone in his mouth the beast of all other says plato liber secundus de republica the most philosophical if you have seen him you might have remarked with what devotion and circumspectness he wards and watcheth it with what care he keeps it how fervently he holds it how prudently he gobbets it with what affection he breaks it and with what diligence he sucks it to what end all this what moveth him to take all these pains what are the hopes of his labour what does he expect to reap thereby nothing but a little marrow true it is that this little is more savoury and delicious than the great quantities of other sorts of meat because the marrow as galen testifieth quintus facultatibus naturalibus and undecimus de usu partium is a nourishment most perfectly elaboured by nature in imitation of this dog it becomes you to be wise to smell feel and have in estimation these fair goodly books stuffed with high conceptions which though seemingly easy in the pursuit are in the cope and encounter somewhat difficult 
and then like him you must by a sedulous lecture and frequent meditation break the bone and suck out the marrow that is my allegorical sense or the things i to myself propose to be signified by these pythagorical symbols with assured hope that in so doing you will at last attain to be both well advised and valiant by the reading of them for in the perusal of this treatise you shall find another kind of taste and a doctrine of a more profound and abstruse consideration which will disclose unto you the most glorious sacraments and dreadful mysteries as well in what concerneth your religion as matters of the public state and life economical do you believe upon your conscience that homer while he was accouching his iliads and odysseys had any thought upon those allegories which plutarch heraclides ponticus eustathius cornutus squeezed out of him and which Politian filched again from them if you trust it with neither hand nor foot do you come near to my opinion which judgeth them to have been as little dreamed of by homer as the gospel sacraments were by ovid in his metamorphoses though a certain gully-gut friar frere lubin croquelardon and true bacon-picker would have undertaken to prove it if perhaps he had met with as very fools as himself and as the proverb says a lid worthy of such a kettle if you give no credit thereto why do not you the same in these jovial new chronicles of mine albeit when i did dictate them i thought upon no more than you who possibly were drinking the whilst as i was for in the composing of this lordly book i never lost nor bestowed any more nor any other time than what was appointed to serve me for taking of my bodily refection that is whilst i was eating and drinking and indeed that is the fittest and most proper hour wherein to write these high matters and deep sciences as homer knew very well the paragon of all philologues and ennius the father of the latin poets as horace calls him although a certain sneaking jobbernal alleged that his verses smelled more of the wine than oil so saith a turlupin or new start-up grub of my books but a turd for him the fragrant odour of the wine oh how much more dainty pleasant laughing riant priant friant celestial and delicious it is than that smell of oil and i will glory as much when it is said of me that i have spent more on wine than oil as did demosthenes when it was told him that his expense on oil was greater than on wine i truly hold it for an honour and praise to be called and reputed a frolic gualter and a robin goodfellow for under this name am i welcome in all choice companies of pantagruelists 
it was upbraided to demosthenes by an envious surly knave that his orations did smell like the sapler or wrapper of a foul and filthy oil vessel for this cause interpret you all my deeds and sayings in the perfectest sense reverence the cheese-like brain that feeds you with these fair bilivises and trifling jollities and do what lies in you to keep me always merry be frolic now my lads cheer up your hearts and joyfully read the rest with all the ease of your body and profit of your reins but hearken jolt-heads you vi-daisies or dickens take ye remember to drink a health to me for the like favour again and i will pledge you instantly to Daresmetis. Rabelais to the reader. Good friends, my readers who peruse this book, be not offended whilst on it you look. Denude yourselves of all depraved affection, for it contains no badness nor infection. Tis true that it brings forth to you no birth of any value but in point of mirth thinking therefore how sorrow might your mind consume i could no apter subject find one inch of joy surmounts of grief a span because to laugh is proper to the man End of Poems and Prologue Recording by Martin Giessen In Hazelmere, Surrey Chapter One of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book I, by François Rabelais Translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart Chapter I Of the Genealogy and Antiquity of Gargantua I must refer you to the great chronicle of Pantagruel for the knowledge of that genealogy and antiquity of race by which Gargantua is come unto us. In it you may understand more at large how the giants were born in this world, and how from them, by a direct line, issued Gargantua the father of pantagruel and do not take it ill if for this time i pass by it although the subject be such that the oftener it were remembered the more it would please your worshipful seigneurias according to which you have the authority of plato in philebo and gorgias and of flaccus who says that there are some kinds of purposes such as these are without doubt which the frequentlier they be repeated still prove the more delectable would to god every one had a certain knowledge of his genealogy since the time of the ark of noah until this age i think many are at this day emperors kings dukes princes and popes on the earth whose extraction is from some porters and pardon peddlers as on the contrary many are now poor wandering beggars wretched and miserable 
who are descended of the blood and lineage of great kings and emperors occasioned as i conceive it by the transport and revolution of kingdoms and empires from the assyrians to the medes from the medes to the persians from the persians to the macedonians from the macedonians to the romans from the romans to the greeks from the greeks to the french and to give you some hint concerning myself who speaks unto you i cannot think but i am come of the race of some rich king or prince in former times for never yet saw you any man that had a greater desire to be a king and to be rich than i have and that only that i may make good cheer do nothing nor care for anything and plentifully enrich my friends and all honest and learned men but herein do i comfort myself that in the other world i shall be so yea and greater too than at this present i dare wish as for you with the same or a better conceit consolate yourselves in your distresses and drink fresh if you can come by it <sighs> to return to our weathers i say that by the sovereign gift of heaven the antiquity and genealogy of gargantua hath been reserved for our use more full and perfect than any other except that of the messias whereof i mean not to speak for it belongs not unto my purpose and the devils that is to say the false accusers and dissembled gospelers will therein oppose me this genealogy was found by john andrew in a meadow which he had near the pole arch under the olive tree as you go to narce where as he was making them cast up some ditches the diggers with their mattocks struck against a great brazen tomb and unmeasurably long for they could never find the end thereof by reason that it entered too far within the sluices of vienne opening this tomb in a certain place thereof sealed on the top with the mark of a goblet about which was written in etrurian letters hic bibitur they found nine flagons set in such order as they used to rank their kyles in gascony of which that which was placed in the middle had under it a big fat great grey pretty small mouldy little pamphlet smelling stronger but no better than roses in that book the said genealogy was found written all at length in a chancery hand not in paper not in parchment nor in wax but in the bark of an elm tree yet so worn with the long tract of time that hardly could three letters together be there perfectly discerned i though unworthy was sent for thither and with much help of those spectacles whereby the art of reading dim writings and letters that do not clearly appear to the sight is practised as aristotle teacheth it did translate the book as you may see in your pantagruelizing <coughs> that is to say in drinking stiffly to your own heart's desire and reading the dreadful and horrific acts of pantagruel 
at the end of the book there was a little treatise entitled the antidoted farfreluche or a gallimatia of extravagant conceits the rats and moths or that i may not lie other wicked beasts had nibbled off the beginning the rest i have hereto subjoined for the reverence i bear to antiquity end of chapter one Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey. Chapter Two of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One, by Francois Rabelais, translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart. Chapter Two The Antidoted Fanfreluche, or a Gallimatia of Extravagant Conceits, found in an ancient monument. Hmm no sooner did the cimbrians overcomer pass through the air to shun the dew of summer but at his coming straight great tubs were filled with pure fresh butter down in showers distilled wherewith when watered was his grandam hey aloud he cried fish it sir i pray because his beard is almost all berayed, or that he would hold to him a scale he prayed. To lick his slipper, some told, was much better than to gain pardons, and the merit greater. In the interim a crafty chuff approaches, from the depth issued where they fish for roaches, who said, good sirs some of them let us save the eel is here and in this hollow cave you'll find if that our looks on it demur a great waste in the bottom of his fur to read this chapter when he did begin nothing but a calf's horns were found therein i feel quoth he the mitre which doth hold my head so chill it makes my brains take cold being with the perfume of a turnip warmed to stay by chimney hearths himself he armed provided that a new thill horse they made of every person of a hare-brained head they talk it of the bunghole of St. Newell's, of Gilbathar, and thousand other holes. If they might be reduced to a scary stuff, such as might not be subject to the cough, since every man unseemly did it find to see them gaping thus at every wind for if perhaps they handsomely were closed for pledges they to men might be exposed in this arrest by hercules the raven was flayed at her his return from libya haven why am not i said minos there invited unless it be myself not one's omitted and then it is their mind i do no more of frogs and oysters send them any store in case they spare my life and prove but civil i give their sale of distaffs to the devil to quell him comes q b who limping frets at the safe pass of tricksy crackerets 
the bolter the grand cyclops cousin those did massacre whilst each one wiped his nose few ingles in this fallow ground are bred but on a tanner's mill are winnowed run thither all of you the alarms sound clear you shall have more than you had the last year short while thereafter was the bird of jove resolved to speak though dismal it should prove yet was afraid when he saw them in ire they should o'erthrow quite flat down dead the empire he rather chooseth the fire from heaven to steal to boats where were red herrings put to sail than to be calm gainst those who strive to brave us and to the masoret's fond words enslave us all this at last concluded gallantly in spite of arte and her hern-like thigh whose sittings or penthesilea tain in her old age for a cress-selling queen each one cried out thou filthy collier toad doth it become thee to be found abroad thou hast the roman standard filched away which they in rags of parchment did display juno was born who under the rainbow was a bird catching with her duck below when her with such a grievous trick they plied that she had almost been bethwacked by it the bargain was that of that throatful she should of proserpina have two eggs free and if that she thereafter should be found she to a hawthorn hill should be fast bound seven months thereafter lacking twenty-two he that of old did carthage town undo did bravely midst them all himself advance requiring of them his inheritance although they justly made up the division according to the shoe welt law's decision by distributing store of bruise and beef to these poor fellows that did pen the brief but the year will come sign of a turkish bow five spindles yarned and three pot bottoms too wherein of a discourteous king the dock shall peppered be under a hermit's frock ah that for one she hypocrite you must permit so many acres to be lost cease cease this visard may become another withdraw yourselves unto the serpent's brother tis in times past that he who is shall reign with his good friends in peace now and again no rash nor heady prince shall then rule crave each good will its arbitrament shall have and the joy promised of old as doom to the heaven's guests shall in its beacon come then shall the breeding mares that benumbed were like royal palfreys ride triumphant there and this continue shall from time to time till mars be fettered for an unknown crime then shall one come who others will surpass delightful pleasing matchless full of grace cheer up your hearts approach to this repast all trusty friends of mine for he's deceased who would not for a world return again so highly shall time past be cried up then he who was made of wax 
hooks shall lodge each member close by the hinges of a block of timber we then no more shall master master hoot the swagger whom the alarum bell holds out could one seize on the dagger which he bears heads would be free from tingling in the ears to baffle the whole storehouse of abuses <sighs> then thus farewell apollo and the muses End of chapter 2 Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey Chapter 3 of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One, by François Rabelais. Translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart. Chapter Three. How Gargantua was carried eleven months in his mother's belly. Grand Gousier was a good fellow in his time, and notable jester. He loved to drink neat, as much as any man that then was in the world, and would willingly eat salt meat. To this intent he was ordinarily well furnished with gammons of bacon, both of Westphalia, Mayence, and Bayonne with store of dried neat's tongues plenty of links chitterlings and puddings in their season together with salt beef and mustard a good deal of hard rows of powdered mullet called botagos great provision of sausages not of bologna for he feared the lombard bocone but of Bigard, Longonet, Brenne, and Rouarg. In the vigour of his age he married Gargamel, daughter to the king of the Parpaillon, a jolly pug and well-mouthed wench. These two did oftentimes do the two-backed beast together, joyfully rubbing and frotting their bacon against one another, in so far that at last she became great with child of a fair son, and went with him unto the eleventh month. For so long, yea, longer, may a woman carry her great belly, especially when it is some masterpiece of nature and a person predestinated to the performance in his due time of great exploits as homer says that the child which neptune begot upon the nymph was born a whole year after the conception that is in the twelfth month for as aulus gellius saith libertertius this long time was suitable to the majesty of neptune that in it the child might receive his perfect form for the like reason jupiter made the night wherein he lay with alcmena last forty-eight hours a shorter time not being sufficient for the forging of hercules who cleansed the world of the monsters and tyrants wherewith it was suppressed my masters the ancient pantagruelists have confirmed that which i say and withal declared it to be not only possible but also maintained the lawful birth and legitimation of the infant born of a woman in the eleventh month 
after the decease of her husband hippocrates liber de alimento plinius liber septimus caput quintus plautus in his cistellaria marcus varro in his satire inscribed the testament alleging to this purpose the authority of aristotle censorinus liber de die natali oh, aristotelis liber septimus caput three and four de natura animalium gellius liber tertius caput sedecim servius in his exposition upon this verse in virgil's eclogues matri longa decem et cetera and a thousand other fools whose number has been increased by the lawyers foliste suis et legitimo intestato paragrapho fin and in authentica de restitutionibus et ea quae parit in undecimo mense moreover upon these grounds they have foisted in their robidiladic or lapiturolive law gallus folis de libro et postimo libro septimo folis de statu hominum and some other laws which at this time i dare not name <laughs> by means whereof the honest widows may without danger play at the close buttock game with might and main and as hard as they can for the space of the first two months after the decease of their husbands i pray you my good lusty springle lads if you find any of these females that are worth the pains of untying the codpiece point get up ride upon them and bring them to me for if they happen within the third month to conceive the child should be heir to the deceased if before he died he had no other children and the mother shall pass for an honest woman when she is known to have conceived thrust forward boldly spare her not whatever betide you seeing the paunch is full as julia the daughter of the emperor octavian never prostituted herself to her belly bumpers but when she found herself with child after the manner of ships that receive not their steersmen till they have their ballast and lading and if any blame them for this their ratter conniculation and reiterated lechery upon their pregnancy and big belliedness seeing beasts in the like exigent of their fullness will never suffer the male masculant to encroach them their answer will be that those are beasts but they are women very well skilled in the pretty veils and small fees of the pleasant trade and mysteries of superfetation as populia heretofore answered according to the relation of macrobius liber secundus saturnalia if the devil will not have them to bag he must wring hard the spigot and stop the bunghole end of chapter three recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey Chapter Four of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gargantua and Pantagruel Book One by Francois Rabelais Translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart Chapter Four How Gargamel, being great with Gargantua, did eat a huge deal of tripes. The occasion and manner how Gargamel was brought to bed and delivered of her child was thus. And, if you do not believe it, I wish your bum gut fall out and make an escapade. Her bum gut, indeed, or fundament, escaped her in an afternoon, on the third day of February, with having eaten at dinner too many godebillos. Godebillos are the fat tripes of coiros. Coiros are beeves fattened at the scratch in ox stalls, or in the fresh guimo meadows. Guimo meadows are those that for their fruitfulness may be mowed twice a year. Of those fat beeves, they had killed 367,014 to be salted at trove tide, that in the entering of the spring they might have plenty of powdered beef, wherewith to season their mouths at the beginning of their meals, and to taste their wine the better. They had abundance of tripes, as you have heard, and they were so delicious that every one licked his fingers. But the mischief was this, that for all men could do, there was no possibility to keep them long in that relish, for in a very short while they would have stunk, which had been an undecent thing. It was therefore concluded that they should be all of them gulched up without losing anything. To this effect, they invited all the burghers of Sine, of Swale, of the Roche Clermard, of Volgadri, without omitting the Caudre, Montpensier, the Gur de Vade, and other neighbors, all stiff drinkers, brave fellows, and good players at the Kyles. The good man Grangousier took great pleasure in their company and commanded there should be no want nor pinching for anything. Nevertheless, he bade his wife eat sparingly, because she was near her time, and that these tripes were no very commendable meat. They would fain, said he, be at the chewing of orger, that would eat the case wherein it was. Notwithstanding these admonitions, she did eat sixteen quarters, two bushels, three pecks, and a pipkin full. Oh, the fair fecality wherewith she swelled by the ingrediency of such shit and stuff. After dinner, they all went out in a hurl to the grove of the willows, where, on the green grass, to the sound of the merry flutes and pleasant bagpipes, they danced so gallantly that it was a sweet and heavenly sport to see them so frolic. End of chapter 4Chapter 5 of Gargantua and Pantagruel Book 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Gargantua and Pantagruel Book 1 by Francois Rebelais Translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart Chapter 5 The Discourse of the Drinkers Then did they fall upon the chat of victuals and some belly furniture to be snatched at in the very same place, which purpose was no sooner mentioned but forthwith began flagons to go, gammons to trot, goblets to fly, 
great bowls to ting, glasses to ring, draw, reach, fill, mix, give it me without water. So, my friend, so, whip me off this glass neatly. Bring me hither some claret, a full weeping glass till it run over, a cessation and truce with thirst. Ha, thou false fever, wilt thou not be gone? By my figgins, godmother, I cannot as yet enter into the humor of being merry, nor drink so currently as I would. You have catched the cold, Gammer? Yea, forsooth, sir. By the belly of St. Buff, let us talk of our drink. I never drink but at my hours, like the Pope's mule, and I never drink but in my bravery, like a fair father guardian. Which was first, thirst or drinking? Thirst. For who in the time of innocence would have drunk without being a thirst? Nay, sir, it was drinking. For privatio, praise upon it, habituum. I am learned, you see. Fosundi, salices, chem non facer desertum. We poor innocents drink but too much without thirst. Not I, truly, or a sinner, for I never drink without thirst, either present or future. To prevent it, as you know, I drink for the thirst to come. I drink eternally. This is to me an eternity of drinking, and drinking of eternity. Let us sing, let us drink, and tune up our round delays. Where is my funnel? What? It seems I do not drink but by an attorney. Do you wet yourselves to dry, or do you dry to wet you? Pish! I understand not the rhetoric, theoric, I should say, but I help myself somewhat by the practice. Baste, enough. I sup, I wet, I hummocked, I moisten my gullet, I drink, and all for fear of dying. Drink always, and you shall never die. If I drink not, I am a ground, dry, graveled and spent. I am stark dead without drink, and my soul ready to fly into some marsh amongst frogs. The soul never dwells in a dry place. Drouth killeth it. O oh, you butlers, creators of new forms, make me of no drinker a drinker, a perennity and everlastingness of sprinkling, and be doing me, though these my parched and sinewy bowels. He drinks in vain that feels not the pleasure of it. This entereth into my veins. The pissing tools and urinal vessels shall have nothing of it. I would willingly wash the tripes of the calf, which I apparelled this morning. I have pretty well now ballasted my stomach and stuffed my paunch. If the papers of my bonds and bills could drink as well as I do, my creditors would not want for wine when they come to see me, or when they are to make any formal exhibition of their rights to what of me they can demand, this hand of yours spoils your nose. Oh, how many other! Shall such enter here before this go out? What? Drink so shallow? It is enough to break both girds and petrol. This called a cup of dissemination or flagellal hypocrisy. What difference is there between a bottle and a flagon? Great difference, for the bottle is stopped and shut up with a stopple, but the flagon with a vice. La putel es ferme a bouchon et la flacon a vie. Bravely and well played upon the words. Our fathers drank lustily and emptied their cans. Well cackled, well sung. Come, let us drink. Will you send nothing to the river? Here is one going to wash the tripes. I drink no more than a sponge. I drink like a Templar knight. And I, Tanquam Sponsus. And I, Sicut Terras in Aqua. Give me a synonym for a gammon of bacon. It is the compulsory of drinkers. It is a pulley. By a pulley rope, wine is let down into a cellar, and by a gammon into the stomach. Hey, now, boys, hither, some drink, some drink. There's no trouble in it. Respis persanum pon pro duos. Bust not est in usu. If I could get up as well as I could swallow down, I had been long ere now very high in the air. Thus became Tom Tospot Rich.
thus went in the tailor's stitch. Thus did Batis conquer the end, thus philosophy malend. A little rain allays a great deal of wind, long tippling breaks the thunder. But if there came such liquor for my ballot, will you not willingly thereafter suck the udder whence it issued? Here, page fill, I prithee, forget me not when it comes to my turn. And I will enter the election I have made of thee into the very register of my heart. Sup, Gilead, and spare not. There is someone in the pot. I appeal from thirst and disclaim its jurisdiction. Page, sue out my appeal in form. This remnant in the bottom of the glass must follow its leader. I was wont heretofore to drink out all, but now I leave nothing. Let us not make too much haste. It is requisite we carry all along with us. Heyday! Here are tripes fit for our sport, and in earnest, excellent go to Bilios, of the dun ox, you know, with the black street. Oh, for God's sake, let us lash them soundly, yet thriftily. Drink, or I will. No, no, drink, I beseech you. Oh, je vous, je vous prie. Sparrows will not eat. Unless you bob them on the tail, nor can I drink if I be not fairly spoke to. The concavities of my body are like another hell for their capacity. Lagana datura, Lagon letteris cavitis, Adis orcus, and Ederos altar, there is not a corner nor a corny burrow in all my body. Where this wine doth not ferret out my thirst. Oh, this will bang it soundly, but this shall banish it utterly. Let us wind our horns by the sound of flagons and bottles, and cry aloud, that whoever hath lost his thirst come not hither to seek it. Long clysters of drinking are to be voided without doors. The great God made the planets, and we make the platters neat. I have the word of the gospel in my mouth, Sidio. The stone called asbestos is not more unquenchable than the thirst of my paternity. Appetite comes with eating, says Angustin, but the thirst goes away with drinking. I have a remedy against thirst, quite contrary to that which is good against the biting of a mad dog. Keep running after a dog, and he will never bite you. Drink always before the thirst, and it will never come upon you. There I catch you, I awake you. Argus had a hundred eyes for his sight. The butler should have, like Briarius, a hundred hands wherewith to fill us wine indefatigably. Hey now, lads, let us moisten ourselves. It will be time to dry hereafter. White wine here. Wine, boys, pour out all in the name of Lucifer. Fill here, you, fill and fill. Peace gods on you, till it be full. My tongue pills. Lands drink a, to thee, countryman. I drink to thee, good fellow, comrade to thee. Lusty, lively. Ha la la. That was drunk to some purpose, and bravely gulped over. O oh, lacrima Christi. It is of the best grape. I faith pure Greek, Greek, O oh, the fine white wine. Upon my conscience, it is a kind of taffetas wine. Hen, hen. It is of one ear, well wrought, and of good wool. Courage, comrade. Up thy heart, Billy. We will not be beasted at this bout. For I have got one trick. Ex hoc and hoc. There is no enchantment, nor charm there. Every one of you hath seen it. My apprenticeship is out. I am a free man at this trade. I am Prester Mass, Prester Masse, Maestri Passe, Prish Brum, I should say, Master Pass. Oh, the drinkers, those that are dry. Oh, poor thirsty souls, good page, my friend. Fill me here some and crown the wine. I pray thee, like a cardinal, natura aboret vacuum. Would you say that a fly could drink in this? This is after the fashion of Switzerland. 
clear off. Neat, supernaculum. Come, therefore, blaze to this divine liquor and celestial juice. Swill it over heartily and spare not. It is a decoction of nectar and ambrosia. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One, by Francois Rebelais, translated by. Sir Thomas Urquhart, Chapter Six: How Gargantua was born in a strange manner. Whilst they were on this discourse and pleasant tattle of drinking, Gargamel began to be a little unwell in her lower parts. Whereupon Grangousier arose from off the grass and fell to comfort her very honestly and kindly, suspecting that she was in travail, and told her that it was best for her to sit down upon the grass under the willows, because she was like very shortly to see young feet, and that therefore it was convenient she should pluck up her spirits and take a good heart of new at the fresh arrival of her baby, saying to her withal that although the pain was somewhat grievous to her, it would be but of short continuance, and that the succeeding joy would quickly remove that sorrow in such sort that she should not so much as remember it. On with a sheep's courage, quoth he, dispatch this boy, and we will speedily fall to work for the making of another. Ha, said she, so well as you speak at your own ease, you that are men. Well then, in the name of God, I'll do my best, seeing that you will have it so. But would to God that it were cut off from you. What? said Grangousier. Ha, said she, you are a good man indeed. You understand it well enough. What, my member? said he. By the goat's blood. If it please you, that shall be done instantly. Cause, bring hither a knife. Alas, said she, the Lord forbid and pray Jesus to forgive me. I did not say it from my heart, therefore let it alone, and do not do it neither more less any kind of harm for me speaking so to you. But I am like to have work enough to do today and all for your member, yet God bless you and it. Courage, courage, said he, Take you no care of the matter. Let the four foremost oxen do the work. I will yet go drink one with more. And if in the meantime anything before you that may require my presence, I will be so near to you that at the first whistling in your fist, I shall be with you forthwith. A little while after she begun to groan, lament and cry. Then suddenly came the midwives from all quarters, who, groping her below, found some pelotteries, which was a certain filthy stuff, and of a taste truly bad enough. This, they thought, had been the child, but it was her fundament, that was slipped out with the mollification of her straight entrail, which you call the bum gut, and that merely by eating of too many tripes, as we have showed you before, whereupon an old ugly trot in the company, who had the repute of an expert chief physician, that was come from Brispaye, near to St. Guinot, three score years before, made her so horrible a restrictive and binding medicine, and whereby all her lares, arse pipes, and conduits were so opulated, stopped, obstructed, and contracted, that you could hardly have opened and enlarged them with your teeth, which is a terrible thing to think upon, seeing the devil at the 
mass at St. Martin's was puzzled with like task, when with his teeth he had lengthened out the parchment, whereupon he wrote the tittle-tattle of two young mangy oars. By this inconvenient, the cotyledons of her matrix were presently loosed, through which the child sprang up and leaped, and so, entering into the hollow vein, did climb by the diaphragm, even above her shoulders, where the vein divides itself into two, and from thence, taking his way towards the left side, issued forth at her left ear. As soon as he was born, he cried not as other babies used to do, Yes, 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 but with a high, sturdy, and big voice shouted about, some drink, some drink, some drink, as inviting all the world to drink with him. The noise hereof was so extremely great that it was heard in both the countries at once of Versailles and Biberel. I doubt me that you do not thoroughly believe the truth of this strange nativity. Though you believe it not, I care not much, but an honest man and of good judgment, believeth still what is told him, and that which he finds written. Is this beyond our law, or our faith, against reason or the holy scripture? For my part, I find nothing in the sacred Bible that is against it. But tell me, if it had been the will of God, will you say that he could not do it? Ah, for favor's sake, I beseech you, Never in Balakuk or in Paul regifies your spirits with these vain thoughts and idle conceits. For I tell you, it is not impossible with God. And if he please, all women henceforth should bring forth their children at the ear. Was not Bacchus engendered out of the very thigh of Jupiter? Did not Rocatelia come out of his mother's heel? and Crocmus, from the slipper of his nurse, was not Minerva born of the grain, even through the ear of Jove, Adonis of the bark of a mirror tree, and Castor and Pollux of the dupe of that egg which was laid and hatched by Leda? But you will wonder more, and with far greater amazement, if I should now present you with that chapter of Plinius wherein he treateth of strange births, and contrary to nature. And yet am not I so impudent a liar as he was. Read the seventh book of his natural history, chapter 3, and trouble not my head any more about this. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Gargantua and Pantagruel Book 1 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kurt Ranji. Gargantua and Pantagruel. Book One by Francois Rabelais. Translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart. Chapter Seven. After what manner Gargantua had his name given him, and how he tippled, bibbed, and curried the can. The good man, Grand Gousier, drinking and making merry with the rest, heard the horrible noise which his son had made as he entered into the light of this world, when he cried out, Some drink, some drink, some drink! Whereupon he said in French, Que grand tu as a souple le gousier! That is to say, How great and nimble a throat thou hast! Which the company hearing said, That verily the child ought to be called Gargantua, because it was the first word that, after his birth, his father had spoke. In imitation, and at the example of the ancient Hebrews, whereunto he condescended, and his mother was very well pleased therewith. In the meanwhile, to quiet the child, they gave him to drink a tir largo, that is, till his throat was like to crack with it. Then was he carried to the font, and there baptized, according to the manner of good Christians. Immediately thereafter were appointed for him seventeen thousand nine hundred and thirteen cows of the towns of Poti and Bremont, to furnish him with milk in ordinary, for it was impossible to find a nurse sufficient for him in all the country, considering the great quantity of milk that was requisite for his nourishment. 
although there were not wanting some doctors of the opinion of Scotus, who affirmed that his own mother gave him suck, and that she could draw out of her breasts one thousand four hundred two pipes and nine pails of milk at every time. Which indeed is not probable, and this point hath been found duggishly scandalous and offensive to tender ears, for that it savoured a little of heresy. Thus was he handled for one year and ten months, after which time, by the advice of physicians, they began to carry him, and then was made for him a fine little cart, drawn with oxen, of the invention of Jan de Nio, wherein they led him hither and thither with great joy. And he was worth the seeing, for he was a fine boy, had a burly physiognomy, and almost ten chins. He cried very little, but beshit himself every hour. For, to speak truly of him, he was wonderfully phlegmatic in his posteriors, both by reason of his natural complexion and the accidental disposition which had befallen him by his too much quaffing of the septembral juice. Yet without a cause did not he sup one drop, for if he happened to be vexed, angry, displeased, or sorry, if he did fret, if he did weep, if he did cry, and what grievous quarter soever he kept, in bringing him some drink, he would be instantly pacified, seated in his own temper, in a good humor again, and as still and quiet as ever. One of his governesses told me, swearing by her fig, how he was so accustomed to this kind of way, that, at the sound of pints and flagons, he would on a sudden fall into an ecstasy, as if he had then tasted of the joys of paradise, so that they, upon consideration of this, his divine complexion, would every morning, to cheer him up, play with a knife upon the glasses, on the bottles with their stopples, and on the pottle-pots with their lids and covers, at the sound whereof he became gay, did leap for joy, would loll and rock himself in the cradle, then nod with his head, monochordizing with his fingers, and baritonizing with his tail. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of Gargantua and Pantagruel Book 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kurt Ranji. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book 1, by Francois Rabelais. Translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart. Chapter 8. How They Apparelled Gargantua Being of this age, his father ordained to have clothes made to him in his own livery, which was white and blue. To work then went the tailors, and with great expedition were those clothes made, cut, and sewed, according to the fashion that was then in request. I find by the ancient records or pancarts to be seen in the chamber of accounts, or court of the exchequer at Montsoreau, that he was accoutred in manner as followeth, to make him every shirt of his were taken up nine hundred ells of Chasselereau linen, and two hundred for the gussets in manner of cushions, which they put under his armpits. His shirt was not gathered nor plaited, for the plaiting of shirts was not found out till the seamstresses, when the point of their needle, Besogne de Coul, English, the eye of the needle, was broken began to work and occupy with the tail. There were taken up for his doublet eight hundred and thirteen ells of white satin, and for his points fifteen hundred and nine dog's skins and a half. Then was it that men began to tie their breeches to their doublets, and not their doublets to their breeches, for it is against nature, as hath most amply been showed by Occam upon the exponables of Master Holte Chaussade. For his breeches were taken up eleven hundred and five ells and a third of white broadcloth. They were cut in the form of pillars, chamfered, channeled, and pinked behind, that they might not overheat his reins, and were, within the panes, puffed out with the lining of as much blue damask as was needed, and remark that he had very good leg harness, proportionable to the rest of his stature. For his codpiece were used seventeen ells and a quarter of the same cloth, and it was fashioned on the top like unto a triumphant arch, most gallantly fastened with two enameled clasps, in each of which was set a great emerald, as big as an orange, for, as says Orpheus, Libitum de Lapidibus, and Plinius, Libro Ultimo, it hath an erective virtue, and comfortative of the natural member. The exiture, outjecting or outstanding, of his codpiece was of the length of a yard, jagged and pinked, and withal bagging, and strutting out with the blue damask lining after the manner of his breeches. But had you seen the fair embroidery of the small needlework pearl, and the curiously interlaced knots, by the goldsmith's art set out and trimmed with rich diamonds, precious rubies, fine turquoises, costly emeralds, and Persian pearls, you would have compared it to a fair cornucopia, or horn of abundance, such as you see in antiques, or as Rhea gave to the two nymphs, Amalthea and Ida, the nurses of Jupiter. 
and, like to that horn of abundance, it was still gallant, succulent, droppy, sappy, pithy, lively, always flourishing, always fructifying, full of juice, full of flour, full of fruit, and all manner of delight. I avow God it would have done one good to have seen him, but I will tell you more of him in the book which I have made on the dignity of codpieces. One thing I will tell you, that as it was both long and large, so was it well furnished and victualled within. Nothing like unto the hypocritical codpieces of some fond wooers and wench courtiers, which are stuffed only with wind to the great prejudice of the female sex. For his shoes were taken up four hundred and six ells of blue crimson velvet, and were very neatly cut by parallel lines, joined in uniform cylinders. For the soling of them were made use of eleven hundred hides of brown cows, shapen like the tail of a keeling. For his coat were taken up eighteen hundred ells of blue velvet, dyed in grain, embroidered in its borders with fair gilla flowers, in the middle decked with silver pearl, intermixed with plates of gold and store of pearls, hereby showing that in his time he would prove an especial good fellow and singular whip can. His girdle was made of three hundred ells and a half of silken serge, half white and half blue, if I mistake it not. His sword was not of Valentia, nor his dagger of Saragossa, for his father could not endure these hidalgos, barrachos, maranisados, como diablos. But he had a fair sword made of wood, and the dagger of boiled leather, as well painted and gilded as any man could wish. His purse was made of the cod of an elephant, which was given him by Herr Prakantal, proconsul of Libya. For his gown were employed nine thousand six hundred ells, wanting two-thirds, of blue velvet, as before, all so diagonally pearled, that by true perspective issued thence an unnamed color, like that you see in the necks of turtle-doves or turkey-cocks, which wonderfully rejoiced the eyes of the beholders. For his bonnet or cap were taken up three hundred two ells and a quarter of white velvet, and the form thereof was wide and round, of the bigness of his head, for his father said that the caps of the Marabez fashion, made like the cover of a pasty, would one time or other bring a mischief on those that wore them. For his plume he wore a fair great blue feather, plucked from an anacrotal of the country of Hyrcania the wild, very prettily hanging down over his right ear. For the jewel or brooch which in his cap he carried, he had in a cake of gold, weighing three score and eight marks, a fair piece enameled, wherein was portrayed a man's body with two heads, looking towards one another, four arms, four feet, two arses, such as Plato, in Symposio, says was the mystical beginning of man's nature. And about it was written in Ionic letters, Agama use taitaot, or rather, Anerkai guna zugara anthrotos idaitata, that is, vir et mulier junctum propriissime homo. To wear about his neck he had a golden chain, weighing twenty-five thousand and sixty-three marks of gold, the links thereof being made after the manner of great berries, amongst which were set in work green jaspers and graven and cut dragon-like, all environed with beams and sparks, as King Nekepsos of old was wont to wear them. And it reached down to the very bust of the rising of his belly, whereby he reaped great benefit all his life long, as the Greek physicians know well enough. For his gloves were put in work sixteen otter skins, and three of the lupgaru, or man-eating wolves, for the bordering of them. And of this stuff were they made, by the appointment of the cabalists of saint Luan. As for the rings which his father would have him to wear, to renew the ancient mark of nobility, he had on the forefinger of his left hand a carbuncle as big as an ostrich's egg, and chased very daintily in gold, of the fineness of a turkey seraph. Upon the middle finger of the same hand he had a ring made of four metals together, of the strangest fashion that ever was seen, so that the steel did not crash against the gold, nor the silver crush the copper. All this was made by Captain Chapuis, and Alcofribus, his good agent. On the medical finger of his right hand he had a ring made spire-wise, wherein was set a perfect bala ruby, a pointed diamond, and a Faison emerald, of an inestimable value. For Hans Carvel, the king of Melinda's jeweller, esteemed them at the rate of threescore nine millions eight hundred ninety-four thousand and eighteen French crowns of Berry, and at so much did the Fucre of Augsburg prize them. End of chapter 8、Chapter、Nine of Gargantua and Pantagruel This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One, by Francois Rabelais, translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart. Chapter Nine The Colors and Liveries of Gargantua. 
Gargantua's colours were white and blue, as I have showed you before, by which his father would give us to understand that his son to him was a heavenly joy, for the white did signify gladness, pleasure, delight, and rejoicing, and the blue celestial things. I know well enough that in reading this you laugh at the old drinker, and hold this exposition of colours to be very extravagant, and utterly disagreeable to reason, because white is said to signify faith, and blue constancy. But without moving, vexing, heating, or putting you in a chafe, for the weather is dangerous, answer me if it please you, for no other compulsory way of arguing will I use towards you, or any else. Only now and then I will mention a word or two of my bottle. What is it that induceth you? What stirs you up to believe, or who told you that white signifieth faith, and blue constancy? An old paltry book, say you, sold by the hawking peddlers and ballad-mongers, entitled The Blazon of Colours. Who made it? Whoever it was, he was wise in that he did not set his name to it. But besides, I know not what I should rather admire in him, his presumption or his sottishness. His presumption and overweening, for that he should without reason, without cause, or without any appearance of truth, have dared to prescribe, by his private authority, what things should be denotated and signified by the colour, which is the custom of tyrants, who will have their will to bear sway instead of equity, and not of the wise and learned, who with the evidence of reason satisfy their readers. His sottishness and want of spirit, and that he thought that, without any other demonstration or sufficient argument, the world would be pleased to make his blockish and ridiculous impositions the rule of their devices. In effect, according to the proverb, to a shitten tail fails never orger, he hath found, it seems, some simple ninny in those rude times of old, when the wearing of high round bonnets was in fashion, who gave some trust to his writings, according to which they carved and engraved their apthems and mottoes, trapped in comparison their mules and sumpter horses, apparelled their pages, quartered their breeches, boarded their gloves, fringed the curtains and balances of their beds, painted their ensigns, composed songs, and, which is worse, placed many deceitful jugglings and unworthy base tricks undiscoveredly amongst the very chastest matrons and most reverent sciences. In the like darkness and mist of ignorance are wrapped up these vainglorious courtiers and name transposers, who going about in their empraises to signify espérance, that is, hope, have portrayed a sphere, and bird's pen for pains, lancholy, which is the flower columbine, for melancholy, a waning moon or crescent, to show the increasing or rising of one's fortune, a bench, rotten and broken, to signify bankrupt, gnaw and a corslet for non durabit, otherwise non durabit, it shall not last, a licenciel, that is, a bed without a tester, for en licencie, a graduated person, as bachelor in divinity, or utter barrister at law, which are equivocals so absurd and witless, so barbarous and clownish, that a fox's tail should be fastened to the neck-piece of, and a visor made of a cow's herd given to every one that henceforth should offer, after the restitution of learning, to make use of any such fopperies in France. By the same reasons, if reasons I should call them, and not ravings, rather, and idle triflings about words, might I cause pain to pannier, to signify that I have been pain, a mustard-pot, that my heart tarries much for it, one pissing upwards for a bishop, the bottom of a pair of breeches for a vessel full of fart-hings, a codpiece for the office of the clerks of the sentences, decrees, or judgments, or rather, as the English bears it, for the tail of a codfish, and a dog's turd for the dainty turret wherein lies the love of my sweetheart. Far otherwise did heretofore the sages of Egypt, when they wrote by letters which they called hieroglyphics, which none understood who were not skilled in the virtue, property, and nature of the things represented by them of which Orus Apollon hath in Greek composed two books, and Polyphilus, in his dream of love, set down more. In France you have a taste of them in the device or impresa of my lord admiral, which was carried before that time by Octavian Augustus. But my little skiff alongst these unpleasant gulfs and shoals will sail no further. Therefore must I return to the port from whence I came. Yet do I hope one day to write more at large of these things, and to show both by philosophical arguments and authorities, received and approved of by and from all antiquity, what and how many colours there are in nature, and what may be signified by every one of them, if God save the mould of my cap, which is my best wine-pot, as my grandam said. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 of Gargantua and Pantagruel Book 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book I, by François Rabelais. Translated by Sir Thomas Orcart. Chapter Ten. 
of that which is signified by the colors white and blue. The white, therefore, signifieth joy, solace, and gladness, and that not at random, but upon just and very good grounds, which you may perceive to be true, if, laying aside all prejudicate defections, you will but give ear to what presently I shall expound unto you. Aristotle saith that, supposing two things contrary in their kind, as good and evil, virtue and vice, heat and cold, white and black, pleasure and pain, joy and grief, and so of others, if you couple them in such a manner that the contrary of one kind may agree in reason with the contrary of the other, it must follow by consequence that the other contrary must answer to the remnant opposite to that wherewith it is conferred. As, for example, virtue and vice are contrary in one kind, so are good and evil. If one of the contraries of the first kind be consonant to one of those of the second, as virtue and goodness, for it is clear that virtue is good, so shall the other two contraries, which are evil and vice, have the same connection, for vice is evil. This logical rule being understood, take these two contraries, joy and sadness, then these other two, white and black, for they are physically contrary. If so be, then, that black do signify grief, by good reason, then should white import joy. Nor is this signification instituted by human imposition, but by the universal consent of the world received, which philosophers called jus gentium, the law of nations, or an uncontrollable right of force in all countries whatsoever. For you know well enough that all people and all languages and nations, except the ancient Syracusans and certain Argives, who had cross and thwarting souls, when they mean outwardly to give evidence of their sorrow, go in black, and all mourning is done with black. Which general consent is not without some argument and reason in nature, the which every man may be by himself very suddenly comprehend, without the instruction of any, and this we call the law of nature. By virtue of the same natural instinct, we know that by white all the world hath understood joy, gladness, mirth, pleasure, and delight. In former times the Thracians and Cretans did mark their good, propitious, and fortunate days with white stones, and their sad, dismal, and unfortunate ones with black. Is not the night mournful, sad, and melancholic? It is black and dark by the privation of light. Doth not the light comfort all the world? and it is more white than anything else. Which, to prove, I could direct you to the book of Laurentius Valla against Bartolus, but an evangelical testimony, I hope, will content you. Matthew 17, it is said that, at the transfiguration of our Lord, vestimenta eius facta sunt alba sicut lux, his apparel was made white like the light, by which lightsome whiteness he gave his three apostles to understand the idea and figure of the eternal joys, for by the light are all men comforted, according to the word of the old woman, who, although she had never a tooth in her head, was wont to say, Bona lux. And Tobit, chapter 5, after he had lost his sight, when Raphael saluted him, answered, What joy can I have that do not see the light of heaven? In that color did the angels testify the joy of the whole world at the resurrection of our Savior. John 20, and at his ascension, Acts 1. With the light color of vesture did St. John the Evangelist, Apocrypha 4.7, see the faithful clothed in the heavenly and blessed Jerusalem. Read the ancient, both Greek and Latin histories, and you shall find that the town of Alba, the first pattern of Rome, was founded and so named by reason of a white sow that was seen there. You shall likewise find in those stories that when any man, after he had vanquished his enemies, was by decree of the Senate to enter into Rome triumphantly, he usually rode in a chariot drawn by white horses, which in the ovation triumph was also the custom, for by no sign or color would they so significantly express the joy of their coming as by the white. You shall there also find how Pericles, the general of the Athenians, would needs have that part of his army unto whose lot befell the white beans to spend the whole day in mirth, pleasure, and ease, while the rest were a-fighting. A thousand other examples and places could I allege to this purpose, but that it is not here where I should do it. By understanding hereof you may resolve one problem, which Alexander Aphrodisius hath accounted unanswerable. 
why the lion who with his only cry and roaring affrights all beasts dreads and feareth only a white cock for as proclus saith libro de sacrificio et magia it is because the presence of the virtue of the sun which is the organ and promptuary of all terrestrial and sidereal light doth more symbolize and agree with a white cock as well in regard of that colour as of his property and specifical quality than with a lion he saith furthermore that devils have been often seen in the shape of lions which at the sight of a white cock have presently vanished this is the cause why galli or gallicis so are the frenchmen called because they are naturally white as milk which the greeks call gala do willingly wear in their caps white feathers for by nature they are of a candid disposition merry kind gracious and well beloved and for their cognizance and arms have the whitest flower of any the flower de luce or lily if you demand how by white nature would have us understand joy and gladness i answer that the analogy and uniformity is thus for as the white cloth outwardly dispose and scatter the rays of the sight whereby the optic spirits are manifestly dissolved according to the opinion of aristotle in his problems and prospective treatises as you may likewise perceive by experience when you pass over the mountains covered with snow how you will complain that you cannot see well as xenophon writes to have happened to his men as and as galen very largely declareth libre ten de usu partium just so the heart with excessive joy is inwardly dilated and suffereth a manifest resolution of the vital spirits which may go so far on that it may thereby be deprived of its nourishment and by consequence of life itself by this pericary or extremity of gladness as galen saith libre twelve method libre five de locis affectus and libre two de symptomatum causis and as it hath come to pass in former times witness marcus tullius libre one quest to school various aristotle titus livius in his relation of the battle of cannae plenius libre seven capitulae thirty two and thirty four a gellius libre three capitulae fifteen and many other writers to diagoras the rhodian chelon sophocles dionysus the tyrant of sicily philippides philemon polycrates philistion m juventi and others who died with joy and as evicin speaketh in two canon et libre de veribus cordis of the saffron that it doth so rejoice the heart that if you take of it excessively it will by a superfluous resolution and dilation deprive it altogether of life here peruse alex aphrodisius libre one capitulae nineteen and that for a cause but what it seems i am entered further into this point than i intended at the first here therefore will i strike sail referring the rest to that book of mine which handleth this matter to the full meanwhile in a word i will tell you that blue doth certainly signify heaven and heavenly things by the very same tokens and symbols that white signifieth joy and pleasure end of chapter ten chapter eleven of gargantua and pantagruel book one this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One, by François Rabelais, translated by Sir Thomas Orquart. Chapter Eleven, of the Youthful Age of Gargantua. Gargantua, from three years upward unto five was brought up and instructed in all convenient discipline by the commandment of his father, and spent that time like the other little children of the country, that is, in drinking, eating, and sleeping, in eating, sleeping, and drinking, and in sleeping, drinking, and eating. Still he wallowed and rolled up and down himself in the mire and dirt, he blurred and sullied his nose with filth, he blotted and smutched his face with any kind of scurvy stuff, he trod down his shoes in the heel, at the flies he did oftentimes yawn, and ran very heartily after the butterflies, the empire whereof belonged to his father. He pissed in his shoes, shit in his shirt, and wiped his nose on his sleeve. He did let his snot and snivel fall in his pottage, and dabbled, paddled, and slobbered everywhere. 
he would drink in his slipper and ordinarily rub his belly against a pannier. He sharpened his teeth with a top, washed his hands with his broth, and combed his head with a bowl. He would sit down betwixt two stools, and his arse to the ground would cover himself with a wet sack, and drink in eating of his soup. He did eat his cake sometimes without bread, would bite in laughing, and laugh in biting. Oftentimes did he spit in the basin, and fart for fatness, piss against the sun, and hide himself in the water for fear of rain. He would strike out of the cold iron, be often in the dumps, and frig and wriggle it. He would flay the fox, say the ape's paternoster, return to his sheep, and turn the hogs to the hay. He would beat the dogs before the lion, put the plough before the oxen, and claw where it did not itch. He would pump one to draw somewhat out of him, by griping all would hold the fast nothing, and always eat his white bread first. He shooed the geese, kept a self-tickling to make himself laugh, and was very steadable in the kitchen, made a mock at the gods, would cause sing magnificat at matins, and found it very convenient to do so. He would eat cabbage and shite beets, new flies and a dish of milk, and would make them lose their feet. He would scrape paper, blur parchment, then run away as hard as he could. He would pull at the kid's leather or vomit up his dinner, then reckon without his host. He would beat the bushes without catching the birds, thought the moon was made of green cheese and that bladders are lanterns. Out of one sack he would take two mulchers or fees for grinding, would act the ass's part to get some bran, and of his fist would make a mallet. He took the cranes at the first leap, and would have the mail coats to be made link after link. He always looked a given horse in the mouth, leaped from the cock to the ass, and put one ripe between two green. By robbing Peter he paid Paul. He kept the moon from the wolves, and hoped to catch larks if ever the heavens should fall. He did make of necessity virtue, of such bread such pottage, and cared as little for the peeled as for the shaven. Every morning he did cast up his gorge, and his father's little dogs eat out of the dish with him, and he with them. He would bite their ears, and they would scratch his nose. He would blow in their arses, and they would lick his chaps. But hearken, good fellows, the spigot ill betake you, and whirl round your brains if you do not give ear. This little lecher was always groping his nurses and governesses, upside down, arseversy, topsy-turvy, harry borike, with a yakko hake hake gyo handling them very rudely, in jumbling and tumbling them to keep them going, for he had already begun to exercise the tools, and put his codpiece in practice. Which codpiece, or braguette, his governess did every day deck up and adorn with fair nosegays, curious rubies, sweet flowers, and fine silken tufts, and very pleasantly would pass their time in taking you-know-what between their fingers, and dandling it, till it did revive and creep up to the bulk and stiffness of a suppository, or street magdalene which is a hard, rolled-up salve spread upon leather. Then did they burst out in laughing when they saw it lift up its ears, as if the sport had liked them. One of them would call it her little dill, her staff of love, her quillity, her faucetin, her dandelolly. Another, her peen, her jolly kyle, her babbleray, her member tune, her quickset imp. Another again, her branch of coral, her female adamant, her placket racket, her cyprian scepter, her jewel for ladies and some of the other women would give it these names, my bungatee, my stopple too, my bush rusher, my gallant wimble, my pretty borer, my coney burrow ferret, my little piercer, my augratine, my dangling hangers, downright to it, stiff and stout, in and to, my pusher, dresser, pouting stick, my honey pipe, my pretty pillycock, linky pinky, futility, my lusty andouille, and crimson chitling, my little couille bredouille, my pretty rogue, and so forth. It belongs to me, said one. It is mine, said the other. What? quoth a third. Shall I have no share in it? By my faith, I will cut it then. Ha! To cut it, said the other, would hurt him. Madam, do you cut little children's things? Were his cut off, he would be then Monsieur saint Cur, the curtailed master. And that he might play and sport himself after the manner of the other little children of the country, they made him a fair-weather whirljack of the wings of the windmill of Mirebalais. End of chapter 11
Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One, by François Rabelais, translated by Sir Thomas Orquart. Chapter Twelve of Gargantua's Wooden Horses. Afterwards, that he might be all his lifetime a good rider, they made to him a fair great horse of wood, which he did make leap, curve it, jerk out behind, and skip forward all at a time to pace trot rack gallop amble to play the hobby the hackney gelding go the gait of the camel and of the wild ass he made him also change his colour of hair as the monks of coltibu according to the variety of their holidays used to do their clothes from bay brown to sorrel dapple grey mouse dun deer colour roan cow colour gingioline skewed colour piebald and the colour of the savage elk Himself, of a huge post, made a hunting nag, and another for daily service of the beam of a vine-press, and of a great oak made of a mule, with a foot-cloth for his chamber. Besides this he had ten or twelve spare horses, and seven horses for post, and all these were lodged in his own chamber, close by his bedside. One day the lord of Bredenbag, Pan and Sac, came to visit his father in great bravery, and with a gallant train and at the same time to see him came likewise the Duke of Freemiel, Franc Repas, and the Earl of Wetgullet, Mouivon. The house truly for so many guests at once was somewhat narrow, but especially the stables, whereupon the steward and harbinger of the said Lord Bredenbag, to know if there were any other empty stable in the house, came to Gargantua, a little young lad, and secretly asked him where the stables of the great horses were, thinking that children would be ready to tell all. Then he led them up along the stairs of the castle, passing by the second hall, unto a broad great gallery, by which they entered into a large tower. And as they were going up at another pair of stairs, said the harbinger to the steward, This child deceives us, for the stables are never on the top of the house. You may be mistaken, said the steward, for I know some places at Lyon, at the Basmet, at Chenon, and elsewhere, which have their stables at the very tops of the houses. So it might be that behind the house there is a way to come to this ascent but I will question him further. Then he said to Gargantua, My pretty little boy, whither do you lead us? To the stable, said he, of my great horses. We are almost come to it. We have but these stairs to go up at. Then, leading them alongst another great hall, he brought them into his chamber, and opening the door, said unto them, This is the stable you ask for. This is my jennet, this is my gelding, this is my courser, and this is my hackney, and laid on them with a great lever. I will bestow upon you, said he, this Friesland horse. I had him from Frankfort. Yet will I give him you, for he is a pretty little nag, and will go very well with a tessel of goshawks, half a dozen of spaniels, and a brace of greyhounds. Thus are you king of the hares and partridges for all this winter. By St. John, said they, now we are paid. He hath gleeked us to some purpose. Bobbed we are now for ever. I deny it, said he, he was not here above three days. Judge you now whether they had most cause, either to hide their heads for shame, or to laugh at the jest. As they were going down again thus amazed, he asked them, Will you have a whim-wham? Aubelier. What is that? said they. It is, said he, five turds to make you a muzzle. Today, said the steward, though he may happen to be roasted, we shall not be burnt, for we are pretty well equipped and larded, in my opinion. Oh, my jolly dapper boy, thou hast given us a gudgeon, I hope to see thee pope before I die. I think so, said he myself, and then shall you be a puppy, and this gentle popinjay a perfect papillard, that is, dissembler. Well, well, said the harbinger. But said Gargantua, guess how many stitches there are in my mother's smock. Sixteen, quoth the harbinger. You do not speak gospel, said Gargantua, for there is scent before and scent behind, and you did not reckon them ill, considering the two underholes. When, said the harbinger, even then, said Gargantua, when they made a shovel of your nose to take up a quarter of dirt, and of your throat a funnel, wherewith to put into another vessel, because the bottom of the old one was out. Coxbod, said the steward, we have met with a praetor. Farewell, Master Tattler, God keep you, so goodly are the words which you come out with, and so fresh in your mouth, that it had need to be salted. Thus going down in great haste, under the arch of the stairs, they let fall the great lever, which he had put upon their backs. Whereupon Gargantua said, What a devil you are, it seems, but bad horsemen, that suffer your builder to fail you when you need him most. If you were to go from hence to Cahusac, whither had you rather, ride on a gosling, or lead a sow in a leash? 
I had rather drink, said the harbinger. With this they entered into the lower hall where the company was, and relating to them this new story, they made them laugh like a swarm of flies. End of chapter 12「Chapter thirteen of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One, by Rabelais. Translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart. Chapter Thirteen. How Gargantua's wonderful understanding became known to his father, Grand Gousier, by the invention of a torchecul or wipe breech. About the end of the fifth year, Grand Gousier, returning from the conquest of the Canarians, went by the way to see his son Gargantua there was he filled with joy as such a father might be at the sight of such a child of his and whilst he kissed and embraced him he asked many childish questions of him about divers matters and drank very freely with him and with his governesses of whom in great earnest he asked amongst other things whether they had been careful to keep him clean and sweet to this gargantua answered that he had taken such a course for that himself that in all the country there was not to be found a cleanlier boy than he how is that said grand gousier i have answered gargantua by a long and curious experience found out a means to wipe my bum the most lordly the most excellent and the most convenient that ever was seen what is that said grand gousier how is it i will tell you by and by said gargantua once i did wipe me with a gentlewoman's velvet mask and found it to be good for the softness of the silk was very voluptuous and pleasant to my fundament another time with one of their hoods and in like manner that was comfortable at another time with a lady's neckerchief and after that i wiped me with some ear-pieces of hers made of crimson satin but there was such a number of golden spangles in them turdy round things a pox take them that they fetched away all the skin of my tail with a vengeance now i wish st anthony's fire burn the bum-gut of the goldsmith that made them and of her that wore them this hurt i cured by wiping myself with a page's cap garnished with a feather after the switzer's fashion afterwards in dunging behind a bush i found a march cat and with it i wiped my breech but her claws were so sharp that they scratched and exulcerated all my perine. Of this I recovered the next morning thereafter, by wiping myself with my mother's gloves, of a most excellent perfume and scent of the Arabian Benin. After that I wiped me with sage, with fennel, with anet, with marjoram, with roses, with gourd leaves, with beets, with coal-wort, with leaves of the vine-tree, with mallows, wool-blade, which is a tail scarlet, with lettuce and with spinach-leaves. All this did very great good to my leg. Then with mercury, with parsley, with nettles, with comfrey, but that gave me the bloody flux of Lombardy, which I healed by wiping me with my braguette. Then I wiped my tail in the sheets, in the coverlet, in the curtains, with a cushion, with arras hangings, with a green carpet, with a tablecloth, with a napkin, with a handkerchief, with a combing cloth, in all which I found more pleasure than do the mangy dogs when you do rub them. 
yea but said grand gousier which torchecule did you find to be the best i was coming to it said gargantua and by and by you shall hear the two autem and know the whole mystery and knot of the matter i wiped myself with hay with straw with thatch rushes with flax with wool with paper but who his foul tail with paper wipes shall at his bollocks leave some chips what said grand gousier my little rogue hast thou been at the pot that thou dost rhyme already yes yes my lord the king answered gargantua i can rhyme gallantly and rhyme till i become hoarse with room hark what our privy says to the skiters shittered squittered crackered turdus thy bung hath flung some dung on us filthered cackered stinkered st anthony's fire seize on thy bone if thy dirty down by thou do not wipe ere thou be gone will you have any more of it yes yes answered grand gousier then said gargantua a roundelay in shitting yesterday i did know the cess i to my arse did owe the smell was such came from that slunk that i was with it all bestunk oh had but then some brave signor brought her to me i waited for in shitting i would have cleft her water-gap and joined it close to my flip-flap whilst she had with her fingers guarded my foul knock-andro all be murdered in shitting now say that i can do nothing by the merdai they are not of my making but i heard them of this good old grandam that you see here and ever since have retained them in the budget of my memory let us return to our purpose said grand gousier what said gargantua to skite no said grand gousier but to wipe our tail but said gargantua will not you be content to pay a puncheon of breton wine if i do not blank and gravel you in this matter and put you to a non plus yes truly said grand gousier there is no need of wiping one's tail said gargantua but when it is foul foul it cannot be unless one have been a skiting skite then we must before we wipe our tails oh my pretty little waggish boy said grand gousier what an excellent wit thou hast i will make thee very shortly proceed doctor in the jovial quirks of gay learning and that by god for thou hast more wit than age now i prithee go on in this torchculative or wipe bummatory discourse and by my beard i swear for one puncheon thou shalt have threescore pipes i mean of the good breton wine not that which grows in britain but in the good country of veron afterwards i wiped my bum said gargantua with a kerchief with a pillow with a pantoufle with a pouch with a pannier but that was a wicked and unpleasant torchecule then with a hat of hats note that some are shorn and others shaggy some velveted others covered with taffeties and others with satin the best of all these is the shaggy hat for it makes a very neat abstersion of the faecal matter afterwards i wiped my tail with a hen with a cock with a pullet with a carved skin with a hare with a pigeon with a cormorant with an attorney's bag with a montero with a coif with a falconer's lure but to conclude i say and maintain that of all torchecules arse-wisps 
bum fodders tail napkins bunghole cleansers and wipe breeches there is none in the world comparable to the neck of a goose that is well downed if you hold her head betwixt your legs and believe me therein upon mine honour for you will thereby feel in your knock-hole a most wonderful pleasure both in regard of the softness of the said down and of the temperate heat of the goose which is easily communicated to the bum-gut and the rest of the innards in so far as to come even to the regions of the heart and brains and think not that the felicity of the heroes and demigods in the elysian fields consisteth either in their asphodel ambrosia or nectar as our old women here used to say but in this according to my judgment that they wipe their tails with the neck of a goose holding her head betwixt their legs and such is the opinion of master john of scotland alias scotus end of chapter thirteen recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey chapter fourteen of gargantua and pantagruel book one by francois rabelais translated by sir thomas urquhart this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by mario pineda chapter fourteen book one how gargantua was taught latin by a sophister the good man Grangusier, having heard this discourse, was ravished with admiration, considering the high rich and marvellous understanding of his son Gargantua, and said to his governesses, Philip, king of Macedon, knew the great wit of his son, Alexander, by his skilful managing of a horse. For his horse Bucephalus was so fierce and unruly that none durst adventure to ride him. After that he had given to his riders such devilish falls, breaking the neck of this man, the other man's leg, braining one, and putting one other out of his jawbone. This, by Alexander being considered, one day in a hippodrome, which was a place appointed for the breaking and managing of great horses, he perceived that the fury of the horse proceeded merely from the fear he had of his own shadow, whereupon getting on his back, he run him against the sun, so that the shadow fell behind, and by that means tamed the horse and brought him to his hand whereby his father knowing the divine judgment that was in him caused him most carefully to be instructed by aristotle who at that time was highly renowned about all the philosophers of greece after the same manner i tell you that by this only discourse which now i have here had before you with my son gargantua i know that this understanding doth participate of some divinity and that if he be well taught and have that education which is fitting he will attain to a supreme degree of wisdom therefore will i commit him to some learned man to have him indoctrinated according to his capacity and will spare no cost presently they appointed him a great sophister doctor called master tubal holofernes who taught him his abc so well that he could say it by heart backwards and about this he was five years and three months then read he to him donat Levaze, theodolet and alanus in parabolis about this he was thirteen years six months and two weeks but you must remark that in the meantime he did learn to write in gothic characters and that he wrote all his books for the art of printing was not then in use and did ordinarily carry a great pen and inkhorn weighing about seven thousand quintals that is seven hundred thousand pound weight the panner whereof was as big and as long as the great pillars of N. A. and the horn was hanging to it in great iron chains, it being of the wideness of a ton of merchant ware. After that he read unto him the book De Modi Significandi, with the commentaries of Hartbees, of Fasquin, of Trapdu, of Walho, of John Colf, of Bologna, of Berlinguendus, and a rabble of others. 
and herein he spent more than eighteen years and eleven months and was so well versed in it that to try masteries in school disputes with his condisciples he would recite it by heart backwards and did sometimes prove on his finger ends to his mother quo de modi significandi non erat scientia then did he read to him the compost for knowing the age of the moon the seasons of the year and tides of the sea on which he spent sixteen years and two months and that justly at the time that his said preceptor died of a french box which was in the year of one thousand four hundred and twenty afterwards he got an old coughing fellow to teach him named master jobelin bride or muscled adult who read unto him Hugutiu Hebrard's Gracism, the Doctrinal, the Parts, the Quid Ea, the Supplementum, Marmotratus, the Moribus Immensa Cervantis, Seneca, the Quatur, Virtutibus, Cardinalibus, Passabantus Com Comento, and Dormi, Secure for the Holidays, and some other of such like mealy stuff, by reading whereof he became as wise as any we ever since baked in an oven. End of chapter 14 of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book 1. Chapter 15 of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book 1 by Francois Rabelais. Translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mario Pineda. Chapter 15. How Gargantua was put under other schoolmasters. At the last his father perceived that indeed he studied hard, and that, although he spent all his time in it, he did nevertheless profit nothing, but which is worse, grew thereby foolish, simple, dotted, and blockish, whereof making a heavy regret of Don Philip of Marais, viceroy or deputy king of Pepeligos, he found that it were better for him to learn nothing at all than to be taught such like books under such schoolmasters because their knowledge was nothing but brutishness and their wisdom but blunt foppish toys serving only to bastardize good and noble spirits and to corrupt all the flowers of youth that it is so take said he any young boy of this time who hath only studied two years if he have not a better judgment a better discourse and that expressed in better terms than your son with a completer carriage and civility to all manner of persons account me for ever hereafter a very clunch of bacon slicer brin this pleased grangosier very well and he commanded that it should be done at night at supper he said this marais brought in a young page of his a bill gouge called eudomon so neat so trim so handsome in his appeal so spruce with his hair in so good order and so sweet and comely in his behavior that he had the resemblance of a little angel more than a human creature then he said to grangoisier do you see this young boy he is not as yet full twelve years old let us try if it please you what difference there is betwixt the knowledge of the doting mathiologians of old time and the young lads that are now the trial pleased grangoisier and he commanded the page to begin then eudemon asking leave of the vice king his master so to do with his cap in his hand a clear and open countenance beautiful and ruddy lips his eyes steady and his looks fixed upon gargantua with a joyful modesty standing up straight on his feet began very gracefully to commend him first for his virtue and good manners secondly for his knowledge thirdly for his nobility fourthly for his bodily accomplishments and in the fifth place most sweetly exhorted him to reverence his father with all due observancy who was so careful to have him well brought up in the end he prayed him that he would bushave to admit of him amongst the list of his servants for the other favour at that time desired he none of heaven but that he might do him some grateful and acceptable service all this was by him delivered with such proper gestures such distinct pronunciation so pleasant a delivery in such exquisite fine terms and so good latin that he seemed rather a gracious or a cicero and emilius of a time past than a youth of his age but all the countenance that gargancho kept was that he fell to crying like a cow and cast down his face hiding it with his cap 
nor could they possibly draw one word from him, no more than a fart from a dead ass. Whereat his father was so grievously vexed that he would have killed Master Joblin, but this said Desmarais would help him from it by fair persuasions, so that at length he pacified his wrath. Then Grangousier commanded he should be paid his wages, then they should whittle him up soundly like a sophister with good drink, and then give him leave to go to all the devils in hell. At least, said he, today shall it not cost his host much if, by chance, he should die as drunk as a Switzer. Master Joblin, being gone out of the house, Grand Wazir consulted with the Viceroy what schoolmaster they should choose for him, and it was bewitched them resolved that Ponocrates, the tutor of Eudemon, should have the charge, and that they should go all together to Paris, to know what was the study of the young men of France at that time. End of chapter 15 of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book 1「and of the huge great mare that he rode on, how she destroyed the oxflies of the booths. In the same season, Fayols, the fourth king of Numidia, sent out of the country of Africa to Grand Guzier, the most hideously great mare that ever was seen, and of the strangest form, for you know well enough how it is said that Africa always is productive of some new thing. She was as big as six elephants, and had her feet cloven into fingers like Julius Caesar's horse, with sludge hanging ears, like the goats in Languedoc, and a little horn on her buttock. She was of a burnt sorrel hue, with a little mixture of dapple grey spots, but above all she had a horrible tail, for it was little more or less than every whit as great as the steeple pillar of St. Mark beside Lange, and squared as that is, with tufts and any crotches, or hair plaids wrought within one another, no otherwise than as the birds are upon the ears of corn. If you wonder at this, wonder rather at the tails of the Scythian rams, which weighed about thirty pounds each, and of the Syrian sheep, who need, if to note say true, a little cart at their heels to bear up their tail. It is so long and heavy. You female lechers in the plain countries have no such tails. And she was brought by sea in three carracks and a brigantine unto the harbour of Olon in Talmondois. When Grand Gouzier saw her, here is, said he, what is fit to carry my son to Paris. So now, in the name of God, all will be well. He will in times coming be a great scholar, if it were not my masters, for the beasts, we should live like clerks. The next morning, after they had drunk, you must understand, they took their journey. Gargantua, his pedagogue Ponocrates, and his train, and with them Eudemon, the young page. And because the weather was fair and temperate, his father caused to be made for him a pair of dumb boots, but being called them buskins. Thus did they merrily pass their time in traveling on their highway, always making good cheer, and were very pleasant till they came a little above Orleans, in which place there was a forest of five and thirty leagues long and seventeen in breadth or thereabouts. The forest was most horribly fertile and copious in doorflies, hornets, and wasps so that it was a very purgatory for the poor mares, asses, and horses. But Gargantua's mare did avenge herself handsomely of all the outrages therein committed upon beasts of her kind, and that by a trick whereof they had no suspicion. For as soon as ever they were entered into the said forest, and that the wasps had given the assault, she drew out and unshittered her tail, and therewith skirmishing did so sweep them that she overthrew all the wood alongst an atwarf, here and there, this way and that way, long ways and sideways, over and under, and felt everywhere the wood with as much ease as a mower doth the grass, in such sort that never since hath there been neither wood nor doorflies, for all the country was thereby reduced to a plain champagne field, which Gargantua took great pleasure to behold, and said to his company no more but this, Je trouve beau, I find this pretty, 
whereupon that country hath been ever since that time called Booz. But all to breakfast the mare got that day was but a little yawning and gaping, in memory whereof the gentlemen of Booz do as yet to this day break their fast and gaping, which they find to be very good, and do spit the better for it. At last they came to Paris, where Gagancho refreshed himself two or three days, making very merry with his folks, and inquiring what men of learning there were in the city, and what time they drank here. End of chapter 16 of Gargantua and Pantagruel Book 1 Chapter 17 of Gargantua and Pantagruel Book 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One, by François Rabelais Translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart Chapter Seventeen How Gargantua paid his welcome to the Parisians, and how he took away the great bells of Our Lady's Church some few days after that they had refreshed themselves he went to see the city and was beheld of everybody there with great admiration for the people of paris are so sottish so badaud so foolish and fond by nature that a juggler a carrier of indulgences a sumpter horse or mule with cymbals or tinkling bells a blind fiddler in the middle of a cross-lane shall draw a greater confluence of people together than an evangelical preacher. And they pressed so hard upon him that he was constrained to rest himself upon the towers of Our Lady's Church. At which place, seeing so many about him, he said with a loud voice, I believe that these buzzards will have me to pay them here my welcome hither and my proficiat it is but good reason i will now give them their wine but it shall only be in sport then smiling he untied his fair braguette and drawing out his mentool into the open air, he so bitterly all to be pissed them, that he drowned two hundred and sixty thousand four hundred and eighteen, besides the women and little children. Some, nevertheless, of the company escaped this piss-flood by mere speed of foot, who, when they were at the higher end of the university, sweating, coughing, spitting, and out of breath, they began to swear and curse, some in good hot earnest, and others in jest. Carimari, carimara, golinoli, golinolo, by my sweet sanctus, we are washed in sport a sport truly to laugh at in french par -ris, for which that city hath been ever since called paris whose name formerly was leucotia as strabo testifieth lib quarto from the greek word leucotis whiteness because of the white thighs of the ladies of that place and forasmuch as at this imposition of a new name all the people that were there swore every one by the sancts of his parish the parisians which are patched up of all nations and all pieces of countries are by nature both good jurors and good jurists and somewhat overweening whereupon ioanninus de barauco libro de copiositate reverentiarum thinks that they are called parisians from the greek word parhesia which signifies boldness and liberty in speech <coughs> 
this done he considered the great bells which were in the said towers and made them sound very harmoniously which whilst he was doing it came into his mind that they would serve very well for tingling tandans and ringing campanelles to hang about his mare's neck when she should be sent back to his father as he intended to do loaded with brie cheese and fresh herring and indeed he forthwith carried them to his lodging in the meanwhile there came a master beggar of the friars of st anthony to demand in his canting way the usual benevolence of some hoggish stuff who that he might be heard afar off and to make the bacon he was in quest of shake in the very chimneys made account to filch them away privily nevertheless he left them behind very honestly not for that they were too hot but that they were somewhat too heavy for his carriage this was not he of bourg for he was too good a friend of mine all the city was risen up in sedition they being as you know upon any slight occasion so ready to uproars and insurrections that foreign nations wonder at the patience of the kings of france who do not by good justice restrain them from such tumultuous courses seeing the manifold inconveniences which thence arise from day to day would to god i knew the shop wherein are forged these divisions and factious combinations that i might bring them to light in the confraternities of my parish believe for a truth that the place wherein the people gathered together were thus sulphured hopurimated moiled and bepissed was called nell where then was but now is no more the oracle of leucotia there was the case proposed and the inconvenience showed of the transporting of the bells after they had well ergoed pro and con they concluded in baralipton that they should send the oldest and most sufficient of the faculty unto gargantua to signify unto him the great and horrible prejudice they sustain by the want of those bells and notwithstanding the good reasons given in by some of the university why this charge was fitter for an orator than a sophister there was chosen for this purpose our master janotus de bragmardo End of chapter seventeen recording by martin giessen in hazelmere surrey Chapter eighteen of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One by francois rabelais translated by sir thomas urquhart chapter eighteen how janotus de bragmardo was sent to gargantua to recover the great bells master janotus with his hair cut round like a dish a la cesarine in his most antique accoutrement Liripipionated with a graduate's hood, and having sufficiently antidoted his stomach with oven marmalades, that is, bread and holy water of the cellar, transported himself to the lodging of Gargantua, driving before him three red muzzled beetles, and dragging after him five or six artless masters all thoroughly bedraggled with the mire of the streets 
at their entry ponocrates met them who was afraid seeing them so disguised and thought they had been some maskers out of their wits which moved him to inquire of one of the said artless masters of the company what this mummery meant it was answered him that they desired to have their bells restored to them as soon as ponocrates heard that he ran in all haste to carry the news unto gargantua that he might be ready to answer them and speedily resolve what was to be done gargantua being advertised hereof called apart his schoolmaster ponocrates philotimus steward of the house gymnastes his esquire and eudemon and very summarily conferred with them both of what he should do and what answer he should give they were all of opinion that they should bring them unto the goblet office which is the buttery and there make them drink like roysters and line their jackets soundly and that this coffer might not be puffed up with vain glory by thinking the bells were restored at his request they sent whilst he was chopining and plying the pot for the mayor of the city the rector of the faculty and the vicar of the church unto whom they resolved to deliver the bells before the sophister had propounded his commission after that in their hearing he should pronounce his gallant oration which was done and they being come the sophister was brought in full hall and began as followeth in coughing End of chapter 18 Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey Chapter 19 of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book I, by François Rabelais, translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart. Chapter 19 The Oration of Master Janotus de Bragmardo for recovery of the bells <coughs> good day sirs good day it will be my masters it were but reason that you should restore to us our bells for we have great need of them <coughs> we have oftentimes heretofore refused good money for them of those of london in Cahors, yea and those of bordeaux in brie who would have bought them for the substantific quality of the elementary complexion which is intronificated in the terrestriety of their quiditative nature to extraneize the blasting mists and whirlwinds upon our vines indeed not ours but these round about us for if we lose the piot and liquor of the grape we lose all both sense and law if you restore them unto us at my request i shall gain by it six basketfuls of sausages and a fine pair of breeches which will do my legs a great deal of good or else they will not keep their promise to me <sighs> by gob domine a pair of breeches is good et vir sapiens non aburrebit eam <laughs> a pair of breeches is not so easily got 
i have experience of it myself consider domine i have been these eighteen days in matter grabolizing this brave speech redite quae sunt caesaris caesari et quae sunt dei deo ibi jacet lepus by my faith domine if you will sup with me in cameris by cock's body caritatis nos faciemus bonum cherubin ego occi tu dunum porcum et ego habet bonum vino but of good wine we cannot make bad latin hmm. well de parte dei date nobis bellas nostras hold i give you in the name of the faculty a sermones de utino that utinam you would give us our bells ultus etiam pardonos per diemus habebitis et nihil peabitis o oh, sir domine bella give me nor nobis verily est bonum vobis they are useful to everybody if they fit your mare well so do they do our faculty quae comparata est jumentis incipientibus et similis facta est eis salmo nescio quo yet i did quote it in my notebook it is unum bonum achilles good defending argument <laughs> for i prove unto you that you should give me them ego sic argumentor omnis bella bellabilis in bellerio bellando bellans bellativo bellare facit bellabiliter bellantes parisias habet bellas ergo <laughs> this is spoken to some purpose it is in tertio primae in dari or elsewhere by my soul i have seen the time that i could play the devil in arguing but now i am much failed and henceforward want nothing but a cup of good wine a good bed my back to the fire my belly to the table and a good deep dish <sighs> domine i beseech you in nomine patris fili et spiritus sancti amen to restore unto us our bells and god keep you from evil and our lady from health qui vivit et regnat per omnia secula seculorum amen <coughs> Verum eni muero, quando quidem, dubio procul. Edipol quoniam, ita certe, medius tidius. A town without bells is like a blind man without a staff, an ass without a cropper, and a cow without symbols. Therefore be assured, until you have restored them to us we will never leave crying after you like a blind man that has lost his staff braying like an ass without a crupper and making a noise like a cow without symbols <sighs> a certain latinizator dwelling near the hospital said since producing the authority of one taponus i lie it was one pontanus the secular poet who wished those bells had been made of feathers and the clapper of a fox tail 
to the end that they might have begot a chronicle in the bowels of his brain when he was about the composing of his carminiformal lines but bunak petitin petitac tic torch lorgne all rope kippipur kippipot put pansemal he was declared an heretic <coughs> we make them as of wax and no more saith the deponent valete et plaudite calipinus recensue end of chapter 19 recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey Chapter Twenty of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Geeson. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One, by Francois Rabelais translated by sir thomas urquhart chapter twenty how the sophister carried away his cloth and how he had a suit in law against the other masters the sophister had no sooner ended but ponocrates and eudemon burst out in a laughing so heartily that they had almost split with it and given up the ghost in rendering their souls to god even just as crassus did seeing a lubberly ass eat thistles and as philemon who foreseeing an ass eat those figs which were provided for his own dinner died with force of laughing together with them master janotus fell a laughing too as fast as he could in which mood of laughing they continued so long that their eyes did water by the vehement concussion of the substance of the brain by which these lacrimal humidities being pressed out glided through the optic nerves and so to the full represented democritus heraclitizing and heraclitus democritizing when they had done laughing gargantua consulted with the prime of his retinue what should be done there ponocrates was of opinion that they should make this fair orator drink again and seeing he had showed them more pastime and made them laugh more than a natural soul could have done that they should give him ten baskets full of sausages mentioned in his pleasant speech with a pair of hose three hundred great billets of logwood five-and-twenty hogsheads of wine a good large down bed and a deep capacious dish which he said were necessary for his old age all this was done as they did appoint only gargantua doubting that they could not quickly find out breeches fit for his wearing because he knew not what fashion would best become the said orator whether the martingale fashion of breeches wherein is a spung-hole with a drawbridge for the more easy cagging or the fashion of the mariners for the greater solace and comfort of his kidneys or that of the switzers 
which keeps warm the bedondaine or belly tabret or round breeches with straight canyons having in the seat a piece like a cod's tail for fear of overheating his reins all which considered he caused to be given him seven ells of white cloth for the linings the wood was carried by the porters the masters of arts carried the sausages and the dishes and master janotus himself would carry the cloth one of the said masters called jouspandouille showed him that it was not seemly nor decent for one of his condition to do so and that therefore he should deliver it to one of them <laughs> said janotus baudet baudet or blockhead blockhead thou dost not conclude in modo et figura for lo to this end serve the suppositions and parva logicalia panus pro quo supponit confuse said bandui et distributive i do not ask thee said janotus blockhead quo modo supponit but pro quo it is blockhead pro tibis meis and therefore i will carry it echo met sicut suppositum portat appositum so did he carry it away very close and covertly as patelin the buffoon did his cloth the best was that when this coffer in a full act or assembly held at the maturins had with great confidence required his breeches and sausages and that they were flatly denied him because he had them of gargantua according to the informations thereupon made he showed them that this was gratis and out of his liberality by which they were not in any sort quit of their promises notwithstanding this it was answered him that he should be content with reason without expectation of any other bribe there reason said janotus we use none of it here unlucky traitors you are not worth the hanging the earth beareth not more arrant villains than you are i know it well enough halt not before the lame i have practised wickedness with you by god's rattle i will inform the king of the enormous abuses that are forged here and carried under hand by you and let me be a leper if he do not burn you alive like <coughs> sodomites traitors heretics and seducers enemies to god and virtue upon these words they framed articles against him he on the other side warned them to appear in sum the process was retained by the court and is there as yet hereupon the magisters made a vow never to decrot themselves in rubbing off the dirt of either their shoes or clothes master janotus with his adherents vowed never to blow or snuff their noses until judgment were given by a definitive sentence by these vows do they continue unto this time 
both dirty and snotty for the court hath not garbled sifted and fully looked into all the pieces as yet the judgment or decree shall be given out and pronounced at the next greek calends that is never as you know that they do more than nature and contrary to their own articles the articles of paris maintain that to god alone belongs infinity and nature produceth nothing that is immortal for she putteth an end and period to all things by her engendered according to the saying omnia orta cadunt et cetera but these thick mist swallowers make the suits in law depending before them both infinite and immortal in doing whereof they have given occasion to and verified the saying of chilo the lacedaemonian consecrated to the oracle at delphos that misery is the inseparable companion of law debates and that pleaders are miserable for sooner shall they attain to the end of their lives than to the final decision of their pretended rights end of chapter twenty Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey. Chapter Twenty One of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One by Francois Rabelais. Translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart. Chapter 21. The Study of Gargantua, According to the Discipline of His Schoolmasters, the Sophisters. The first day being thus spent, and the bells put up again in their own place, the citizens of Paris, in acknowledgment of this courtesy, offered to maintain and feed his mare as long as he pleased, which Gargantua took in good part, and they sent her to graze in the forest of Bière. I think she is not there now. This done, he with all his heart submitted his study to the discretion of Pinocrates, who for the beginning appointed that he should do as he was accustomed, to the end he might understand by what means, in so long time, his old masters had made him so sottish and ignorant. He disposed therefore of his time in such fashion that ordinarily he did awake betwixt eight and nine o'clock, whether it was day or not, for so had his ancient governors ordained, alleging that which David saith, Wanum est wobis ante lucem sugare. Then did he tumble and toss, wag his legs, and wallow in the bed sometime, the better to stir up and rouse his vital spirits, and apparelled himself according to the season. But willingly he would wear a great long gown of thick frieze, furred with fox skins. Afterwards he combed his head with an almain comb, which is the four fingers and the thumb for his preceptor said that to comb himself otherwise, to wash and make himself neat, was to lose time in this world. Then he dunged, pissed, spewed, belched, cracked, yawned, spitted, coughed, yexed, sneezed, and snotted himself like an archdeacon, and to suppress his due and bad air, went to breakfast, having some good fried tripes, fair rashers on the coals, excellent gammons of bacon, store of the fine minced meat, and a great deal of sippet brewis, made up of the fat of the beef-pot, laid upon bread, cheese, and chopped parsley strewed together. Panocrates showed him that he ought not to eat so soon after rising out of his bed, unless he had performed some exercise beforehand. Gargantua answered, What? Have not I sufficiently well exercised myself? I have wallowed and rolled myself six or seven turns in my bed before I rose. Is not that enough? Pope Alexander did so by the advice of a Jew his physician, and lived till his dying day in despite of his enemies. My first masters have used me to it, saying that to breakfast made a good memory, and therefore they drank first. I am very well after it, and dined but the better. 
and Master Tubal, who was the first licentiate of Paris, told me that it was not enough to run a pace, but to set forth betimes. So doth not the total welfare of our humanity depend upon perpetual drinking in a ribble-rabble, like ducks, but on drinking early in the morning, unde versus, to rise betimes is no good hour, to drink betimes is better sure. After that he had thoroughly broke his fast, he went to church, and they carried to him in a great basket a huge impantoufled or thick-covered breviary, weighing what in grease, clasps, parchment, and cover, little more or less than eleven hundred and six pounds. There he heard six and twenty or thirty masses. This while to the same place came his orison mutterer, impale tocked, or lapped up about the chin like a tufted whoop, and his breath pretty well antidoted with store of the vine-tree syrup. With him he mumbled all his curiels and duncical brebrorians, which he so curiously thumbed and fingered, that there fell not so much as one grain to the ground. As he went from the church, they brought him, upon a dray drawn with oxen, a confused heap of paternosters and aves of St. Claude, every one of them being of the bigness of a hat-block, and thus, walking through the cloisters, galleries, or garden, he said more in turning them over than sixteen hermits would have done. Then did he study some paltry half-hour with his eyes fixed upon his book, but, as the comic saith, his mind was in the kitchen. Pissing then a full urinal, he sat down at table, and because he was naturally phlegmatic, he began his meal with some dozens of gammons, dried neat's tongues, hard rows of mullet, called botargos, andouilles or sausages, and such other forerunners of wine. In the meanwhile, four of his folks did cast into his mouth one after another, continually mustered by whole shovelfuls. Immediately after that, he drank a horrible draught of white wine for the ease of his kidneys. When that was done, he ate, according to the season, meat agreeable to his appetite, and then left off eating when his belly began to strout, and was like to crack for fullness. As for his drinking, he had in that neither end nor rule, for he was wont to say that the limits and bounds of drinking were when the cork of the shoes of him that drinketh swell up half a foot high. End of chapter 21「Chapter twenty two of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One by Francois Rabelais, translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart. Chapter twenty two The Games of Gargantua. Then, blockishly mumbling with a set-on countenance of piece of scurvy grace, he washed his hands in fresh wine, picked his teeth with the foot of a hog, and talked jovially with his attendants. Then the carpet being spread, they brought plenty of cards, many dice, with great store and abundance of checkers and chessboards. There he played, at flush, at primero, at the beast, at the rifle, at trump, at the prick and spare not, at the hundred, at the peeny, at the unfortunate woman, at the fib, at the past ten, at one and thirty, at post and pair, or even in sequence, at three hundred, at the unlucky man, at the last couple in hell, at the hawk, at the surly, at the lansquenet, at the cuckoo, at puff, or let him speak that hath it, at take nothing and throw out, at the marriage, at the frolic or jackdaw, at the opinion, at who doth the one doth the other, at the sequences, at the ivy bundles, at the tarot's, at losing load him, at he's gulled in esto, at the torture, at the hand rough, at the click, at honors, at pinch without laughing, at prickle me tickle me, at the unshoeing of the ass, at the coxess, at harry ho high, at i set me down, at earl beardy, at the old mode, at draw the spit, at put out, at gossip lend me your sack, at the ram cod ball, at thrust out the harlot, at marseilles figs, at nicknamry, at stick and hole, at boke or him, or flaying the fox, at the branching it, at trill madam or grapple my lady, at the cat selling, at blow the coal, at the re-wedding, at the quick and dead judge, at unoven the iron, at the false clown, at the flints or at the nine stones, at to the crutch halch back, at the sanct is found, at hinch pinch and laugh not, at the leak, at bum dock deuce, at the loose gig, at the hoop, at the sow, at belly to belly, at the dales or straths, at the twigs, at the quoits, at I'm for that, at I take you napping, 
at fair and softly passeth lent, at the forked oak, at truss, at the wolf's tail, at bum to bust or nose in breech, at Geordie, give me my lance, at swaggy waggy and shoggy shoe, at stook and rook, shear and threave, at the birch, at the muss, at the dilly dilly darling, at ox moody, at purpose in purpose, at nine less, at blind man buff, at the fallen bridges, at bridled nick, at the white at butts, at thwack swinge him, at apple, pear, plum, at mumgy, at the toad, at cricket, at the pounding stick, at jack in the box, at the queens, at the trades, at heads and points, at the vine tree hug, at black be thy fall, at ho the distaff, at Joan Thompson, at the bolting cloth, at the oat seed, at love, at the chess, at Reynard the fox, at the squares, at the cows, at the lottery, at the chance or mum chance, at three dice or maniest bleaks, at the tables, at nivy nivy knack, at the lurch, at doublets or queen's game, at the faily, at the French trick track, at the long tables or fear curing, at fell down, at Todd's body, at needs must, at the dames or draughts, at bob and mow, at primus secundus, at mark knife, at the keys, at span counter, at even or odd, at cross or pile, at ball and huckle bones, at ivory balls, at the billiards, at bob and hit, at the owl, at the charming of the hare, at pull yet a little, at trudge pig, at the magatapies, at the horn, at the flowered or shrub tied ox, at the madge owlet, at tilt at weeky, at nine pins, at the cock quintin, at the tip and hurl, at the flat bowls, at the veer and turn, at rogue and ruffian, at bum batch tooch, at the mysterious trough, at the short bowls, at the dapple gray, at cock and crank it, at break pot, at my desire, at twirly whirly trill, at the rush bundles, at the short staff, at the whirling gig, at hide and seek, or are you all hid, at the picket, at the blank, at the pilferers, at the cave sun, at prison bars, at have at the nuts, at cherry pit, at rub and rice, at whip top, at the casting top, at the hobgoblins, at oh the wonderful, at the soily smutchy, at fast and loose, at scutch breach, at the broom besom, at St. Cosme, I come to adore thee, at the lusty brown boy, at greedy glutton, at the Morris dance, at Phoebe, at the whole frisk and gamble, at Batabum, or riding of the wild mare, at Hind the plowman, at the good mawkin, at the dead beast, at climb the ladder, Billy, at the dying hog, at the salt dupe, at the pretty pigeon, at barley break, at the bevine, at the bush leap, at crossing, at bow peep, at the hearted arse percy, at the hower's nest, at forward hay, at the fig, at gunshot crack, at mustard peel, at the gom, at the relapse, at jog breach or prick him forward, at knock pate, at the cornish cough, at the crane dance, at slash and cut, at bobbing or flirt on the nose, at the larks, at philipping. After he had thus well played, reveled, passed, and spent his time, it was thought fit to drink a little, and that was eleven glassfuls the man, and immediately after making good cheer again, he would stretch himself upon a fair bench or a good large bed, and there sleep two or three hours together, without thinking or speaking any hurt. After he was awakened, he would shake his ears a little. In the meantime, they brought him fresh wine. There he drank better than ever. Ponocrates showed him that it was an ill diet to drink so after sleeping. It is, answered Gargantua, the very life of the patriarchs and holy fathers, for naturally I sleep salt, and my sleep hath been to me instead of so many gammons of bacon. Then began he to study a little, and out came the paternosters or rosary of beads, which the better and more formally to despatch, he got upon an old mule, which had served nine kings, and so mumbling with his mouth, nodding and doddling his head, would go to see a coney ferreted or caught in a gin. At his return he went into the kitchen, to know what roast meat was on the spit, and what otherwise was to be dressed for supper, and supped very well upon my conscience, and commonly did invite some of his neighbors that were good drinkers, with whom carousing and drinking merrily they told stories of all sorts from the old to the new. Amongst others he had, for domestics, the lords of Fou, of Gourville, of Grignot, and of Marigny. After supper were brought in upon the place the fair wooden gospels and the books of the four kings, that is to say, many pairs of tables and cards, or the fair flush, one, two, three, or at all, to make short work, or else they went to see the wenches thereabouts, with little small banquets, intermixed with collations and rear suppers. Then did he sleep, without unbridling, until eight o'clock in the next morning. End of chapter 22
Chapter Twenty Three of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One by Francois Rabelais, translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart. Chapter Twenty Three: How Gargantua was instructed by Panocrates, and in such sort disciplinated that he lost not one hour of the day. When Panocrates knew Gargantua's vicious manner of living, he resolved to bring him up in another kind. But for a while he bore with him, considering that nature cannot endure a sudden change, without great violence. Therefore, to begin his work the better, he requested a learned physician of that time, called Master Theodorus, seriously to perpend, if it were possible, how to bring Gargantua into a better course. The said physician purged him canonically with Antixerian hellebore, by which medicine he cleansed, all the alteration and perverse habitude of his brain. By this means also Panocritus made him forget all that he had learned under his ancient preceptors, as Timotheus did to his disciples, who had been instructed under other musicians. To do this the better, they brought him into the company of learned men, which were there, in whose imitation he had a great desire and affection to study otherwise, and to improve his parts. Afterwards he put himself into such a road and way of studying that he lost not any one hour in the day, but employed all his time in learning and honest knowledge. Gargantua awaked, then, about four o'clock in the morning. Whilst they were in rubbing of him, there was read unto him some chapter of the Holy Scripture aloud and clearly, with a pronunciation fit for the matter, and hereunto was appointed a young page, born in Bosch, named Anagnostes. According to the purpose and argument of that lesson, he oftentimes gave himself to worship, adore, pray, and send up his supplications to that good God, whose word did show his majesty and marvellous judgment. Then went he unto the secret places to make excretion of his natural digestions. There his master repeated what had been read, expounding unto him the most obscure and difficult points. In returning they considered the face of the sky, if it was such as they had observed it the night before, and into what signs the sun was entering, as also the moon for that day. This done he was apparelled, combed, curled, trimmed, and perfumed, during which time they repeated to him the lessons of the day before. He himself said them by heart, and upon them would ground some practical cases concerning the estate of man, which he would prosecute sometimes two or three hours, but ordinarily they ceased as soon as he was fully clothed. Then for three good hours he had a lecture read unto him. This done they went forth, still conferring of the substance of the lecture, either unto a field near the university called the Brack, or unto the meadows, where they played at the ball, the long tennis, and at the Pilla Trigone, which is a play wherein we throw a triangular piece of iron at a ring to pass it, most gallantly exercising their bodies, as formerly they had done their minds. All their play was but in liberty, for they left off when they pleased, and that was commonly when they did sweat over all their body, or were otherwise weary. Then were they very well wiped and rubbed, shifted their shirts, and, walking soberly, went to see if dinner was ready. Whilst they stayed for that, they did clearly and eloquently pronounce some sentences that they had retained of the lecture. In the meantime, Master Appetite came, and then very orderly sat they down at table. At the beginning of the meal there was read some pleasant history of the warlike actions of former times, until he had taken a glass of wine. Then, if they thought good, they continued reading, or began to discourse merrily together, speaking first of the virtue, propriety, efficacy, and nature of all that was served in at the table of bread, of wine, of water, of salt, of fleshes, fishes, fruits, herbs, roots, and of their dressing. By means whereof he learned in a little time all the passages competent for this that were to be found in Pliny, Athenaeus, Dioscorides, Julius Pollux, Galen, Porphyry, Opian, Polybius, Heliodor, Aristotle, Alien, and others. Whilst they talked of these things, many times, to be the more certain, they caused the very books to be brought to the table, and so well and perfectly did he in his memory retain the things above said, that in that time there was not a physician that knew half so much as he did. Afterwards they conferred of the lessons, read in the morning, and ending their repast with some conserve or marmalade of quinces, he picked his teeth with the mastic toothpickers, washed his hands and eyes with fair fresh water, and gave thanks unto God in some fine cantiques, made in praise of the divine bounty and munificence. This done, they brought in cards, not to play, but to learn a thousand pretty tricks and new inventions, which were all grounded upon arithmetic. By this means he fell in love with that numerical science, 
and every day after dinner and supper he passed his time in it as pleasantly as he was wont to do at cards and dice, so that at last he understood so well both the theory and practical part thereof that Tunstall the Englishman, who had written very largely of that purpose, confessed that verily in comparison of him he had no skill at all, and not only in that, but in the other mathematical sciences as geometry, astronomy, music, etc., for in waiting on the concoction and attending to the digestion of his food, they made a thousand pretty instruments and geometrical figures, and did in some measure practice the astronomical canons. After this they recreated themselves with singing musically in four or five parts, and upon a set theme or ground at random, as it best pleased them. In matter of musical instruments, he learned to play upon the lute, the virginals, the harp, the almain flute with nine holes, the viol, and the sackbut. This hour thus spent, and digestion finished, he did purge his body of natural excrements, then betook himself to his principal study for three hours together, or more, as well to repeat his matutinal lectures as to proceed in the book wherein he was, and also to write handsomely, to draw and form the antique and Roman letters. This being done, they went out of their house, and with them a young gentleman of Touraine, named the Esquire Gymnast, who taught him the art of riding. Changing then his clothes, he rode a Naples courser, a Dutch Roussin, a Spanish Jennet, a barded or trapped steed, then a light fleet horse, unto whom he gave a hundred carriers, made him go to the high salts, bounding in the air, free the ditch with a skip, leap over a stile or pail, turn short in a ring both to the right and left hand. There he broke not his lance, for it is the greatest foolery in the world to say, I have broken ten lances at tilts or in fight. A carpenter can do even as much, but it is a glorious and praiseworthy action with one lance to break and overthrow ten enemies. Therefore, with a sharp, stiff, strong, and well-steeled lance, would he usually force up a door, pierce a harness, beat down a tree, carry away the ring, lift up a cuirasse saddle with the mail coat and gauntlet. All this he did in complete arms from head to foot. As for the prancing flourishes and smacking popisms for the better cherishing of the horse commonly used in riding, none did them better than he. The cavalerize of Ferreira was but an ape compared to him. He was singularly skillful in leaping nimbly from one horse to another without putting foot to the ground, and these horses were called desultories. He could likewise from either side, with a lance in his hand, leap on horseback without stirrups, and rule the horse at his pleasure without a bridle, for such things are useful in military engagements. Another day he exercised the battle-axe, which he so dexterously wielded, both in the nimble, strong, and smooth management of that weapon, and that in all the feats practicable by it, that he passed knight of arms in the field, and at all essays. Then tossed he the pike, played with the two-handed sword, with the back-sword, with the Spanish tuck, the dagger, poniard, armed, unarmed, with a buckler, with a cloak, with a target. Then would he hunt the hart, the roebuck, the bear, the fallow deer, the wild boar, the hare, the pheasant, the partridge, or the bustard. He played at the balloon, and made it bound in the air, both with fist and foot. He wrestled, ran, jumped, not at three steps in a leap, called the hops, nor at cloche a pied, called the hare's leap, nor yet at the almains. For, said gymnast, these jumps are for the wars altogether unprofitable, and of no use. But at one leap he would skip over a ditch, spring over a hedge, mount six paces upon a wall, ramp and grapple after this fashion up against a window of the full height of a lance. He did swim in deep waters on his belly, on his back, sideways, with all his body, with his feet only, with one hand in the air, wherein he held a book, crossing thus the breadth of the river of Seine, without wetting it, and dragging along his cloak with his teeth, as did Julius Caesar. Then with the help of one hand he entered forcibly into a boat, from whence he cast himself again headlong into the water, sounded the depths, hollowed the rocks, and plunged into the pits and the gulfs. Then turned he the boat about it, governed it, led it swiftly or slowly with the stream or against the stream, stopped it in his course, guided it with one hand, and with the other laid hard about him with a huge great oar, hoisted the sail, hied up along the mast by the shrouds, ran upon the edge of the decks, set the compass in order, tackled the bowlines, and steered the helm. Coming out of the water, he ran furiously up against a hill, and with the same alacrity and swiftness ran down again. He climbed up at trees like a cat, and leaped from the one to the other like a squirrel. He did pull down the great boughs and branches like another milo, then with two sharp, well-steeled daggers, and two tried bodkins, would he run up by the wall to the very top of a house like a rat, then suddenly came down from the top to the bottom, with such an even composition of members, that by the fall he would catch no harm. 
He did cast the dart, throw the bar, put the stone, practice the javelin, the boar spear or partisan, and the halbert. He broke the strongest bows in drawing, bent it against his breast the greatest crossbows of steel, took his aim by the eye with the handgun, and shot well, traversed and planted the cannon, shot at butt marks, at the papagay from below upwards, or to a height from above downwards, or to a descent, then before him sideways, and behind him, like the Parthians. They tied a cable rope to the top of a high tower, by one end whereof, hanging near the ground, he wrought himself with his hands to the very top. Then upon the same track came down so sturdily and firm that you could not on a plain meadow have run with more assurance. They set up a great pole fixed upon two trees. There would he hang by his hands, and with them alone, his feet touching at nothing, would go back and fore along the foresaid rope with so great swiftness that hardly could one overtake him with running. And then to exercise his breast and lungs he would shout like all the devils in hell. I heard him once call Eudemon from St. Victor's Gate to Montmartre. Stentor had never heard such a voice at the siege of Troy. Then, for the strengthening of his nerves or sinews, they made him two great sows of lead, each of them weighing eight thousand and seven hundred quintals, which they called altares. Those he took up from the ground, in each hand one, then lifted them up over his head, and held them so, without stirring three quarters of an hour and more, which was an inimitable force. He fought at barriers with the stoutest and most vigorous champions, and when it came to the cope, he stood so sturdily on his feet that he abandoned himself unto the strongest, in case they could remove him from his place, as Milo was wont to do of old, in whose imitation, likewise, he held a pomegranate in his hand, to give it unto him that could take it from him. The time being thus bestowed, and himself rubbed, cleansed, wiped, and refreshed with other clothes, he returned fair and softly, and passing through certain meadows, or other grassy places, beheld the trees and plants, comparing them with what is written of them in the books of the ancients, such as Theophrast, Dioscorides, Marinus, Pliny, Nicander, Macer, and Galen, and carried home to the house great handfuls of them, whereof a young page calls Rizotomos had charge, together with little mattocks, pickaxes, grubbing hooks, cabbies, pruning knives, and other instruments requisite for herborizing. Being come to their lodging, whilst supper was making ready, they repeated certain passages of that which hath been read, and sat down to the table. Here remarked that his dinner was sober and thrifty, for he did then eat only to prevent the gnawings of his stomach, but his supper was copious and large, for he took then as much as was fit to maintain and nourish him, which indeed is the true diet prescribed by the art of good and sound physic. Although a rabble of logger-headed physicians, nuzzled in the brabbling shops of sophisters, counsel the contrary. During that repast was continued the lesson read at dinner as long as they thought good. The rest was spent in good discourse, learned and profitable. After that they had given thanks, he set himself to sing vocally, and play upon harmonious instruments, or otherwise passed his time at some pretty sports, made with cards or dice, or in practicing the feats of ledger domain with cups and balls. There they stayed some nights in frolicking thus, and making themselves merry till it was time to go to bed and on other nights they would go make visits unto learned men, or to such as had been travellers in strange and remote countries. When it was full night, before they retired themselves, they went unto the most open place of the house, to see the face of the sky, and there beheld the comets, if any were, as likewise the figures, situations, aspects, oppositions, and conjunctions of both the fixed stars and planets. Then with his master did he briefly recapitulate, after the manner of the Pythagoreans, that which he had read, seen, learned, done, and understood in the whole course of that day. Then prayed they unto God their Creator, in falling down before Him, and strengthening their faith towards Him, and glorifying Him for His boundless bounty, and giving thanks unto Him for the time that was past, they recommended themselves to His divine clemency for the future, which being done, they went to bed, and betook themselves to their repose and rest. End of chapter 23 Read by Richard Wallace, Liberty, Missouri, 22 April 2010. Chapter 24 of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robbie Hume. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book 1 by Francois Rabelais. Translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart. Chapter 24. 
how Gargantua spent his time in rainy weather. If it happened that the weather were anything cloudy, foul, and rainy, all the forenoon was employed, as before specified, according to custom, with this difference only, that they had a good, clear fire lighted to correct the distempers of the air. But after dinner, instead of their wonted exercitations, they did abide within, and, by way of apotherapy, that is, a making the body healthful by exercise, did recreate themselves in bottling up of hay, in cleaving and sawing of wood, and in threshing sheaves of corn at the barn. Then they studied the art of painting or carving, and brought into use the antique play of tables, as Leonicus hath written of it, and as our good friend Lazarus playeth at it. In playing they examined the passages of ancient authors wherein the said play is mentioned, or any metaphor drawn from it. They went likewise to see the drawing of metals, or the casting of great ordnance, how the lapidaries did work, as also the goldsmiths and cutters of precious stones. Nor did they omit to visit the alchemists, money-coiners, upholsterers, weavers, velvet-workers, watchmakers, looking-glass framers, printers, organists, and any other such kind of artificers, and, everywhere giving them somewhat to drink, did learn and consider the industry and invention of the trades. They went also to hear the public lectures, the solemn commencements, the repetitions, the acclamations, the pleadings of the gentle lawyers, and sermons of evangelical preachers. He went through the halls and places appointed for fencing, and there played against the masters themselves at all weapons, and showed them by experience that he knew as much in it as, yea, more than they. And instead of herborizing, they visited the shops of druggists, herbalists, and apothecaries, and diligently considered the fruits, roots, leaves, gums, seeds, the grease and ointments of some foreign parts, as also how they did adulterate them. He went to see the jugglers, tumblers, mountebanks, and quack-solvers, and considered their cunning, their shifts, their somersaults in the smooth tongue, especially of those of Chawney and Picardy, who are naturally great praters and brave givers of fibs in matter of green apes. At their return they did eat more soberly at supper than at other times, and meats more desiccative and extenuating, to the end that the intemperate moisture of the air, communicated to the body by a necessary confinitive, might by this means be corrected, and that they might not receive any prejudice for want of their ordinary bodily exercise. Thus was Gargantua governed, and kept on in this course of education, from day to day profiting, as you may understand such a young man of his age may, of a pregnant judgment, with good discipline well continued, which, although at the beginning it seemed difficult, became a little after so sweet, so easy, and so delightful, that it seemed rather the recreation of a king than the study of a scholar. Nevertheless, Pinocrates, to divert him from this vehement intention of the spirits, thought fit, once in a month, upon some fair and clear day, to go out of the city betimes in the morning, either towards Gentilly, or Boulogne, or to Montrouge, or Charenton Bridge, or to Vanvay, or St. Cloud, and there spent all the day long in making the greatest cheer that could be devised, sporting, making merry, drinking healths, playing, singing, dancing, tumbling in some fair meadow, a nestling of sparrows, taking of quails, and fishing for frogs and crabs. But although that day was passed without books or lecture, yet it was not spent without profit, for in the said meadows they usually repeated certain pleasant verses of Virgil's agriculture, of Hesiod and of Politian's husbandry, would set abroach some witty Latin epigrams, then immediately turned them into roundelays and songs for dancing in the French language. In their feasting they would sometimes separate the water from the wine that was therewith mixed, as Cato teaches, de re rustica, and Pliny with an ivy cup would wash the wine in a basin full of water, then take it out again with a funnel, as pure as ever. They made the water go from one glass to another, and contrived a thousand little automatory engines, that is to say, moving of themselves. End of chapter 24 Chapter Twenty Five of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nadine Cartboulet. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One, by Francois Rabelais. Translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart. Chapter Twenty Five. How there was great strife and debate raised betwixt the cake bakers of Lern and those of Gargantua's country, 
whereupon were waged great wars. At that time, which was the season of vintage, in the beginning of harvest, when the country shepherds were set to keep the vines, and hinder the starlings from eating up the grapes, as some cake-bakers of learn happened to pass along in the broad highway, driving into the city ten or twelve horses loaded with cakes, the said shepherds courteously entreated them to give them some for their money, as the price then rolled in the market. For here it is to be remarked that it is a celestial food to eat for breakfast hot fresh cakes with grapes, especially the frail clusters, the great red grapes, the muscadine, the virtuous grape, and the lascard, for those that are costive in their belly, because it will make them gush out and squirt the length of a hunter's staff like the very tap of a barrel, and oftentimes, thinking to let us quip, they did all to be squatter and conscite themselves, whereupon they are commonly called the vintage thinkers. The bun-sellers or cake-makers were in nothing inclinable to their request, but, which was worse, did injure them most outrageously, calling them prattling gabblers, licorous gluttons, freckled bitters, mangy rascals, shite abed scoundrels, drunken roysters, sly knaves, drowsy loiterers, slapsos fellows, slabber to gullion druggles, lubberly louts, cozening foxes, ruffian rogues, paltry customers, psychophon varlets, droll latch hoydens, flouting milksops, jeering companions, staring clowns, forlorn snakes, ninny lobcocks, scurvy snipskis, thundling fops, base loons, saucy coxcombs, idle lusks, scoffing braggarts, nerdy meacocks, blockish gratnals, dotty pole tolt heads, jovenal goose caps, foolish logger heads, flutch calf lollies, crowd head nut snappers, lob dotterals, gaping changelings, cot's head loobies, woodcock slangums, ninny hammer fly catchers, nerdy pig simpletons, turdy gut, shitten shepherds, and other such like defamatory epithets, saying further that it was not for them to eat of these dainty cakes, but might very well content themselves with the coarse unranged bread, or to eat of the great brown household loaf. To which provoking words, one amongst them, called Forgier, an honest fellow of his person and a notable springle, made answer very calmly thus, How long is it since you have got horns, that you are become so proud? Indeed, formerly you were wont to give us some freely, and will you not now let us have any for our money? This is not the part of good neighbours. Neither do we serve you thus when you come hither to buy our good corn, whereof you make your cakes and buns. Besides that, we would have given you to the bargain some of our grapes, but, by his sounds, you may chance to repent it, and possibly have need of us at another time, when we shall use you after the like manner, and therefore remember it. Then Marquet, a prime man in the confraternity of the cake-bakers, said unto him, "Yes, yeah, sir, thou art pretty well crest-risen this morning, though it is deed yes and I too much smillet and bollymong. Come hither, sir, come hither, I will give thee some cakes. Whereupon Forgier, dreading no harm, in all simplicity went towards him, and drew a sixpence out of his leather satchel, thinking that Marquet would have sold him some of his cakes. But instead of cakes— he gave him with his whip such a rude lash overthwart the legs, that the marks of the whipcord nuts were apparent in them, then would have fled away. But Forgier cried out as loud as he could, Oh, murder, murder, help, help, help! And in the meantime threw a great cudgel after him, which he carried under his arm, wherewith he hit him in the coronal joint of his head, upon the crotific artery of the right side thereof, so forcibly, that Marquet fell down from his mare more like a dead than living man. Meanwhile the farmers and country swains, that were watching their walnuts near to that place, came running with their great poles and long staves, and laid such load on these cake-bakers, as if they had been to thresh upon green rye. The other shepherds and shepherdesses, hearing the lamentable shout of Forgier, came with their slings and slackies following them, and throwing great stones at them, as thick as if it had been hail. At last they overtook them, and took from them about four or five dozen of their cakes. Nevertheless, they paid for them the ordinary price, and gave them over and above one hundred eggs and three baskets full of mulberries. Then did the cake-bakers help to get up to his mare Marquet, who was most shrewdly wounded, 
and forthwith returned to Lerne, changing the resolution they had to go to Paray, threatening very sharp and boisterously the cowherds, shepherds, and farmers of Seville and Cine. This done, the shepherds and shepherdesses made merry with these cakes and fine grapes, and sported themselves together at the sound of the pretty small pipe, scoffing and laughing at those vainglorious cake-bakers, who had that day met with a mischief for want of crossing themselves with a good hand in the morning. Nor did they forget to apply to Forgia's leg some fair great red medicinal grapes, and so handsomely dressed it and bound it up that he was quickly cured. End of chapter 25《ラプタ26 of Gargantua and Pentagril, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nadine g a r d b o u l e t Gargantua and Pentagril, Book 1, by François Rabelais. Translated by Sir Thomas e r q u a r t Chapter 26. How the inhabitants of Leun, by the commandment of p i c r o c h o t their king, Assaulted the shepherds of Gargantua unexpectedly and on a sudden. The cake bakers, being returned to learn, went presently, before they did either eat or drink, to the capital, and there before their king, called Picrochol, the third of that name, made their complaint, showing their panniers broken, their caps all crumpled, their coats torn, their cakes taken away, but, above all, Marquet most enormously wounded. Saying that all that mischief was done by the shepherds and herdsmen of Grangousier, near the broad highway beyond Seville. p i c r o c h o l incontinent grew angry and furious, and, without asking any further what, how, why, or wherefore, commanded the Ben and Aria Ben to be sounded throughout all his country, that all his vessels of what condition soever should, upon pain of the halter, come, in the best arms they could, unto the great place before the castle. At the hour of noon, and, the better to strengthen his design, he caused the drum to be beat about the town. Himself, whilst his dinner was making ready, went to see his artillery mounted upon the carriage, to display his colours, and set up the great royal standard, and loaded wains with store of ammunition both for the field and the belly, arms and victuals. At dinner he dispatched his commissions. And by his express edict, my lord Chagrag was appointed to command the vanguard, wherein were numbered sixteen thousand and fourteen arquebusiers or firelocks, together with thirty thousand and eleven volunteer adventurers. The great t o u q u e d i l l o n master of the horse, had the charge of the ordnance, wherein were reckoned nine hundred and fourteen brazen pieces, in cannons, double cannons, basilisks, serpentines, culverins, b o m b a r d s or murderers. Falcons, bases, or p a s v o l i n s spirals, and other sorts of great guns. The rear guard was committed to the Duke of Scrapegood. In the maid battle was the king and the princes of his kingdom. Thus being hastily furnished, before they would set forward, they sent three hundred light horsemen, under the conduct of Captain Swillwind, to discover the country, clear the avenues, and see whether there was any ambush laid for them. But, after they had made diligent search, They found all the land round about in peace and quiet, without any meeting or convention at all, which b i c r o c h o l understanding, commanded that every one should march speedily under his colours. Then immediately in all disorder, without keeping either rank or file, they took the fields one amongst another, wasting, spoiling, destroying, and making havoc of all wherever they went, not sparing poor nor rich, privileged or unprivileged places, church nor laity, Drove away oxen and cows, bulls, calves, heifers, wethers, ooze, lambs, goats, kids, hens, capons, chickens, geese, ganders, goslings, hogs, swine, pigs, and such like, beating down the walnuts, plucking the grapes, tearing the hedges, shaking the fruit trees, and committing such incomparable abuses that the like abomination was never heard of. Nevertheless, they met with none to resist them. For every one submitted to their mercy, beseeching them that they might be dealt with courteously in regard that they had always carried themselves as became good and loving neighbours, and that they had never been guilty of any wrong or outrage done upon them, to be thus suddenly surprised, 
troubled, and disquieted, and that, if they would not desist, God would punish them very shortly. To which expostulations and remonstrances no other answer was made, but that they would teach them to eat cakes. End of chapter 26「Chapter 27 of Gargantua and Pantagruel」Book 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org「Gargantua and Pantagruel」Book 1 by Francois Rebelais, translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart, Chapter Twenty Seven: How a Monk of Seville saved the clothes of the Abbey from being ransacked by the enemy. So much they did, and so far they went pillaging and stealing, that at last they came to Seville, where they robbed both men and women, and took all they could catch. Nothing was either too hot or too heavy for them. Although the plague was there in the most part of all the houses, they nevertheless entered everywhere, then plundered and carried away all that was within. And yet for all this, not one of them took any hurt, which is a most wonderful case. For the curates, vicars, preachers, physicians, Chirurgeons and apothecaries who went to visit, to dress, to cure, to heal, to preach unto and admonish those that were sick were all dead of the infection, and these devilish robbers and murderers caught never any harm at all. Whence comes this to pass, my masters? I beseech you think upon it. The town being thus pillaged, they went unto the abbey with a horrible noise and tumult, but they found it shut and made fast against them, whereupon the body of the army marched forward toward a pass or ford called the Gu David, except seven companies of foot and two hundred lancers, who, staying there, broke down the walls of the clothes to waste, spoil, and make havoc of all the vines and vintage within that place. The monks, poor devils, knew not in that extremity to which of all their saints they should vow themselves. Nevertheless, at all ventures they rang the bells ad capitulum, capitulantes. There it was decreed that they should make a fair procession, stuffed with good lectures, prayers, and litanies contra hostium insidious, and jolly responses pro posse. There was then in the abbey a claustral monk, called Friar John, of the funnels and gobbets, in French des entumores, young, gallant, frisk, lusty, nimble, quick, active, bold, adventurous, resolute, tall, lean, wide-mouthed, long-nosed, a fair dispatcher of morning prayers, unbridler of masses, and runner over of vigils, and to conclude summarily in a word, a right monk, if ever there was any, since the monking world monked a monkery. For the rest, a clerk even to the teeth a matter of bravery. This monk hearing the noise that the enemy made within the enclosure of the vineyard, went out to see what they were doing, and perceiving that they were cutting and gathering the grapes, whereon was grounded the foundation of all their next year's wine, returned unto the choir of the church, where the other monks were, all amazed and astonished like so many bell melters, whom when he heard sing, Im nim pi ni 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 ne ni.
Tum ni num num ini mi ko o no o o ni no ni no 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 rum ni num num. It is well shit. Well sung, said he. By the virtue of God, why do not you sing? Panniers, farewell, vintage is done. The devil snatch me, if they be not already within the middle of our clothes, and cut so well both vines and grapes, that by Cod's body there will not be found for these four years to come so much as a gleaning in it. By the belly of St. James, what shall we poor devils drink the while? Lord God, da mihi potum. Then said the prior of the convent, What should this drunken fellow do here? Let him be carried to prison for troubling the divine service. Nay, said the monk, the wine service, let us behave ourselves, so that it be not troubled. For you yourself, my lord prior, love to drink of the best, and so doeth every honest man. Never yet did a man of worth dislike good wine. It is a monastical aphothem. But these responses that you chant here, by God, are not in season. Wherefore is it that our devotions were instituted to be short in the time of harvest and vintage, and long in the advent and all the winter? The late friar Masopilos, of good memory, a true zealous man or else I give myself to the devil of our religion told me and I remember it well how the reason was that in this season we might press and make the wine and in winter whiff it up hark you my masters you that love the wine cop's body follow me for St. Anthony burn me as freely as a faggot if they get leave to taste one drop of the liquor that would not now come and fight for relief of the vine. Hog's belly, the goods of the church. Ah, no, no. What the devil? St. Thomas of England was well content to die for them. If I died in the same cause, should not I be a saint likewise? Yes. Yet shall not I die there for all this. For it is I that must do it to others and send them a packing. As he spake, this he threw off his great monk's habits and laid hold upon the staff of the cross, which was made of the heart of a sorb apple tree, it being of the length of a lance, round of a full grip, and a little powdered with lilies called fleur de luce. The workmanship whereof was almost all defaced and worn out. Thus went he out in a fair long skirted jacket, putting his frock scarfwise athwart his breast, and in this equipage, with his staff, shaft, or trunkion of the cross, laid on so lustily, brisk, and fiercely upon his enemies, who, without any order, or ensign, or trumpet, or drum, were busied in gathering the grapes of the vineyard. For the cornets, godons, and ensign bearers had laid down their standards, banners, and colors by the wall sides. The drummers had knocked out the heads of their drums on one end to fill them with grapes. The trumpeters were loaded with great bundles of bunches and huge knots of clusters. In some, every one of them was out of array and all in disorder. He hurried therefore upon them so rudely, without crying gear or beware, that he overthrew them like hogs, tumbled them over like swine, striking athwart and alongst, and by one means or other laid so about him, after the old fashion of fencing, that to some he beat out their brains, to others he crushed their arms, battered their legs, and bethwacked their sides till their ribs cracked with it. To others again he unjointed the spondyls or knuckles of the neck, disfigured their chaps, gashed their faces, made their cheeks hang flapping on their chin, and so swinged and belammed them 
that they fell down before him like hay before a mower. To some others he spoiled the frame of their kidneys, marred their backs, broke their thigh bones, passed in their noses, poached out their eyes, cleft their mandibles, tore their jaws, dung in their teeth into their throats, shook asunder their omoplates or shoulder blades, sphaciated their shins, mortified their shanks, inflamed their ankles, heaved off of the hinges their ischies, their sciatica or hip gout, dislocated the joints of their knees, squattered into pieces the bouts or pestiles of their thighs, and so thumped, mauled, and belabored them everywhere that never was corn so thick and threefold threshed upon by plowmen's flails as were the pitifully disjointed members of their mangled bodies under the merciless baton of the cross. If any offered to hide himself amongst the thickness of the vines, he laid him squat as he flounder, bruised the ridge of his back, and dashed his reins like a dog. If any thought by flight to escape, he made his head to fly in pieces by the lamboidial commissure, which is a seam in the hinder part of the skull. If any one did scramble up into a tree, thinking there to be safe, he rent up his pyrene and impaled him in at the fundament. If any of his old acquaintance happened to cry out, Ah, Friar John! My friend, Friar John, quarter, quarter, I yield myself to you. To you, I render myself. So thou shalt, said he, and must, whether thou wouldst or no. And withal render and yield up thy soul to all the devils in hell. Then subtly gave them dronos, that is, so many knocks, thumps, raps, dents, thwacks, and bangs, as suffice to warn Pluto of their coming and dispatch them a-going. If any was so rash and full of temerity as to resist him to his face, then was it he that showed the strength of his muscles, for without more ado he did transpierce him by running him in at the breast, through the mediastin and the heart. Others, again, he so quashed and bebumped that with a sound bounce under the hollow of their short ribs he overturned their stomachs so that they died immediately. To some, with a smart soothes on the epigaster, he would make their midriff swag, then, redoubling the blow, gave them such a home push on the navel that he made their puddings to gush out. To others, through their ballots he pierced their bum gut, and left not bowel, tripe, nor entrail in their body, that had not felt the impetuosity, fierceness, and fury of his violence. Believe that it was the most horrible spectacle that ever one saw. Some cried unto St. Barbie, others to St. George. Oh, the holy lady knighted, said one, the good Sanctus. Oh, our lady of Secures, said another. Help, help. Others cried, Our lady of Cunat, of Loretto, of good tidings, on the other side of the water, St. Mary over. Some vowed a pilgrimage to St. James, and others to the holy handkerchief at Shambury which three months after that burnt so well in the fire that they could not get one thread of it saved. Others sent up their vows to St. Catherine, others to St. John de Angeli, and to St. Eutropius of Xantes. Others again invoked St. Mesmes of Chinon, St. Martin of Candies, St. Cloud of Senes, the holy relics of Lorazé, with a thousand other jolly little saints and saintrels, 
Some died without speaking. Others spoke without dying. Some died in speaking. Others spoke in dying. Others shouted as loud as they could. Confession! Confession! Confetior! Miserere! In menace! So great was the cry of the wounded that the prior of the abbey with all his monks came forth who, when they saw these poor wretches so slain amongst the vines and wounded to death, confessed some of them. But whilst the priests were busied in confessing them, the little monkeys ran all to the place where Friar John was, and asked him wherein he would be pleased to require their assistance, to which he answered that they should cut the throats of those he had thrown down upon the ground. They presently, leaving their outer habits and cowls upon the rails, began to throttle and make an end of those whom he had already crushed. Can you tell with what instruments they did it? With fair gullies, which are little hulk-backed demi-knives, the iron tool whereof is two inches long, and the wooden handle one inch thick, and three inches in length, wherewith the little boys in our country cut ripe walnuts in two while they are yet in the shell, and pick out the kernel. And they found them very fit for the expediting of that weasened slitting exploit. In the meantime, Friar John, with his formidable baton of the cross, got to the breach which the enemies had made, and there stood to snatch up those that endeavored to escape. Some of the monquitos carried the standards, banners, ensigns, guidons, and colors into their cells and chambers to make garters of them. But when those that had been shriven would have gone out at the gap of the said breach, the sturdy monk quashed and fell them down with blows, saying, These men have had confession and are penitent souls. They have got their absolution and gained the pardons. They go into paradise as straight as a sickle, or as the way is to Fay, like Crooked Lane at East Cheap. Thus by his prowess and valor were discomfited all those of that army that entered into the close of the abbey, unto the number of thirteen thousand six hundred twenty and two besides the women and little children, which is always to be understood. Never did Morgus, the hermit bear himself, more valiantly with his bordon or pilgrim staff against the Saracens, of whom is written in the Acts of the Four Sons of Ivan, than did this monk against his enemies with the staff of the cross. End of chapter 27、Rainbow. Chapter 28 of Gargantua and Pantagruel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One, by Francois Rebelay, translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart, Chapter Twenty Eight, How Picrochole stormed and took by assault the rock Clermond, and of Grangousier's unwillingness and aversion from the undertaking of war. Whilst the monk did the skirmish. As we have said, against those which were entered within the close, Picricole in great haste passed the ford of Vidi, a very especial pass, with all his soldiers, and set upon the rock Clermont, where there was made him no resistance at all, and because it was already night, he resolved to quarter himself and his army in that town, and to refresh himself. 
of his purgative colic. In the morning he stormed and took the bulwarks and castle, which afterwards he fortified with rampiers, and furnished with all ammunition requisite, intending to make his retreat there, if he should happen to be otherwise worsted, for it was a strong place, both by art and nature, in regard of the stance and situation of it. But let us leave them there, and return to our good Gargantua, who is at Paris, very assiduous and earnest at the study of good letters and athletical exercitations, and to the good old man, Grand Goussier, his father, who after supper warmeth his ballocks by a good, clear, great fire, and, waiting upon the boiling of some chestnuts, is very serious in drawing scratches on the hearth, with a stick burnt at the one end, wherewith they did stir up the fire telling to his wife and the rest of the family pleasant old stories and tales of former times. Whilst he was thus employed, one of the shepherds which did keep the vines, named Pillow, came towards him, and to the full related the enormous abuses which were committed and the excessive spoil that was made by Picricole, king of learning, upon his lands and territories and how he had pillaged, wasted, and ransacked all the country, except the enclosure at Seville, which Friar John de Entormeres, to his great honor, had preserved, and that at the same present time the said king was in the rock Clermont, and there, with great industry and circumspection, was strengthening himself and his whole army. Alas, alas, alas! said Grand Goussier. What is this, good people? Do I dream, or is it true that they tell me? Picricole, my ancient friend of old time, of my own kindred and alliance, comes he to invade me? What moves him? What provokes him? What sets him on? What drives him to it? Who hath given him this counsel? Ho, 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 my God, my Savior, help me, inspire me, and advise me what I shall do. I protest, I swear before thee, so be thou favorable to me, if ever I did him or his subjects any damage or displeasure, or committed any the least robbery in his country, but on the contrary, I have secured and supplied him with men, money, friendship, and counsel, upon any occasion wherein I could be steadable for the improvement of his good. That he hath therefore at this nick of time so outraged and wronged me, it cannot be but by the malevolent and wicked spirit. Good God, thou knowest my courage, for nothing can be hidden from thee. If perhaps he be grown mad, and that thou hast sent him hither to me for the better recovery and re-establishment of his brain, grant me power and wisdom to bring him to the yoke of thy holy will by good discipline. Ho, 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 my good people, my friends and my faithful servants, must I hinder you from helping me? Alas, my old age required henceforward nothing else but rest. In all the days of my life, I have labored for nothing so much as peace. But now I must, I see it well, low with arms my poor, weary and feeble shoulders, and take in my trembling hand the lance and horseman's mace, to succor and protect my honest subjects. Reason will have it so, for by their labor am I entertained, and with their sweat am I nourished, I, my children, and my family. This notwithstanding, I will not undertake war, until I have first tried all the ways and means of peace that I resolve upon. Then assembled he his counsel, and proposed the matter as it was indeed, whereupon it was concluded that they should send some discreet man unto Picricole, to know wherefore he had thus suddenly broken the peace and invaded those lands unto which he had no right nor title. Furthermore, that they should send for Gargantua, 
and those under his command for the preservation of the country and defense thereof now in need. All this pleased Grand Goussier very well, and he commanded that so it should be done. Presently, therefore, he sent the Basque, his lackey, to fetch Gargantua with all diligence, and wrote him as followeth. End of chapter 28Chapter 29 of Gargantua and Pantagruel Book 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gargantua and Pantagruel Book 1 by Francois Rabelais Translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart Chapter 29 the tenure of the letter which Grand Goussier wrote to his son, Gargantua. The fervency of thy studies did require that I should not in a long time recall thee from that philosophical rest thou now enjoyest. If the confidence reposed in our friends and ancient confederates had not at this present disappointed the assurance of my old age, but seeing such is my fatal destiny, that I should be now disquieted by those in whom I trusted most, I am forced to call thee back to help the people and goods which by the right of nature belong unto thee. For even as arms are weak abroad, if there be not counsel at home, so is that study vain and counsel unprofitable, which in a due and convenient time is not by virtue executed and put in effect. My deliberation is not to provoke, but to appease, not to assault, but to defend, not to conquer, but to preserve my faithful subjects and hereditary dominions, into which Picricole is entered in a hostile manner without any ground or cause, and from day to day pursueth his furious enterprise with that height of insolence that is intolerable to freeborn spirits. I have endeavored to moderate his tyrannical choler, offering him all that which I thought might give him satisfaction and oftentimes have I sent lovingly unto him to understand wherein, by whom, and how he found himself to be wronged. But of him could I obtain no other answer but a mere defiance, and that in my lands he did pretend only to the right of a civil correspondency and good behavior, whereby I knew that the eternal God had left him to the disposure of his own free will and sensual appetite, which cannot choose but be wicked, if by divine grace it be not continually guided, and to contain him within his duty, and bring him to know himself, hath sent him hither to me by a grievous token. Therefore, my beloved son, as soon as thou canst, upon sight of these letters, repair hither with all diligence, to succor not me so much, which nevertheless by natural piety thou oughtest to do, as thine own people which by reason thou mayest save and preserve. The exploit shall be done with as little effusion of blood as may be, and if possible, by means far more expedient, such as military policy, devices, and stratagems of war. We shall save all the souls, and send them home as merry as crickets unto their own houses. My dearest son, the peace of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, be with thee. Salute from me, Ponocrates, Gymnastes, and Eudemon, the 20th of September, thy father, Rangoussier. End of chapter 29. Chapter 30 of Gagantua and Pantagruel. Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book 1 by Francois Rabelais. Translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart. Chapter 30 How Ulrich Gallet 
was sent unto Piccolo. The letters being dictated, signed and sealed, Grangousier ordained that Auric Galley, master of the request, a very wise and discreet man, of whose prudence and sound judgment he had made trial on several difficult and debateful matters, should go unto Piccolo to show what had been decreed amongst them. At the same hour departed the good man Gele, and having passed the ford, asked at the miller that dwelt there in what condition Piccolo was, who answered him that his soldiers had left him neither cock nor hen, that they were retired and shut up into the rock, Clermont, and that he would not advise him to go any further for fear of the scouts because they were enormously furious, which he easily believed, and therefore lodged that night with the miller. The next morning he went with a trumpeter to the gate of the castle, and required the guards he might be admitted to speak with the king of somewhat that concerned him. These words being told unto the king, he would by no means consent that they should open the gate, but getting upon the top of the bulwark, said unto the ambassador, What is the news? What have you to say? Then the ambassador began to speak as followeth. End of chapter 30 Chapter 31 of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book 1 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One, by Francois Rabelais, translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart. Chapter Thirty One. The speech made by Galet to Picrochol. There cannot arise among men a juster cause of grief than when they receive hurt and damage, where they may justly expect for favour and good will, and not without cause though without reason have many after they had fallen into such a calamitous accident esteemed this indignity less supportable than the loss of their own lives in such sort that if they had not been able by force of arms nor any other means by reach of wit or subtlety to stop them in their course and restrain their fury they have fallen into desperation and utterly deprived themselves of this light it is therefore no wonder if king grangousier my master be full of high displeasure and much disquieted in mind upon thy outrageous and hostile coming but truly it would be a marvel if he were not sensible of and moved with the incomparable abuses and injuries perpetrated by thee and thine upon those of his country towards whom there hath been no example of inhumanity omitted which in itself is to him so grievous for the cordial affection wherewith he hath always cherished his subjects that more it cannot be to any mortal man yet in this above human apprehension is it to him the more grievous that these wrongs and sad offences have been committed by thee and thine who time out of mind from all antiquity thou and thy predecessors have been in a continual league and amity with him and all his ancestors 
which even until this time you have as sacred together inviolably preserved kept and entertained so well that not he and his only but the very barbarous nations of the poitevin breton manceau and those that dwell beyond the isles of the canaries and that of isabella have thought it as easy to pull down the firmament and to set up the depths above the clouds as to make a breach in your alliance and have been so afraid of it in their enterprises that they have never dared to provoke incense or endamage the one for fear of the other nay which is more this sacred league hath so filled the world that there are few nations at this day inhabiting throughout all the continents and isles of the ocean who have not ambitiously aspired to be received into it upon your own covenants and conditions holding your joint confederacy in as high esteem as their own territories and dominions in such sort that from the memory of man there hath not been either prince or league so wild and proud that durst have offered to invade i say not your countries but not so much as those of your confederates and if by rash and heady counsel they have attempted any new design against them as soon as they heard the name and title of your alliance they have suddenly desisted from their enterprises what rage and madness therefore doth now incite thee all old alliance infringed all amity trod under foot and all right violated thus in a hostile manner to invade his country without having been by him or his in anything prejudiced wronged or provoked where is faith where is law where is reason where is humanity where is the fear of god dost thou think that these atrocious abuses are hidden from the eternal spirit and the supreme god who is the just rewarder of all our undertakings if thou so think thou deceivest thyself for all things shall come to pass as in his incomprehensible judgment he hath appointed is it thy fatal destiny or influences of the stars that would put an end to thy so long enjoyed ease and rest for that all things have their end and period so as that when they are come to the superlative point of their greatest height they are in a trice tumbled down again as not being able to abide long in that state this is the conclusion and end of those who cannot by reason and temperance moderate their fortunes and prosperities but if it be predestinated that thy happiness and ease must now come to an end must it needs be by wronging my king him by whom thou wert established if thy house must come to ruin should it therefore in its fall crush the heels of him that set it up the matter is so unreasonable and so dissonant from common sense that hardly can it be conceived by human understanding and altogether incredible unto strangers 
till by the certain and undoubted effects thereof it be made apparent that nothing is either sacred or holy to those who having emancipated themselves from god and reason do merely follow the perverse affections of their own depraved nature if any wrong had been done by us to thy subjects and dominions if we had favoured thy ill-willers if we had not assisted thee in thy need if thy name and reputation had been wounded by us or to speak more truly if the calumniating spirit tempting to induce thee to evil had by false illusions and deceitful fantasies put into thy conceit the impression of a thought that we had done unto thee anything unworthy of our ancient correspondence and friendship thou oughtest first to have inquired out the truth and afterwards by a seasonable warning to admonish us thereof and we should have so satisfied thee according to thine own heart's desire that thou shouldst have had occasion to be contented but o oh, eternal god what is thy enterprise wouldst thou like a perfidious tyrant thus spoil and lay waste my master's kingdom hast thou found him so silly and blockish that he would not or so destitute of men and money of counsel and skill in military discipline that he cannot withstand thy unjust invasion march hence presently and to-morrow some time of the day retreat unto thine own country without doing any kind of violence or disorderly act by the way and pay withal a thousand besons of gold which in english money amounteth to five thousand pounds for reparation of the damages thou hast done in this country half thou shalt pay to-morrow and the other half at the ides of may next coming leaving with us in the meantime for hostages the dukes of turnbank low buttock and small trash together with the prince of itches and viscount of snatchbit tournemoule pas de fesse menuaille gratel morpiaille end of chapter thirty one recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey chapter thirty two of gargantua and pantagruel book one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by martin geeson gargantua and pantagruel book one by francois rabelais translated by sir thomas urquhart chapter thirty two how grangousier to buy peace caused the cakes to be restored with that the good man gallet held his peace but picrochole to all his discourse answered nothing but come and fetch them come and fetch them they have bollocks fair and soft they will knead and provide some cakes for you then returned he to grangousier whom he found upon his knees bareheaded crouching in a little corner of his cabinet 
and humbly praying unto god that he would vouchsafe to assuage the choler of picrochole and bring him to the rule of reason without proceeding by force when the good man came back he asked him ha my friend what news do you bring me there is neither hope nor remedy said gallet the man is quite out of his wits and forsaken of god yea but said grangousier my friend what cause doth he pretend for his outrages he did not show me any cause at all said gallet only that in a great anger he spoke some words of cakes i cannot tell if they have done any wrong to his cake bakers i will know said grangousier the matter thoroughly before i resolve any more upon what is to be done then sent he to learn concerning that business and found by true information that his men had taken violently some cakes from picrochole's people and that marquet's head was broken with a slacky or short cudgel that nevertheless all was well paid and that the said marquet had first hurt forgier with a stroke of his whip athwart the legs and it seemed good to his whole council that he should defend himself with all his might notwithstanding all this said grangousier seeing the question is but about a few cakes i will labour to content him for i am very unwilling to wage war against him he inquired then what quantity of cakes they had taken away and understanding that it was but some four or five dozen he commanded five cartloads of them to be baked that same night and that there should be one full of cakes made with fine butter fine yolks of eggs fine saffron and fine spice to be bestowed upon marquet unto whom likewise he directed to be given seven hundred thousand and three philips that is at three shillings the piece one hundred five thousand pounds and nine shillings of english money for reparation of his losses and hindrances and for satisfaction of the chirurgeon that had dressed his wound and furthermore settled upon him and his for ever in freehold the apple orchard called la pomardiere for the conveyance and passing of all which was sent gallet who by the way as they went made them gather near the willow trees great store of boughs canes and reeds wherewith all the carriers were enjoined to garnish and deck their carts and each of them to carry one in his hand as himself likewise did thereby to give all men to understand that they demanded but peace and that they came to buy it being come to the gate they required to speak with picrochole from grangousier picrochole would not so much as let them in nor go to speak with them but sent them word that he was busy and that they should deliver their mind to captain touquedillon who was then planting a piece of ordnance upon the wall then said the good man unto him my lord to ease you of all this labour and to take away all excuses why you may not return unto our former alliance we do here presently restore unto you the cakes upon which the quarrel arose 
five dozen did our people take away they were well paid for we love peace so well that we restore unto you five cart-loads of which this cart shall be for marquet who doth most complain besides to content him entirely here are seven hundred thousand and three philips which i deliver to him and for the losses he may pretend to have sustained i resign for ever the farm of the pomardiere to be possessed in fee simple by him and his for ever without the payment of any duty or acknowledgment of homage fealty fine or service whatsoever and here is the tenor of the deed and for god's sake let us live henceforward in peace and withdraw yourselves merrily into your own country from within this place unto which you have no right at all as yourselves must needs confess and let us be good friends as before touquedillon related all this to picrochol and more and more exasperated his courage saying to him these clowns are afraid to some purpose by god grand gousier conskites himself for fear the poor drinker he is not skilled in warfare neither hath he any stomach for it he knows better how to empty the flagons that is his art <laughs> i am of opinion that it is fit we send back the carts and the money and for the rest that very speedily we fortify ourselves here then prosecute our fortune but what do they think to have to do with a ninny whoop to feed you thus with cakes you may see what it is the good usage and great familiarity which you have had with them heretofore hath made you contemptible in their eyes anoint a villain he will prick you prick a villain and he will anoint you ungentem pungit pungentem rusticus ungit sa, sa, sa said picrochol by st james you have given a true character of them one thing i will advise you said touquedillon we are here but badly victualled and furnished with mouth harness very slenderly if grand gousier should come to besiege us i would go presently and pluck out of all your soldiers heads and mine own all the teeth except three to each of us and with them alone we should make an end of our provision but too soon we shall have said picrochol but too much sustenance and feeding stuff came we hither to eat or to fight to fight indeed said touquedillon yet from the paunch comes the dance and where famine rules force is exiled leave off your prating said picrochol and forthwith seize upon what they have brought then took they money and cakes oxen and carts and sent them away without speaking one word only that they would come no more so near for a reason that they would give them the morrow after thus without doing anything returned they to grand gousier and related the whole matter unto him subjoining that there was no hope left to draw them to peace but by sharp and fierce wars end of chapter thirty two recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey
Chapter thirty three of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One by francois rabelais translated by sir thomas urquhart chapter thirty three how some statesmen of picrochol by hair-brained counsel put him in extreme danger the carts being unloaded and the money and cakes secured there came before picrochol the duke of small trash the earl swashbuckler and captain dirt tail menuaille spadassin merdaille who said unto him sir this day we make you the happiest the most warlike and chivalrous prince that ever was since the death of alexander of macedonia be covered be covered said picrochol gramercy said they we do but our duty the manner is thus you shall leave some captain here to have the charge of this garrison with a party competent for keeping of the place which besides its natural strength is made stronger by the rampiers and fortresses of your devising your army you are to divide into two parts as you know very well how to do one part thereof shall fall upon grangousier and his forces by it shall he be easily at the very first shock routed and then shall you get money by heaps for the clown hath store of ready coin clown we call him because a noble and generous prince hath never a penny and that to hoard up treasure is but a clownish trick the other part of the army in the meantime shall draw towards onis xaintonge angomois and gascony then march to perigot medoc and elan taking wherever you come without resistance towns castles and forts afterwards to bayonne st john de luc to fontarabia where you shall seize upon all the ships and coasting along galicia and portugal shall pillage all the maritime places even unto lisbon where you shall be supplied with all necessaries befitting a conqueror by copsody spain will yield for they are but a race of lubies then are you to pass by the straits of gibraltar where you shall erect two pillars more stately than those of hercules to the perpetual memory of your name and the narrow entrance there shall be called the picrocholinal sea having passed the picrocholinal sea behold barbarossa yields himself your slave i will said picrochol give him fair quarter and spare his life yea said they so that he be content to be christened and you shall conquer the kingdoms of tunis of hippo argia bomine bona corone yea all barbary furthermore you shall take into your hands majorca minorca sardinia corsica with the other islands of the ligustic and balearian seas going alongst on the left hand you shall rule all gallia narbonensis provence the allobrogians genoa florence lucca and then god be we rome 
our poor monsieur the pope dies now for fear by my faith said picrochole i will not then kiss his pantoufle italy being thus taken behold naples calabria apulia and sicily all ransacked and malta too i wish the pleasant knights of the roads heretofore would but come to resist you that we might see their urine i would said picrochole very willingly go to loretto no no said they that shall be at our return from thence we shall sail eastwards and take candia cyprus rhodes and the cyclady islands and set upon the morea it is ours by st trenian the lord preserve jerusalem for the great sultan is not comparable to you in power i will then said he cause solomon's temple to be built no said they not yet have a little patience stay a while be never too sudden in your enterprises can you tell what octavian augustus said festina lente it is requisite that you first have the lesser asia caria lycia pamphylia cilicia lydia phrygia mysia bithynia carasia satalia samagaria castamena luga sabasta even unto euphrates shall we see said picrochole babylon and mount sinai there is no need said they at this time have we not hurried up and down travelled and toiled enough in having transfretted and passed over the hyrcanian sea marched alongst the two armenias and the three arabias by by my faith said he we have played the fools and are undone ah poor souls what's the matter said they what shall we have said he to drink in these deserts for julian augustus with his whole army died there for thirst as they say we have already said they given order for that in the syriac sea you have nine thousand and fourteen great ships laden with the best wines in the world they arrived at port joppa there they found two and twenty thousand camels and sixteen hundred elephants which you shall have taken at one hunting about sigelmis when you entered into libya and besides this you had all the mecca caravan did they not furnish you sufficiently with wine yes but said he we did not drink it fresh by the virtue said they not of a fish a valiant man a conqueror who pretends and aspires to the monarchy of the world cannot always have his ease god be thanked that you and your men are come safe and sound unto the banks of the river tigris but said he what doth that part of our army in the meantime which overthrows that unworthy swill-pot grangousier they are not idle said they we shall meet with them by and by they shall have won you brittany normandy flanders Eno, brabant artois holland zealand they have passed the rhine over the bellies of the switzers and lansquenets 
and a party of these hath subdued luxembourg lorraine champagne and savoy even to lyon in which place they have met with your forces returning from the naval conquests of the mediterranean sea and have rallied again in bohemia after they had plundered and sacked swavia wittemberg bavaria austria moravia and styria then they set fiercely together upon lubeck norway swedeland re denmark gitland greenland the stirlings even unto the frozen sea this done they conquered the isles of orkney and subdued scotland england and ireland from thence sailing through the sandy sea and by the sarmates they have vanquished and overcome prussia poland lithuania russia wallachia transylvania hungary bulgaria turkey land and are now at constantinople come said picrochole let us go join with them quickly for i will be emperor of trebizond also shall we not kill all these dogs turks and mahometans what a devil should we do else said they and you shall give their goods and lands to such as shall have served you honestly reason said he will have it so that is but just i give unto you the caramania suria and all the palestine ha ah, sir said they it is out of your goodness gramercy we thank you god grant you may always prosper there was there present at that time an old gentleman well experienced in the wars a stern soldier and who had been in many great hazards named echephron who hearing this discourse said i do greatly doubt that all this enterprise will be like the tale or interlude of the pitcher full of milk wherewith a shoemaker made himself rich in conceit but when the pitcher was broken he had not whereupon to dine what do you pretend by these large conquests what shall be the end of so many labours and crosses thus shall it be said picrochole that when we are returned we shall sit down rest and be merry but said echephron if by chance you should never come back for the voyage is long and dangerous were it not better for us to take our rest now than unnecessarily to expose ourselves to so many dangers oh said swashbuckler by god here is a good dotard come let us go hide ourselves in the corner of a chimney and there spend the whole time of our life amongst ladies in threading of pearls or spinning like sardanapalus he that nothing ventures hath neither horse nor mule says solomon he who adventureth too much said echephron loseth both horse and mule answered malchon enough said picrochole go forward i fear nothing but that these devilish legions of grangousier whilst we are in mesopotamia will come on our backs and charge up our rear what course shall we then take what shall be our remedy 
a very good one said dirt tail a pretty little commission which you must send unto the muscovites shall bring you into the field in an instant four hundred and fifty thousand choice men of war oh that you would but make me your lieutenant-general i should for the lightest faults of any inflict great punishments i fret i charge i strike i take i kill i slay i play the devil on on said picrochol make haste my lads and let him that loves me follow me End of chapter thirty three. Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey. Chapter thirty four of Gargantua and Pentagril, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nadine Eckert Boulet. Gargantua and Pentagril, Book One, by François Rabelais, translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart, Chapter Thirty Four. How Gargantua left the city of Paris to succour his country, and how Gymnast encountered with the enemy. In this same very hour, Gargantua, who was gone out of Paris as soon as he had read his father's letters, coming upon his great mare, had already passed the nunnery bridge himself, Ponocrates, Gymnast, and Eudemon who all three, the better to enable them to go along with him, took post horses. The rest of his train came after him by even journeys at a slower pace, bringing with them all his books and philosophical instruments. As soon as he had alighted at Paril, he was informed by a farmer of Gouguet how Picrochol had fortified himself within the rock Clermont, and had sent Captain Trippet with a great army to set upon the wood of Ved and Vaugaudry, and that they had already plundered the whole country, not leaving cock nor hen, even as far as to the wine-press of Bia. The strange and almost incredible news of the enormous abuses thus committed over all the land so affrighted Gargantua that he knew not what to say nor do. But Ponocrates counselled him to go unto the lord of Vauguillon, who at all times had been their friend and confederate, and that by him they should be better advised in their businesses which they did incontinently, and found him very willing and fully resolved to assist them, and therefore was of opinion that they should send some one of his company to scout along and discover the country, to learn in what condition and posture the enemy was, that they might take counsel and proceed according to the present occasion. Gymnast offered himself to go. Whereupon it was concluded that for his safety and the better expedition, he should have with him some one that knew the ways, avenues, turnings, windings, and rivers thereabout. Then away went he and Prinhago, the equerry or gentleman of Vauguillon's horse, who scouted and espied as narrowly as they could upon all quarters without any fear. In the meantime Gargantua took a little refreshment, ate somewhat himself, the like did those who were with him, and caused to give to his mare a picotin of oats, that is, three score and fourteen quarters and three bushels. Gymnast and his comrade rode so long, that at last they met with the enemy's forces, all scattered and out of order, plundering, stealing, rubbing, and pillaging all they could lay their hands on. And, as far off as they could perceive him, they ran thronging upon the back of one another, in all haste towards him, to unload him of his money, and untress his portmantles. Then cried he out unto them, My masters, I am a poor devil, I desire you to spare me, I have yet one crown left. Come, we must drink it, for it is orum patabile, and this horse here shall be sold to pay my welcome. Afterwards take me for one of your own, for never yet was there any man that knew better how to take, lard, roast, and dress, yea, by G, to tear asunder and devour a hen, than I that am here and for my proficiat I drink to all good fellows. With that he unscrewed his borracho, which was a great Dutch leathern bottle, and without putting in his nose, drank very honestly. The merryful rogues looked upon him, 
opening their throats a foot wide, and putting out their tongues like greyhounds, in hopes to drink after him. But Captain Trippet, in the very nick of that their expectation, came running to him to see who it was. To him Gymnast offered his bottle, saying, Hold, Captain, drink boldly and spare not. I have been thy taster. It is wine of La Faye Monjou. What? said Trippet. This fellow gibes and flouts us? What, though? said Trippet. I am, said Gymnast, a poor devil, pauvre diable. Ha! said Trippet. Seeing the world a poor devil, it is reason that thou shouldst be permitted to go with us ever the world, for all poor devils pass everywhere without toll or tax. But it is not the custom of poor devils to be so well mounted. Therefore, sir devil, come down and let me have your horse. And if you do not carry me well, you, master devil, must do it, for I love a life that such a devil as you should carry me away. End of chapter thirty four. Chapter thirty five of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nadine Curtboulet, Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One by François Rabelais, translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart. Chapter thirty five. How Gymnast very subtly and cunningly killed Captain Trippet and others of Picrochal's men. When they heard these words, some amongst them began to be afraid, and blessed themselves with both hands, thinking indeed that he had been a devil disguised, insomuch that one of them, named Good John, captain of the train bands of the country bumpkins, took his psalter out of his codpiece, and cried out aloud, Hagios Oteos! If thou be of God, speak! If thou be of the other spirit, avoid hence and get thee going. Yet he went not away. Which words being heard by all the soldiers that were there, divers of them being a little inwardly terrified, departed from the place. All this did Gymnast very well remark and consider, and therefore making as if he would have alighted from off his horse, as he was poising himself on the mounting side, he most nimbly, with his short sword by his thigh, shifting his foot in the stirrup, performed the stirrup leather feet, whereby, after the inclining of his body downwards, he forthwith launched himself aloft in the air, and placed both his feet together on the saddle, standing upright with his back turned towards the horse's head. Now, said he, my case goes backward. Then suddenly in the same very posture wherein he was, he fetched a gamble upon one foot, and, turning to the left hand, failed not to carry his body perfectly round, just into its former stance, without missing one jot. Ha! said Trippet. I will not do that at this time, and not without cause. Well, said Gymnast, I have failed, I will undo this leap. Then with a marvellous strength and agility, turning towards the right hand, he fetched another frisking gamble as before, which done, he set his right hand thumb upon the hindbo of the saddle, raised himself up, and sprung in the air, poising and upholding his whole body upon the muscle and nerve of the said thumb, and so turned and whirled himself about three times. At the fourth, reversing his body, and overturning it upside down, and foreside back, without touching anything, he brought himself betwixt the horse's two ears, springing with all his body into the air, upon the thumb of his left hand, and, in that posture, turning like a windmill, did most actively do that trick which is called the miller's pass. After this, Clapping his right hand flat upon the middle of the saddle, he gave himself such a jerking swing that he thereby seated himself upon the crupper, after the manner of gentlewomen sitting on horseback. This done, he easily passed his right leg over the saddle, and placed himself like one that rides in croup. But, said he, it were better for me to get into the saddle. Then putting the thumbs of both hands upon the crupper before him, and thereupon leaning himself, as upon the only supporters of his body, he incontinently turned heels over head in the air, and straight found himself betwixt the bow of the saddle in a good settlement. Then with a somersault springing into the air again, he fell to stand with both his feet close together upon the saddle, and there made above a hundred frisks, turns, and demi-pommets, with his arms held out across, 
and in so doing cried out aloud, I rage, I rage, devils, I am stark mad, devils, I am mad, hold me, devils, hold me, hold, devils, hold, hold. Whilst he was thus vaulting, the rogues in great astonishment said to one another, By cock's death, he is a goblin or a devil thus disguised. Abhoste maligno liberanos, domine, and ran away in a full flight, as if they had been routed, looking now and then behind them, like a dog that carried away a goose wing in his mouth. Then Gymnast, spying his advantage, alighted from his horse, drew his sword, and laid on great blows upon the thickest and highest crested among them, and overthrew them in great heaps, hurt, wounded, and bruised, being resisted by nobody, they thinking he had been a starved devil, as well in regard of his wonderful feats in vaulting, which they had seen, as for the talk Trippe had with him, calling him poor devil. Only Trippe would have traitorously cleft his head with his horseman's sword, or lance knight falchion, but he was well armed, and felt nothing of the blow but the weight of the stroke. Whereupon, turning suddenly about, he gave Trippe a home thrust, and upon the back of that, whilst he was about to ward his head from a slash, he ran him in at the breast with a hit which at once cut his stomach, the fifth cut called the colon, and the half of his liver, wherewith he fell to the ground, and in falling gushed forth above four puddles of pottage, and his soul mingled with the pottage. This done, Gymnast withdrew himself, very wisely considering that a case of great adventure and hazard should not be pursued unto its utmost period, and that it becomes all cavaliers modestly to use their good fortune, without troubling or stretching it too far. Wherefore, getting to horse, he gave him the spur, taking the right way unto Vauguillon, and prélingant with him. End of chapter 35「Chapter thirty six of Gargantua and Pentagril, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nadine Eckert Boulet. Gargantua and Pentagril, Book One by Francois Rabelais. Translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart. Chapter thirty six. How Gargantua demolished the castle at the ford of Ved, and how they passed the ford. As soon as he came, he related the estate and condition wherein they had found the enemy, and the stratagem which he alone had used against all their multitude, affirming that they were but rascally rogues, plunderers, thieves, and robbers, ignorant of all military discipline, and that they might boldly set forward unto the field, it being an easy matter to fell and strike them down like beasts. Then Gargantua mounted his great mare, accompanied as we have said before, and finding in his way a high and great tree, which commonly was called by the name of St. Martin's tree, because heretofore St. Martin planted a pilgrim staff there, which in tract of time grew to that height and greatness, said, This is that which I lacked. This tree shall serve me both for a staff and lens. With that he pulled it up easily, plucked off the bows, and trimmed it at his pleasure. In the meantime his mare pissed to ease her belly, but it was in such abundance that it did overflow the country seven leagues, and all the piss of that urinal flood ran glib away towards the ford of Ved, wherewith the water was so swollen that all the forces the enemy had there were with great horror drowned, except some who had taken the way on the left hand towards the hills. Gargantua, being come to the place of the wood of Ved, was informed by Eudemon that there was some remainder of the enemy within the castle, which to know, Gargantua cried out as loud as he was able, Are you there, or are you not there? If you be there, be there no more, and if you are not there, I have no more to say. But a ruffian gunner, whose charge was to attend the portcullis over the gate, let fly a cannonball at him, and hit him with that shot most furiously on the right temple of his head, yet did him no more hurt than if he had but cast a prune or kernel of a wine-grape at him. What is this? said Gargantua. Do you throw at us grape kernels here? The vintage shall cost you dear, thinking indeed that the bullet had been the kernel of a grape or raisin kernel. Those who were within the castle, being till then busy at the pillage, when they heard this noise ran to the towers and fortresses, from whence they shot at him above nine thousand and five and twenty falcon shot and arquebusades, aiming all at his head, and so thick did they shoot at him that he cried out, 
Ponocrat is my friend. These flies here are like to put out mine eyes. Give me a branch of those willow trees to drive them away. Thinking that the bullets and stones shot out of the great ordnance had been but done flies. Ponocrates looked and saw that there were no other flies, but great shot which they had shot from the castle. Then was it that he rushed with his great tree against the castle, and with mighty blows overthrew both towers and fortresses, and laid all level with the ground, by which means all that were within were slain and broken in pieces. Going from thence, they came to the bridge at the mill, where they found all the fort covered with dead bodies, so thick that they had choked up the mill and stopped the current of its water, and these were those that were destroyed in the urinal village of the mare. There they were at a stand, consulting how they might pass without hindrance by these dead carcasses. But Gymnas said, If the devils have passed there, I will pass well enough. The devils have passed there, said Eudemon, to carry away the damned souls. By saint Regnon, said Ponocrates, then by necessary consequence he shall pass there. Yes, yes, said Gymnast, or I shall stick in the way. Then setting spurs to his horse, he passed through freely, his horse not fearing nor being anything affrighted at the sight of the dead bodies, for he had accustomed him, according to the doctrine of Alien, not to fear armor nor the carcasses of dead men, and that not by killing men as Diomedes did the Thracians, or as Ulysses did in throwing the corpses of his enemies at his horse's feet, as Homer saith, but by putting a jack o lantern amongst his hay, and making him go over it ordinarily when he gave him his oats. The other three followed him very close, except Eudemon only, whose horse foreright or far forefoot sank up to the knee in the pouch of a great fat chuff, who lay there upon his back drowned, and could not get it out. There was he pestered, until Gargantua, with the end of his staff, thrust down the rest of the villain's stripes into the water, whilst the horse pulled out his foot. And, which is a wonderful thing in Hippiotry, the said horse was thoroughly cured of a ring-bone which he had in that foot by this touch of the burst guts of that great luby. End of chapter 36「Chapter thirty seven of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One, by Francois Rabelais, translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart. Chapter thirty seven. How Gargantua, in combing his head, made the great cannon balls fall out of his hair. Being come out of the river of Vide, they came very shortly after to Grangousier's castle, who waited for them with great longing. At their coming they were entertained with many congees, and cherished with embraces. Never was seen a more joyful company, for supplementum supplementi chronicorum, saith that Gargamel died there with joy. For my part, truly I cannot tell, neither do I care very much for her, nor for anybody else. The truth was that Gargantua, in shifting his clothes, and combing his head with a comb, which was nine hundred foot long of the Jewish cane measure, and whereof the teeth were great tusks of elephants, whole and entire, he made fall at every rake above seven balls of bullets, at a dozen the ball that stuck in his hair at the raising of the castle of the wood of Vide, which his father Grangousier, seeing, thought they had been lice, and said unto him, what, my dear son, hast thou brought us this far some short-winged hawks of the college of Montague? I did not mean that thou shouldst reside there. Then answered Panocrates, My sovereign lord, think not that I have placed him in that lousy college, which they call Montague. I had rather have put him amongst the grave-diggers of St. Innocent. So enormous is the cruelty and villainy that I have known there, for the galley-slaves are far better used amongst the moors and tartars, the murderers and the criminal dungeons, yea, the very dogs in your house, than are the poor wretched students in the aforesaid college. And if I were king of Paris, the devil take me if I would not set it on fire, and burn both principal and regents for suffering this inhumanity to be exercised before their eyes. Then, taking up one of these bullets, he said, These are cannon-shot, which your son Gargantua hath lately received by the treachery of your enemies, as he was passing before the wood of Vide. But they have been so rewarded that they are all destroyed in the ruin of the castle, 
as were the Philistines, by the policy of Samson, and those whom the tower of Silohim slew, as it is written in the thirteenth of Luke. My opinion is that we pursue them whilst the luck is on our side, for occasion hath all her hair on her forehead. When she is past, you may not recall her. She hath no tuft whereby you can lay hold on her, for she is bald in the hind part of her head, and never returneth again. Truly, said Grangousier, it shall not be at this time, for I will make you a feast this night, and bid you welcome. This said, they made ready supper, and, of extraordinary besides his daily fare, were roasted sixteen oxen, three heifers, two and thirty calves, three score and three fat kids, four score and fifteen weathers, three hundred farrow pigs or sheets, soused in sweet wine or must, eleven score partridges, seven hundred snipes and woodcocks, four hundred luden and cornwall capons, six thousand pullets and as many pigeons, six hundred crammed hens, fourteen hundred leverets or young hares and rabbits, three hundred and three buzzards, and one thousand and seven hundred cockerels for venison they could not so suddenly come by it only eleven wild boars which the abbot of turpinay sent and eighteen fallow deer which the lord of gramont bestowed together with seven score pheasants which were sent by the lord of essars and some dozens of queests couchouts ring doves and wood culvers river fowl teals and auteals bitterns quartz plovers francolins brigandeurs tirassons young lapwings tame ducks shovelers woodlanders herons moorhens creels storks canop tears oranges flamands which are phenicopters or crimson winged sea fowls terrigals turkeys arbens coots solan geese curlews termagans and water wagtails with a great deal of cream, curds, and fresh cheese, and store of soup, pottages, and brewis with great variety. Without doubt there was meat enough, and it was handsomely dressed by snap sauce, hotchpot, and braver juice, Grangousier's cooks. Jenkin treasure piece and clean glass were very careful to fill them drink. End of chapter thirty seven. Chapter thirty eight of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daniel Watkins. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One, by Francois Rabelais. Translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart. Chapter 38. How Gargantua did eat up six pilgrims in a salad. The story requireth that we relate that which happened unto six pilgrims who came from Sebastian near to Nantes, and who for shelter that night, being afraid of the enemy, had hid themselves in the garden upon the chichling peas, among the cabbages and lettuces. Gargantua, finding himself somewhat dry, asked whether they could get any lettuce to make him a salad, and hearing that there were the greatest and fairest in the country, for they were as great as plum-trees or as walnut-trees, he would go thither himself and brought thence in his hand what he thought good, and withal carried away the six pilgrims, who were in so great fear that they did not dare to speak, nor cough. Washing them, therefore, first at the fountain, the pilgrims said one to another softly, What shall we do? We are almost drowned here amongst these lettuce. Shall we speak? But if we speak, he will kill us for spies. And as they were thus deliberating what to do, Gargantua put them with the lettuce into a platter of the house, as large as the huge ton of the white friars of the Cistercian order, which done, with oil, vinegar, and salt, he ate them up, to refresh himself a little before supper, and had already swallowed up five of the pilgrims, the sixth being in the platter, totally hid under a lettuce, except his bourdon or staff that appeared, and nothing else. Which, Grangousier seeing, said to Gargantua, I think that is the horn of a shell-snail, do not eat it. Why not? said Gargantua. They are good all this month, which he no sooner said, but, drawing up the staff, and therewith taking up the pilgrim, he ate him very well, then drank a terrible draught of excellent white wine. The pilgrims, thus devoured, made shift to save themselves as well as they could, by withdrawing their bodies out of the reach of the grinders of his teeth, but could not escape from thinking they had been put in the lowest dungeon of a prison. And when Gargantua whiffed the great draught, they thought to have been drowned in his mouth, and the flood of wine had almost carried them away into the gulf of his stomach. Nevertheless, skipping with their burdens, as St. Michael's palmers used to do, they sheltered themselves from the danger of that inundation under the banks of his teeth. But one of them by chance, groping or sounding the country with his staff, to try whether they were in safety or no, struck hard against the cleft of a hollow tooth, and hit the mandibulary sinew, or nerve of the jaw, which put Gargantua to very great pain, so that he began to cry for the rage that he felt. To ease himself, therefore, of his smarting ache, he called for his tooth-picker, and rubbing towards a young walnut-tree, where they lay skulking, 
are nestled you, my gentlemen pilgrims. For he caught one by the legs, another by the scrip, another by the pocket, another by the scarf, another by the band of the breeches, and the poor fellow that had hurt him with the burden, him he hooked to him by the codpiece, which snatch nevertheless did him a great deal of good, for it pierced unto him a pocky botch he had in the groin, which grievously tormented him ever since they were past in Senis. The pilgrims, thus dislodged, ran away athwart the plain a pretty fast pace, and the pain ceased, even just at the time when by Eudemon he was called to supper, for all was ready. "'I will go then,' said he, "'and piss away my misfortune,' which he did do in such a copious measure that the urine taking away the feet from the pilgrims, they were carried along with the stream unto the bank of a tuft of trees. Upon which, as soon as they had taken footing, and that for their self-preservation they had run a little out of the road, they on a sudden fell all six, except for Nile, into a trap that had been made to take wolves by a train, out of which, nevertheless, they escaped by the industry of said Fonile, who broke all the snares and ropes. Being gone from thence, they lay all the rest of that night in a lodge near unto Cotre, where they were comforted in their miseries by the gracious words of one of their company, called Swear to Go, who showed them that this adventure had been foretold by the prophet David. Psalm Quum exergerent homines in nos, for de vivos deglutissent nos. When we were eaten in the salad with salt, oil, and vinegar. Quum irasareta furor eorum in nos, forsitan aqua azorbuissent nos. When he drank the great draught. Tarentum patransivit anima nostra. When the stream of his water carried us to the thicket. Forsitan patransisest anima nostra aquam intolerabilem. That is, the water of his urine, the flood whereof, cutting our way, took our feet from us. Benedictus Dominus, qui non dedit nos in captionem dentibus eorum. Anima nostra sicut passa, erupta est de laceo venantium, when we fell in the trap. Laceus contritus est, by fornie, et nos liberati sumus, agitorium nostrum, etc. End of chapter 38《ラプタス39 of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book 1. By Francois Rabelais, translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart, Chapter Thirty Nine. How the monk was feasted by Gargantua, and of the jovial discourse they had at supper. When Gargantua was set down at table, after all of them had somewhat stayed their stomachs by a snatch or two of the first bits eaten heartily, Grand Gousier began to relate the source and cause of the war raised between him and Picrochole, and came to tell how Friar John of the Funnels had triumphed at the defence of the close of the abbey, and extolled him for his valour above Camillus, Scipio, Pompey, Caesar, and Themistocles. Then Gargantua desired that he might be presently sent for, to the end that with him they might consult of what was to be done. Whereupon, by a joint consent, his steward went for him, and brought him along merrily, with his staff of the cross, upon Grangousier's mule. When he was come, a thousand huggings, a thousand embracements, a thousand good days were given. Ha! Friar John, my friend Friar John, my brave cousin Friar John from the devil, let me clip thee, my heart, about the neck, to me an armful. I must grip thee, my bollock, till my back crack with it. Come, my cod, let me call thee till I kill thee. 
and friar john the gladdest man in the world never was man made welcomer never was any more courteously and graciously received than friar john come come said gargantua a stool here close by me at this end i am content said the monk seeing you will have it so some water page fill my boy fill it is to refresh my liver give me some child to gargle my throat withal deposita capa said gymnast let us pull off this frock oh by god gentlemen said the monk there is a chapter in statutis ordinis which opposeth my laying of it down pish said gymnast a fig for your chapter this frock breaks both your shoulders put it off my friend said the monk let me alone with it for by god i'll drink the better that it is on it makes all my body jocund if i should lay it aside the waggish pages would cut to themselves garters out of it as i was once served at coulain and which is worse i shall lose my appetite but if in this habit i sit down at table i will drink by god both to thee and to thy horse and so courage frolic god save the company i have already supped yet i will eat never a whit the less for that for i have a paved stomach as hollow as a butt of malvoisie or st benedictus's boot but and always open like a lawyer's pouch <coughs> of all fishes but the tench take the wing of a partridge or the thigh of a nun doth not he die like a good fellow that dies with a stiff catso <laughs> <laughs> our prior loves exceedingly the white of a capon in that said gymnast he doth not resemble the foxes for of the capons hens and pullets which they carry away they never eat the white why said the monk because said gymnast they have no cooks to dress them and if they be not competently made ready they remain red and not white the redness of meats being a token that they have not got enough of the fire whether by boiling roasting or otherwise except the shrimps lobsters crabs and crayfishes which are cardinalized with boiling by god's feast gazers said the monk the porter of our abbey then hath not his head well boiled for his eyes are as red as a mazer made of an alder tree the, <laughs> the thigh of this leveret is good for those that have the gout <laughs> to the purpose of the truel what is the reason that the thighs of a gentlewoman are always fresh and cool this problem said gargantua is neither in aristotle in alexander aphrodisius nor in plutarch there are three causes said the monk by which that place is naturally refreshed primo because the water runs all along by it secundo because it is a shady place obscure and dark upon which the sun never shines and thirdly because it is continually flabbled blown upon and aired by the north winds of the old arstic the fan of the smock and flip-flap of the codpiece 
and lusty malads some bows in liquor page so crack 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 oh how good is god that gives us of this excellent juice i call him to witness if i had been in the time of jesus christ i would have kept him from being taken by the jews in the garden of olivet and the devil fail me if i should have failed to cut off the hands of these gentlemen apostles who ran away so basely after they had well supped and left their good master in the lurch i ate that man worse than poison that offers to run away when he should fight and lay stoutly about him oh that i were but king of france for fourscore or a hundred years by god i should whip like curtailed dogs these runaways of pavia plague take them why did they not choose rather to die there than to leave their good prince in that pinch and necessity is it not better and more honourable to perish in fighting valiantly than to live in disgrace by a cowardly running away <sighs> we are like to eat no great store of goslings this year therefore friend reach me some of that roasted pig there diavolo is there no more must no more sweet wine germinar it radix jesse je renie ma vie je meurs de soif i renounce my life i rage for thirst this wine is none of the worst what wine drink you at paris i give myself to the devil if i did not once keep open house at paris for all comers six months together do you know friar claude of the high kilderkins oh the good fellow that he is but i do not know what fly hath stung him of late he has become so hard a student for my part i study not at all in our abbey we never study for fear of the mumps which disease in horses is called the mourning in the chine our late abbot was wont to say that it is a monstrous thing to see a learned monk by god master my friend magis magnos clericos non sunt magis magnos sapientes <sighs> you never saw so many hairs as there are this year i could not anywhere come by a gossok nor tassel of falcon my lord belloniere promised me a lanner but he wrote to me not long ago that he was become percy oh, the partridges will so multiply henceforth that they will go near to eat up our ears i take no delight in the stalking horse for i catch such cold that i am like to founder myself at that sport if i do not run toil travel and trot about i am not well at ease true it is that in leaping over the hedges and bushes my frock leaves always some of its wool behind it i have recovered a dainty greyhound i give him to the devil if he suffer a hare to escape him a groom was leading him to my lord untlittle and i robbed him of him <laughs> did i ill no friar john said gymnast no by all the devils that are no so said the monk do i attest these same devils so long as they last or rather virtue of god what could that gouty limpard have done with so fine a dog by the body of god he is better pleased when one presents him with a good yoke of oxen 
how now said ponocrates you swear father john it is only said the monk but to grace and adorn my speech they are colours of a ciceronian rhetoric <laughs> end of chapter thirty nine recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey Chapter Forty of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One, by Francois Rabelais, translated by Sir Thomas Orquart. Chapter Forty. Why monks are the outcasts of the world and wherefore some have bigger noses than others. "'By the faith of a Christian,' said Eudemon, "'I do wonderfully dote and enter in a great ecstasy when I consider the honesty and good fellowship of this monk, for he makes us here all merry. How is it, then, that they exclude the monks from all good companies, calling them feast-troublers, marrers of mirth, and disturbers of all civil conversation, as the bees drive away the drones from their hives?' Ignavum fucos pecos, said Maro, a precepibus arsent. Hereunto, answered Gargantua, there is nothing so true as that the frock and cowl draw unto itself the opprobries, injuries, and maledictions of the world, just as the wind called Cessius attracts the clouds. The peremptory reason is because they eat the order and excrements of the world, that is to say, the sins of the people, and like dung chewers and excrementitious eaters, they are cast into the privies and successive places, that is, the convents and abbeys, separated from political conversation, as the jakes and retreats of the house are. But if you conceive how an ape in a family is always mocked and provokingly incensed, you shall easily apprehend how monks are shunned of all men, both young and old. The ape keeps not the house as a dog doth, he draws not in the plough as the ox, he yields neither milk nor wool as the sheep, he carrieth no burden as a horse doth. That which he doth is only to conscite, spoil, and defile all, which is the cause wherefore he hath of all men mocks, frumperies, and bastinados. After the same manner, a monk, I mean those lither idle lazy monks, doth not labour and work, as do the peasant and artificer, doth not ward and defend the country, as doth the man of war cureth not the sick and diseased as the physician doth, doth neither preach nor teach, as do the evangelical doctors and schoolmasters, doth not import commodities and things necessary for the commonwealth, as the merchant doth. Therefore is it that by and of all men they are hooted at, hated, and abhorred. Yea, but said Grangousier, they pray to God for us. Nothing less, answered Gargantua, True it is, that with a tingle-tangle jangling of bells, they trouble and disquiet all their neighbours about them. Right, said the monk, a mass, a matin, a vesper well rung are half said. They mumble out great store of legends and psalms, by them not at all understood. They say many paternosters interlarded with Ave Marias, without thinking upon or apprehending the meaning of what it is they say, which truly I call mocking of God and not prayers. But so help them God as they pray for us, and not for being afraid to lose their victuals, their manchots, and good fat pottage. All true Christians, of all estates and conditions, in all places and at all times, send up their prayers to God, and the Mediator prayeth and intercedeth for them, and God is gracious to them. Now such a one is our good Friar John. Therefore every man desireth to have him in his company. He is no bigot or hypocrite. He is not torn and divided betwixt reality and appearance, no wretch of a rugged and peevish disposition, but honest, jovial, resolute, and a good fellow. He travels, he labours, he defends the oppressed, comforts the afflicted, helps the needy, and keeps the close of the abbey. Nay, said the monk, I do a great deal more than that, for whilst we are in dispatching our matins and anniversaries in the choir, I make withal some crossbow strings, polished glass bottles and bolts, I twist lines and weave purse-nets wherein to catch conies. I am never idle. But now, 
Hither come, some drink, some drink here. Bring the fruit. These chestnuts are of the wood of Estrox, and with good new wine are able to make you a fine cracker and composer of bum sonnets. You are not, as yet it seems, well moistened in this house with the sweet wine, and must. By G, I drink to all men freely, and to all fords, like a proctor or promoter's horse. Friar John, said gymnast, take away the snot that hangs at your nose. Ha, ha, said the monk, am not I in danger of drowning, seeing I am in water even to the nose? No, no, quar. Quia, though some water come out from thence, there never goes in any, for it is well antidoted with pot-proof armor and syrup of the vine-leaf. O oh, my friend, he that hath winter boots made of such leather may boldly fish for oysters, for they will never take water. What is the cause, says Gargantua, that Friar John hath such a fair nose? Because, said Grangousier, that God would have it so, who frameth us in such form and for such end as is most agreeable with his divine will, even as a potter fashioneth his vessels. Because, said Ponocrates, he came with the first to the fair of noses, and therefore made choice of the fairest and the greatest. Pish, said the monk, that is not the reason of it, but according to the true monastical philosophy, it is because my nurse had soft teats, by virtue whereof, whilst she gave me suck, my nose did sink in as in so much butter. The hard breasts of nurses make children short-nosed. But hey, gay, ad formum nasi cognisitor ad te lavavi. I never eat any confections, page, whilst I am at the bibbery. Item, bring me rather some toasts. End of chapter 40「forty one of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One, by Francois Rabelais. Translated by Sir Thomas Orquart. Chapter forty one. How the monk made Gargantua sleep, and of his hours and breviaries. Supper being ended, they consulted of the business in hand, and concluded that about midnight they should fall unawares upon the enemy, to know what manner of watch and ward they kept, and that in the meanwhile they should take a little rest, the better to refresh themselves. But Gargantua could not sleep by any means, on which side soever he turned himself. Whereupon the monk said to him, I never sleep soundly when I am at sermon or prayers. Let us therefore begin, you and I, the seven penitential psalms, to try whether you shall not quickly fall asleep. The conceit pleased Gargantua very well, and beginning the first of these psalms, as soon as they came to the words, Beati quorum, they fell asleep, both the one and the other. But the monk, for his being formerly accustomed to the hour of claustral matins, failed not to awake a little before midnight, and being up himself awaked all the rest, in singing aloud and with a clear voice the song, Awake, O Rhinian, ho, awake! Awake, O Rhinian ho! Get up, you no more sleep must take, get up, for we must go. When they were all roused and up, he said, My masters, it is a usual saying that we begin matins with coughing and supper with drinking. Let us now, in doing clean contrarily, begin our matins with drinking, and at night before supper we shall cough as hard as we can. What, said Gargantua, to drink so soon after sleep? This is not to live according to the diet and prescript rule of the physicians, for you ought first to scour and cleanse your stomach of all its superfluities and excrements. Oh, well physicked, said the monk, a hundred devils leap into my body, if there be not more old drunkards than old physicians. I have made this paction and covenant with my appetite, that it always lieth down and goes to bed with myself, for to that I every day give very good order. Then, the next morning it also riseth with me, and gets up when I am awake." Mind you your charges, gentlemen, or tend your cures as much as you will. I will get me to my drawer, in terms of falconry, my tiring. What drawer or tiring do you mean? said Gargantua. My breviary, said the monk, for just as the falconers, before they feed their hawks, do make them draw at a hen's leg to purge their brains of phlegm and sharpen them to a good appetite, so, by taking this merry little breviary in the morning, I scour all my lungs and am presently ready to drink. After what manner, said Gargantua, 
do you say these fair hours and prayers of yours? After the manner of Whipfield, Fessicamp, and corruptly, Fecan, said the monk, by three psalms and three lessons, or nothing at all, he that will. I never tie myself to hours, prayers, and sacraments, for they are made for the man and not the man for them. Therefore is it that I make my prayers in fashion of stirrup leathers. I shorten or lengthen them when I think good. Brevis oratio penetrat celos et longa potatio evacuat siphos. Where is that written? By my faith, said Ponocrates, I cannot tell, my pillycock, but thou art more worth than gold. Therein, said the monk, I am like you, but venite apotemus. Then made they ready the store of carbonados, or rashers on the coals, and good fat soups, or brevis with sippets, and the monk drank what he pleased. Some kept him company, and the rest did forbear, for their stomachs were not as yet opened. Afterwards every man began to arm and befit himself for the field, and they armed the monk against his will, for he desired no other armor for back and breast but his frock, nor any other weapon in his hand but the staff of the cross. Yet at their pleasure was he completely armed cap a pie, and mounted upon one of the best horses in the kingdom, with a good slashing shable by his side, together with Gargantua, Ponocrates, Gymnast, Eudemon, and five-and-twenty more of the most resolute and adventurous of Grangousier's house, all armed at proof with their lances in their hands, mounted like St. George, and every one of them having an arquebusier behind him. End of chapter 41《Chapter Forty Two of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One, by Francois Rabelais. Translated by Sir Thomas Orquart. Chapter Forty Two. How the monk encouraged his fellow champions, and how he hanged upon a tree. Thus went out those valiant champions on their adventure, in full resolution to know what enterprise they should undertake, and what to take heed of and look well to in the day of the great and horrible battle. And the monk encouraged them, saying, My children, do not fear nor doubt, I will conduct you safely. God and Sanct Benedict would be with us. If I had strength answerable to my courage, by his death, I would plume them for you like ducks. I fear nothing but the great ordinance, yet I know of a charm by way of prayer, which the subsexton of our abbey taught me, that will preserve a man from the violence of guns and all manner of fire-weapons and engines, but it will do me no good, because I do not believe it. Nevertheless, I hope my staff of the cross shall this day play devilish pranks amongst them. By G. Whoever of our party shall offer to play the duck and shrink when blows are a-dealing, I give myself to the devil, if I do not make a monk of him in my stead, and hamper him within my frock, which is a sovereign cure against cowardice. Did you never hear of my lord Morals his greyhound, which was not worth a straw in the fields? He put a frock about his neck, by the body of G. There was neither hare nor fox that could escape him, and which is more, he lined all the bitches in the country, though before that he was feeble-reigned and ex frigidis et maleficiatis. The monk, uttering these words in collar as he passed under a walnut-tree, in his way towards the Kazi, had broached the visor of his helmet on the stump of a great branch of said tree. Nevertheless he set his spurs so fiercely to the horse, who was full of metal and quick on the spur, that he bounded forwards, and the monk, going about to ungrapple his visor, let go his hold of the bridle, and so hanged by his hand upon the bow, whilst his horse stole away from under him. By this means was the monk left hanging on the walnut-tree, and crying for help, murder, murder, swearing also that he was betrayed. Eudemon perceived him first, and calling Gargantua said, Sir, come and see Absalom hanging. Gargantua, being come, considered the countenance of the monk, and in what posture he hanged. Wherefore he said to Eudemon, You were mistaken in comparing him to Absalom, for Absalom hung by his hair, but this shaveling monk hangeth by his ears. Help me, said the monk, in the devil's name. Is this a time for you to prate? You seem to me to be like the decretalist preachers, who say that whosoever shall see his neighbor in the danger of death, 
ought upon pain of trisulk excommunication rather choose to admonish him to make his confession to a priest and put his conscience in the state of peace than otherwise to help and relieve him and therefore when i shall see them fallen into a river and ready to be drowned i shall make them a fair long sermon de contemptu mundi et fuga seculi and when they are stark dead shall then go to their aid and succour in fishing after them be quiet said gymnast and stir not my minion i am now coming to unhang thee and to set thee at freedom for thou art a pretty little gentle monicus monicus in claustro non valet ova duo set quando est extra bene valet triginta i have seen above five hundred hanged but i never saw any have a better countenance in his dangling and pendulatory swagging truly if i had so good a one i would willingly hang thus all my lifetime what said the monk have you almost done preaching help me in the name of god seeing you will not in the name of the other spirit or by the habit which i wear you shall repent it tempore et loco prelibatis then gymnast alighted from his horse and climbing up the walnut tree lifted up the monk with one hand by the gussets of his armour under the armpits and with the other undid his visor from the stump of the broken branch which done he let him fall to the ground and himself after as soon as the monk was down he put off all his armour and threw away one piece after another about the field and taking to him again his staff of the cross remounted up to his horse which eudemon had caught in his running away then went they on merrily riding along on the highway End of chapter 42chapter one part eighteen of gargantua and pantagruel book one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by chris caron gargantua and pantagruel book one by francois rebalias translated by sir thomas urquhart chapter one part eighteen how the scouts and four party of parochole were met with by gargantua and how the monk slew captain drawforth tyrevant and then was taken prisoner by his enemies parochole at the reaction of whose who had escaped out of the broil and defeat wherein tripet was untripped grew very angry that the devils should have so run upon his men and held all that night a council of war at which Rascalf and Touchfaucet, as to view Tocadian, concluded his power to be such that he was able to defeat all the devils of hell if they should come to jostle with his forces. This Pericole did not fully believe, though he doubted not much of it. Therefore sent he under the command and conduct of the Count Drawforth for discovering of the country, the number of sixteen hundred horsemen, all well mounted upon light horses for skirmish and thoroughly besprinkled with holy water, and every one for their field mark or cognizance, had the sign of a star in his scarf, to serve at all adventures in case they should happen to encounter with devils, that by the virtue as well of that Gregorian water as of the stars which they wore, they might make them disappear and vanish in this equipage they made an excursion upon the country till they came near to the vagoyan which is the valley of gion and to the spital but could never find anybody to speak unto whereupon they returned a little back and took occasion to pass above the aforesaid hospital to try what intelligence they could come by in those parts in which resolution riding on and by chance in a pastoral lodge or shepherd's cottage near to cadre hitting upon the five pilgrims they carried them way bound and menaced as if they had been spies for all the exclamations adjurations and requests that they could make being come down from thence towards Savelle, they were heard by garagantua who said then unto those that were with him conrades and fellow-soldiers we have here met with an encounter and they are ten times in number more than we shall we charge them or no what a devil said the monk shall we do else do you esteem men by their number rather than by their valor and prowess 
with this he cried out charge devils charge which when the enemies heard they thought certainly that they had been very devils and therefore even then began all of them to run away as hard as they could drive drawforth only excepted who immediately settled his lance on its rest and therewith hit the monk with all his force and on the very middle of his breast but coming against his horrific frock the point of iron being with the blow either broke off or blunted it was in matter of execution as if you had struck against an anvil with a little wax candle then did the monk with his staff of the cross give him such a sturdy thump and were it bewixed his neck and shoulders upon the acrimoin bone that he made him lose both sense and motion and fall down stone dead at his horse's feet and seeing the sign of the star which he wore scarfwise he said unto gargantua these men are but priests which is but the beginning of a monk by st john i am a perfect monk i will kill them to you like flies then ran he after him at a swift and full gallop till he overtook the rare and felled them down like tree leaves striking athwart and longest and every day gymnast presently asked gargantua if they should pursue him to whom gargantua answered by no means for according to right military discipline you must never drive your enemy on to despair for that such a strait doth multiply his force and increase his courage which was before broken and cast down neither is there any better help or outrage of relief for men that are amazed out of heart toiled and spent than to hope for no favor at all how many victories have been taken out of the hands of the victors by the vanquished when they would not rest satisfied with reason but attempt to put all to the sword and totally to destroy their enemies without leaving so much as one to carry home news of the defeat of his fellows open therefore unto your enemies all the gates and ways and make to them a bridge of silver rather than fail that you may be rid of them yeah but said gymnast they have the monk have they the monk said gargantua upon mine honour then it will prove to their cost but to prevent all dangers let us not yet retreat but halt here quietly as in an ambush for i think i do already understand the policy and judgment of our enemies they are truly more directed by chance and mere fortune than by good advice and counsel in the meanwhile whilst these made a stop under the walnut trees the monk pursued on the chase charging all he overtook and giving quarter to none until he met with a trooper who carried behind him one of the poor pilgrims and there would have rifled him the pilgrim in hope of relief at the sight of the monk cried out ha my lord prior my good friend my lord prior save me i beseech you save me which words being heard by those that rode in van they instantly faced about and seeing there was nobody but the monk that made this great havoc and slaughter among them they loaded him with blows as thick as they used to do an ass with wood but all this he felt nothing especially when they struck upon his frock his skin was so hard then they committed him to two of the marshal's men to keep and looking about saw nobody coming against him whereupon they thought at gargantua and his party were fled then was it that they rode as hard as they could towards the walnut trees to meet with them and left the monk there all alone with his two foresaid men to guard him gargantua heard the noise and neighing of the horses and said to his men comrades i hear the track and beating of the enemy's horse feet and with will perceive that some of them come in a troop and full body against us let us rally and close here then set forward in order and by this means we shall be able to receive their charge to their loss and our honor end of chapter one part eighteen Recording by Chris Caron, Ham Lake, Minnesota. Podcast ChrisBob99 at Hotmail.com Chapter 44 of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Penfold Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One, 
by Francois Rabelais, translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart. Chapter 44 How the monk rid himself of his keepers, and how Picrochole's forlorn hope was defeated. The monk, seeing them break off thus without order, conjectured that they were to set upon Gargantua and those that were with him, and was wonderfully grieved that he could not succor them. Then considered he the countenance of the two keepers in whose custody he was, who would have willingly run after the troops to get some booty and plunder, and were always looking towards the valley unto which they were going. Farther he syllogized, saying, these men are but badly skilled in matters of war for they have not required my parole neither have they taken my sword from me suddenly hereafter he drew his brackmard or horseman's sword wherewith he gave the keeper which held him on the right side such a sound slash that he cut clean through the jugulary veins and the sphagitid or transparent arteries of the neck with the forepart of the throat called the gargarian even unto the two adines which are throat kernels and redoubling the blow, he opened the spinal marrow betwixt the second and third vertebrae. There fell down that keeper stark dead to the ground. Then the monk, reining his horse to the left, ran upon the other who, seeing his fellow dead, and the monk to have the advantage of him, cried with a loud voice, Ha! my lord prior, quarter! I yield, my lord prior, quarter! Quarter, my good friend, my lord prior! And the monk cried likewise, my lord posterior my friend my lord posterior you shall have it upon your posteriorums ha said the keeper my lord prior my minion my gentle lord prior i pray god make you an abbot by the habit said the monk which i wear i will here make you a cardinal what do you use to pay ransoms to religious men you shall therefore have by and by a red hat of my giving and the fellow cried ha my lord prior my lord prior my lord abbot that shall be my lord cardinal my lord all ha ha he's no my lord prior my good little lord the prior i yield render and deliver myself up to you and i deliver thee said the monk to all the devils in hell then at one stroke he cut off his head cutting his scalp upon the temple bones and lifting up in the upper part of the skull the two triangulary bones called sincipital or the two bones pragmatis together with the sagittal commissure or dart-like seam which distinguisheth the right side of the head from the left as also a great part of the coronal or forehead bone by which terrible blow likewise he cut the two meninges or films which enwrap the brain and made a deep wound in the brain's two posterior ventricles and the cranium or skull abode hanging upon his shoulders by the skin of the pericranium behind in form of a doctor's bonnet black without and red within thus fell he down also to the ground stark dead and presently the monk gave his horse the spur and kept the way that the enemy held who had met with gargantua and his companions in the broad highway and were so diminished of their number for the enormous slaughter that gargantua had made with his great tree amongst them as also gymnast ponocrates eudemon and the rest that they began to retreat disorderly and in great haste as men altogether affrighted and troubled in both sense and understanding and as if they had seen the very proper species and form of death before their eyes or rather as when you see an ass with a brise or gadby under his tail or fly that stings him run hither and thither without keeping any path or way throwing down his load to the ground breaking his bridle and reins and taking no breath nor rest and no man can tell what ails him for they see not anything touch him so fled these people destitute of wit without knowing any cause of flying only pursued by a panic terror which in their minds they had conceived the monk, perceiving that their whole intent was to betake themselves to their heels, alighted from his horse and got upon a big large rock which was in the way, and with his great brackmard sword laid such load upon those runaways, and with main strength fetching a compass with his arm without feigning or sparing, slew and overthrew so many that his sword broke in two pieces. Then thought he within himself that he had slain and killed sufficiently, and that the rest should escape to carry news. 
therefore he took up a battle-axe of those that lay there dead and got upon the rock again passing his time to see the enemy thus flying and to tumble himself amongst the dead bodies only that he suffered none to carry pike sword lance nor gun with him and those who carried the pilgrims bound he made to alight and gave their horses unto the said pilgrims keeping them there with him under the hedge and also touch fosse who was then his prisoner the end of chapter forty four recording by mark penfold chapter forty five of gargantua and pentagoral book one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by michael evans Gargantua and Pentagoral, Book One, by Francois Rabelais, translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart, Chapter Forty Five. How the monk carried along with him the pilgrims, and of the good words that Grangousier gave them. This skirmish being ended, Gargantua retreated with his men, excepting the monk, and about the dawning of the day came unto Grangousier, who in his bed was praying unto God for their safety and victory and seeing them all safe and sound he embraced them lovingly and asked what was to become of the monk gargantua answered him that without doubt the enemies had the monk then have they mischief and ill luck said grangousier which was very true therefore it is a common proverb to this day to give a man the monk or as in french lui baille le moin when they would express the doing unto one a mischief then commanded he a good breakfast to be provided for their refreshment. When all was ready, they called Gargantua, but he was so aggrieved that the monk was not to be heard of, that he would neither eat nor drink. In the meanwhile the monk comes, and from the gate of the outer court cries out aloud, Fresh wine, fresh wine, gymnast, my friend. Gymnast went out and saw that it was Friar John, who brought along with him five pilgrims and two chevaussee prisoners whereupon Gargantua likewise went forth to meet him, and all of them made him the best welcome that they possibly could, and brought him before Grangousier, who asked him of all his adventures. The monk told him all, both how he was taken, how he rid himself of his keepers, of the slaughter he had made by the way, and how he had rescued the pilgrims and brought along with him Captain Touchefosse. Then did they altogether fall to banqueting most merrily. In the meantime, Grangousier asked the pilgrims what countrymen they were, whence they came, and whither they went. Swear to go, in the name of the rest, answered, My sovereign lord, I am of St. Genou in Berry. This man is of Palvo, this other is of Anze, this of Argy, this of St. Nazarand, and this man of Villebrenet. We come from St. Sebastian, near Nantes, and are now returning, as we best may, by easy journeys. Yea, but said Grangousier, what went you to do at St. Sebastian? We went, said Sweertigo, to offer up unto that sanct our vows against the plague. Ah, poor men, said Grangousier, do you think that the plague comes from St. Sebastian? Yes, truly, answered Sweertigo, our preachers tell us so indeed. But is it so, said Grangousier, do the false prophets teach you such abuses? Do they thus blaspheme the saints and holy men of God? as to make them like unto the devils, who do nothing but hurt unto mankind? As Homer writeth, that the plague was sent into the camp of the Greeks by Apollo, and as the poets feign a great rabble of Bejo and mischievous gods, so did a certain cafard or dissembling religionary preach at Sinai that St. Anthony sent the fire into men's legs, that St. Eutropius made men hydropic, St. Clytus fools, and that St. Genou made them goutish. But I punished him so exemplarily, though he called me heretic for it, that since that time no such hypocritical rogue durst set his foot within my territories. And truly I wonder that your king should suffer them in their sermons to publish such scandalous doctrine in his dominions, for they deserve to be chastised with greater severity than those who, by magical art or any other device, have brought the pestilence into a country. The pest killeth but the bodies, but such abominable impostors empoison our very souls. As he spake these words, 
In came the monk, very resolute, and asked them, Whence are you, poor wretches? Of St. Genu, said they. And how, said the monk, does the abbot Gulligut, the good drinker, and the monks, what cheer make they? By G's body, they'll have a fling at your wives, and breast them to some purpose, whilst you are upon your roaming rant and gadding pilgrimage. Hen, hen, said Swear to go, I am not afraid of mine. For he that shall see her by day will never break his neck to come to her in the night time. Yea, Mary, said the monk, now you've hit it. Let her be as ugly as ever was Proserpina. She will once, by the Lord G, be overturned, and get her skin coat shaken, if there dwell any monks near to her. For a good carpenter will make use of any kind of timber. Let me be peppered with the pox, if you find not all your wives with child at your return for the very shadow of the steeple of an abbey is fruitful. It is, said Gargantua, like the water of the Nilus in Egypt. If you believe Strabo and Pliny, Lib. 7, Cap. 3. What virtue will there be, then, said the monk, in their bullets of concupiscence, their habits and their bodies? Then, said Grangousier, go your ways, poor men, in the name of God the Creator, to whom I pray to guide you perpetually. And henceforward, be not so ready to undertake these idle and unprofitable journeys. Look to your families, labor every man in his vocation, instruct your children, and live as the good apostle St. Paul directeth you, in doing whereof God, his angels and saints, will guard and protect you, and no evil or plague at any time shall befall you. Then Gargantua led them into the hall to take their refection. But the pilgrims did nothing but sigh, and said to Gargantua, Oh, how happy is that land which hath such a man for their lord! We have been more edified and instructed by the talk which he had with us than by all the sermons that ever were preached in our town. This is, said Gargantua, that which Plato saith, Lib. 5, De Republic, that the commonwealths are happy whose rulers philosophate, and whose philosophers rule. Then caused he their wallets to be filled with victuals, and their bottles with wine, and gave unto each of them a horse to ease them upon their way, together with some pence to live by. End of chapter 45、Chapter、46、of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book、One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Penfold. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One, by Francois Rabelais. Translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart. Chapter 46. How Grangousier did very kindly entertain Touchefusset, his prisoner. Touchefusset was presented under Grangousier, and by him examined upon the enterprise and attempt of Piracole what it was he could pretend to or aim at by the rustling stir and tumultuary coil of this his sudden invasion, whereunto he answered that his end and purpose was to conquer all the country, if he could, for the injury done to his cake bakers. It is too great an undertaking, said Grangousier, and as the proverb is, he that grips too much holds fast but little. The time is not now as formerly to conquer the kingdoms of our neighbor princes and to build up our own greatness upon the loss of our nearest Christian brother. This imitation of the ancient Herculeses, Alexanders, Hannibals, Scipios, Caesars, and other such heroes is quite contrary to the profession of the gospel of Christ, by which we are commanded to preserve, keep, rule, and govern every man his own country and lands, and not in a hostile manner to invade others. And that which heretofore the barbers and Saracens called prowess and valor, we do now call robbing, thievery, and wickedness. It would have been more commendable in him to have contained himself within the bounds of his own territories, royally governing them, than to insult and domineer in mine, pillaging and plundering everywhere like a most unmerciful enemy. For by ruling his own with discretion, he might have increased his greatness, but by robbing me, he cannot escape destruction. Go your ways in the name of God, prosecute good enterprises, show your king what is amiss, and never counsel him with regard unto your own particular profit, for the public loss will swallow up the private benefit. 
as for your ransom i do freely remit it to you and will that your arms and horse be restored to you so should good neighbors do and ancient friends seeing this our difference is not properly war as plato lib five de repub would not have it called war but sedition when the greeks took up arms against one another and that therefore when such combustions should arise against them his advice was to behave themselves in the managing of them with all discretion and modesty although you call it war it is but superficial it entereth not into the closet and inmost cabinet of our hearts for neither of us hath been wronged in his honour nor is there any question betwixt us in the main but only how to redress by the by some petty faults committed by our men i mean both yours and ours which although you knew you ought to let pass for these quarrelsome persons deserve rather to be contemned than mentioned especially seeing i offered them satisfaction according to the wrong god shall be the just judge of our variances whom i beseech by death rather to take me out of this life and to permit my goods to perish and be destroyed before mine eyes than that by me or mine he should in any sort be wronged these words uttered he called the monk and before them all thus spoke unto him friar john my good friend is it you that took prisoner the captain touche here present sir said the monk seeing himself is here and that he is of the years of discretion i had rather you should know it by his confession than by any words of mine then said touche my sovereign lord it is he indeed that took me and i do therefore most freely yield myself his prisoner have you put him to any ransom said grangousier to the monk no said the monk of that i take no care how much would you have for having taken him nothing nothing said the monk i am not swayed by that nor do i regard it then grangousier commanded that in presence of touche should be delivered to the monk for taking him the sum of threescore and two thousand salus in english money fifteen thousand and five hundred pounds which was done whilst they made a collation or little banquet to the said touche of whom grangousier asked if he would stay with him or if he loved rather to return to his king Touche answered that he was content to take whatever course he would advise him to. Then said Grangousier, Return unto your king, and God be with you. Then he gave him an excellent sword of a Vienne blade, with a golden scabbard wrought with vine branch like flourishes, of fair goldsmith's work, and a collar or neck chain of gold, weighing seven hundred and two thousand marks, at eight ounces each garnished with precious stones of the finest sort esteemed at a hundred and sixty thousand ducats and ten thousand crowns more as an honourable donative by way of present after this talk touche got to his horse and gargantua for his safety allowed him the guard of thirty men-at-arms and six score archers to attend him under the conduct of gymnast to bring him even unto the gate of the rock clermont if there were need as soon as he was gone the monk restored unto grangousier the threescore and two thousand salus which he had received saying sir it is not as yet the time for you to give such gifts stay till this war be at an end for none can tell what accidents may occur and war begun without good provision of money beforehand for going through with it is but as a breathing of strength and blast that will quickly pass away coin is the sinews of war well then said grangousier at the end i will content you by some honest recompense as also all those who shall do me good service the end of chapter forty six recording by mark penfold chapter forty seven of gargantua and pantagruel book one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by mark penfold gargantua and pantagruel book 1 by francois rabalais translated by sir thomas urquhart chapter 47 how grangousier sent for his legions and how touche slew rashkaf and was afterwards executed by the command of picrocole about this same time those of Besset, of the old market of st james bourge of the dragage of peril of the rivers of the rocks st paul of the vaubreton of pautil 
of the Brehemont, of Cambridge, of Cravant, of Gramont, of the town at the Badger Holes, of Hymus, of Segre, of Housset, of saint Levant, of Panzust, of the Caldro, of Veron, of Coulan, of Chausset, of Verenais, of Bourgeuil, of the Bouchard Island, of the Crowley, of Narsay, of Candé, of Montsoreau, and other bordering places, sent ambassadors unto Grangousier to tell him that they were advised of the great wrongs which Picrocole had done him, and, in regard of their ancient confederacy, offered him what assistance they could afford, both in men, money, victuals, and ammunition, and other necessities for war. The money which by the joint agreement of them all was sent unto him amounted to six score and fourteen millions, two crowns, and a half of pure gold. The forces wherewith they did assist him did consist in fifteen thousand cruassiers, two and thirty thousand light horsemen, fourscore and nine thousand dragoons, and a hundred and forty thousand volunteer adventurers. These had with them eleven thousand and two hundred cannons, double cannons, long pieces of artillery called basilisks, and smaller-sized ones known by the name of spirols, besides the mortar-pieces and grenadas. Of pioneers they had seven and forty thousand, all victualled and paid for six months and four days of advance, which offer Gargantua did not altogether refuse, nor wholly accept of, but giving them hearty thanks, said that he would compose and order the war by such a device, that there should not be found great need to put so many honest men to trouble in the managing of it, and therefore was content at that time to give order only for bringing along the legions which he maintained in his ordinary garrison towns of the Diviniere, of Chavigny, of Graveau, and of the Quinquenne, amounting to the number of two thousand cuirassiers, threescore and six thousand foot soldiers, six and twenty thousand dragoons, attended by two hundred pieces of great ordnance, two and twenty thousand pioneers, and six thousand light horsemen, all drawn up in troops, so well befitted and accommodated with their commissaries, sutlers, farriers, harness-makers, and other such like necessary members in a military camp, so fully instructed in the art of warfare, so perfectly knowing and following their colors, so ready to hear and obey their captains, so nimble to run, so strong at their charging, so prudent in their adventures, and every day so well disciplined, that they seemed rather to be a concert of organ-pipes, or mutual concord of the wheels of a clock, than an infantry and cavalry, or army of soldiers. Touchefusset, immediately after his return, presented himself before Picrocole, and related unto him at large all that he had done and seen, and at last endeavoured to persuade him with strong and forcible arguments to capitulate and make an agreement with Grangousier, whom he found to be the honestest man in the world, saying further that it was neither right nor reason thus to trouble his neighbours, of whom they had never received anything but good, and in regard of the main point, that they should never be able to go through stitch with that war, but to their great damage and mischief, for the forces of Picrocole were not so considerable but that Grangousier could easily overthrow them. He had not well done speaking when Rashkaf said out aloud, Unhappy is that prince which is by such men served, who are so easily corrupted as I know Touchefusset is, for I see his courage so changed that he had willingly joined with our enemies to fight against us and betray us if they would have received him, but as virtue is of all, both friends and foes, praised and esteemed, so is wickedness soon known and suspected, and although it happened the enemies to make use thereof for their profit, yet have they always the wicked and the traitors in abomination. Touchefusset, being at these words very impatient, drew out his sword, and therewith ran Rashkaf through the body, a little under the nipple of his left side, whereof he died presently, and pulling back his sword out of his body, said boldly, so let him perish that shall a faithful servant blame. Picrocole incontinently grew furious, and seeing Touchefusset's new sword, and his scabbard so richly diapered with flourishes of most excellent workmanship, said, Did they give thee this weapon so feloniously therewith to kill before my face my so good friend Rashkaf? 
then immediately commanded he his guard to hew him in pieces which was instantly done and that so cruelly that the chamber was all dyed with blood afterwards he appointed the corpse of rashkaf to be honourably buried and that of touche to be cast over the walls into the ditch the news of these excessive violences were quickly spread through all the army whereupon many began to murmur against picricole in so far that pinchpenny said to him my sovereign lord i know not what the issue of this enterprise will be i see your men much dejected and not well resolved in their minds by considering that we are here very ill provided of victual and that our number is already much diminished by three or four sallies furthermore great supplies and recruits come daily into your enemies but we so moulder away that if we be once besieged i do not see how we can escape a total destruction tush pish said picricole you are like the meloon eels you cry before they come to you let them come let them come if they dare the end of chapter forty seven recording by mark penfold Chapter forty eight of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One, by Francois Rabelais translated by sir thomas urquhart chapter forty eight how gargantua set upon picrochole within the rock clermont and utterly defeated the army of the said picrochole gargantua had the charge of the whole army and his father grangousier stayed in his castle who encouraging them with good words promised great rewards unto those that should do any notable service having thus set forward as soon as they had gained the pass at the ford of ved with boats and bridges speedily made they passed over in a trice then considering the situation of the town which was on a high and advantageous place gargantua thought fit to call his council and pass that night in deliberation upon what was to be done but gymnast said unto him my sovereign lord such is the nature and complexion of the french that they are worth nothing but at the first push then they are more fierce than devils but if they linger a little and be wearied with delays they'll prove more faint and remiss than women my opinion is therefore that now presently after your men have taken breath and some small refection you give order for a resolute assault and that we storm them instantly his advice was found very good and for effectuating thereof he brought forth his army into the plain field and placed the reserves on the skirt or rising of a little hill the monk took along with him six companies of foot and two hundred horsemen well armed and with great diligence crossed the marsh and valiantly got upon the top of the green hillock even unto the highway which leads to loudun whilst the assault was thus begun picrochole's men could not tell well what was best to issue out and receive the assailants or keep within the town and not to stir himself in the meantime without deliberation sallied forth in a rage with the cavalry of his guard 
who were forthwith received and royally entertained with great cannon-shot that fell upon them like hail from the high grounds on which the artillery was planted whereupon the gargantuists betook themselves unto the valleys to give the ordnance leave to play and range with the larger scope those of the town defended themselves as well as they could but their shot passed over us without doing us any hurt at all some of picrochol's men that had escaped our artillery set most fiercely upon our soldiers but prevailed little for they were all let in betwixt the files and there knocked down to the ground which their fellow-soldiers seeing they would have retreated but the monk having seized upon the pass by which they were to return they ran away and fled in all the disorder and confusion that could be imagined some would have pursued after them and followed the chase but the monk withheld them apprehending that in their pursuit the pursuers might lose their ranks and so give occasion to the besieged to sally out of the town upon them then staying there some space and none coming against him he sent the duke frontiste to advise gargantua to advance towards the hill upon the left hand to hinder picrochol's retreat at that gate which gargantua did with all expedition and sent thither four brigades under the conduct of sebast which had no sooner reached the top of the hill but they met picrochol in the teeth and those that were with him scattered then charged they upon them stoutly yet they were much endamaged by those that were upon the walls who galled them with all manner of shot both from the great ordnance small guns and bows which gargantua perceiving he went with a strong party to their relief and with his artillery began to thunder so terribly upon that canton of the wall and so long that all the strength within the town to maintain and fill up the breach was drawn thither the monk seeing that quarter which he kept besieged void of men and competent guards and in a manner altogether naked and abandoned did most magnanimously on a sudden lead up his men towards the fort and never left it till he had got up upon it knowing that such as come to the reserve in a conflict bring with them always more fear and terror than those that deal about them with their hands in the fight nevertheless he gave no alarm till all his soldiers had got within the wall except the two hundred horsemen whom he left without to secure his entry then did he give a most horrible shout so did all these who were with him and immediately thereafter without resistance putting to the edge of the sword the guard that was at the gate they opened it to the horsemen with whom most furiously they all together ran towards the east gate where all the hurly-burly was and coming close upon them in the rear overthrew all their forces the besieged seeing that the gargantuists had won the town upon them and that they were like to be secure in no corner of it submitted themselves unto the mercy of the monk and asked for quarter which the monk very nobly granted to them yet made them lay down their arms then 
shutting them up within churches gave order to seize upon all the staves of the crosses and placed men at the doors to keep them from coming forth then opening that east gate he issued out to succour and assist gargantua but picrochole thinking it had been some relief coming to him from the town adventured more forwardly than before and was upon the giving of a most desperate home charge when gargantua cried out ha ah, friar john my friend friar john you are come in a good hour which unexpected accident so affrighted picrochole and his men that giving all for lost they betook themselves to their heels and fled on all hands gargantua chased them till they came near to vaugaudry killing and slaying all the way and then sounded the retreat End of chapter 48 Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey Chapter 49 of Gargantua and Pentagoral, Book 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org gargantua and pentagoral book one by francois rabelais translated by sir thomas urquhart chapter forty nine how picrochole in his flight fell into great misfortunes and what gargantua did after the battle picrochole thus in despair fled towards the bouchard island and in the way to riviere his horse stumbled and fell down whereat he on a sudden was so incensed that he with his sword without more ado killed him in his collar then not finding any that would remount him he was about to have taken an ass at the mill that was thereby but the miller's man did so baste his bones and so soundly bathwack him that they made him both black and blue with strokes then stripping him of all his clothes gave him a scurvy old canvas jacket wherewith to cover his nakedness thus went along this poor choleric wretch who passing the water at port huot and relating his misadventurous disasters was foretold by an old lourpidon hag that his kingdom should be restored to him at the coming of the cockley cranes which she called coxigru what is become of him since we cannot certainly tell yet was i told that he is now a porter at Lyon, as testy and pettish in humour as ever he was before, and would be always with great lamentation inquiring at all strangers of the coming of the cockley cranes, expecting assuredly, according to the old woman's prophecy, that at their coming he shall be re-established in his kingdom. The first thing Gargantua did after his return into the town, was to call the master-roll of his men, which when he had done, he found that there were very few either killed or wounded, only some few foot of Captain Tolmer's company, and Ponocrates, who was shot with a musket-ball through the doublet. Then he caused them all, at and in their several posts and divisions, to take a little refreshment, which was very plenteously provided for them in the best drink and victuals that could be had for money, and gave order to the treasurers and commissaries of the army to pay for and defray that repast, and that there should be no outrage at all, nor abuse committed in the town, seeing it was his own. And furthermore commanded, that immediately after the soldiers had done with eating and drinking, for that time sufficiently, and to their own heart's desire, a gathering should be beaten for bringing them all together, to be drawn up on the piazza before the castle, there to receive six months' pay completely. All which was done. After this, by his direction, were brought before him in the state place all those that remained of Pytrocol's party, unto whom, 
in the presence of the princes, nobles, and officers of his court and army, he spoke as followeth. End of chapter 49 Recording by Iswa in Belgium in November 2009「Chapter 50 of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book 1 by François Rabelais, translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart. Chapter 50. Gargantua's Speech to the Vanquished. Our forefathers and ancestors of all times have been of this nature and disposition, that upon the winning of a battle they have chosen rather for a sign and memorial of their triumphs and victories to erect trophies and monuments in the hearts of the vanquished by clemency than by architecture in the lands which they had conquered for they did hold in greater estimation the lively remembrance of men purchased by liberality than the dumb inscription of arches pillars and pyramids subject to the injury of storms and tempests and to the envy of every one you may very well remember of the courtesy which by them was used towards the bretons in the battle of saint aubin of cormier and at the demolishing of Partenay. you have heard and hearing admire their gentle comportment towards those at the barriers the barbarians of spaniola who had plundered wasted and ransacked the maritime borders of olone and talmondois all this hemisphere of the world was filled with the praises and congratulations which yourselves and your fathers made when alpharbal king of canard not satisfied with his own fortunes did most furiously invade the land of onyx and with cruel piracies molest all the armoric islands and confine regions of brittany yet was he in a set naval fight justly taken and vanquished by my father whom god preserve and protect but what whereas other kings and emperors yea those who entitle themselves catholics would have dealt roughly with him kept him a close prisoner and put him to an extreme high ransom he entreated him very courteously lodged him kindly with himself in his own palace and out of his incredible mildness and gentle disposition sent him back with a safe conduct laden with gifts laden with favours laden with all offices of friendship what fell out upon it being returned into his country he called a parliament where all the princes and states of his kingdom being assembled he showed them the humanity which he had found in us and therefore wished them to take such course by way of compensation therein as that the whole world might be edified by the example as well of their honest graciousness to us as of our gracious honesty towards them 
the result hereof was that it was voted and decreed by an unanimous consent that they should offer up entirely their lands dominions and kingdoms to be disposed of by us according to our pleasure alfarbal in his own person presently returned with nine thousand and thirty-eight great ships of burden bringing with him the treasures not only of his house and royal lineage but almost of all the country besides for he embarking himself to set sail with a west-north-east wind every one in heaps did cast into the ship gold silver rings jewels spices drugs and aromatical perfumes parrots pelicans monkeys civet cats black-spotted weasels porcupines etc he was accounted no good mother's son that did not cast in all the rare and precious things he had being safely arrived he came to my said father and would have kissed his feet that action was found too submissively low and therefore was not permitted but in exchange he was most cordially embraced he offered his presents they were not received because they were too excessive he yielded himself voluntarily a servant and vassal and was content his whole posterity should be liable to the same bondage this was not accepted of because it seemed not equitable he surrendered by virtue of the decree of his great parliamentary council his whole countries and kingdoms to him offering the deed and conveyance signed sealed and ratified by all those who were concerned in it this was altogether refused and the parchments cast into the fire in end this free good will and simple meaning of the canarians wrought such tenderness in my father's heart that he could not abstain from shedding tears and wept most profusely then by choice words very congruously adapted strove in what he could to diminish the estimation of the good offices which he had done them saying that any courtesy he had conferred upon them was not worth a rush and what favour soever he had showed them he was bound to do it but so much the more did alfarbal augment the repute thereof what was the issue whereas for his ransom in the greatest extremity of rigour and most tyrannical dealing could not have been exacted above twenty times a hundred thousand crowns and his eldest sons detained as hostages till that sum had been paid they made themselves perpetual tributaries and obliged to give us every year two millions of gold at four and twenty carats fine the first year we received the whole sum of two millions the second year of their own accord they paid freely to us three and twenty hundred thousand crowns the third year six and twenty hundred thousand the fourth year three millions and do so increase it always out of their own good will that we shall be constrained to forbid them to bring us any more this is the nature of gratitude and true thankfulness for time which gnaws and diminishes all things else augments and increaseth benefits 
because a noble action of liberality done to a man of reason doth grow continually by his generous thinking of it and remembering it being unwilling therefore any way to degenerate from the hereditary mildness and clemency of my parents i do now forgive you deliver you from all fines and imprisonments fully release you set you at liberty and every way make you as frank and free as ever you were before moreover at your going out of the gate you shall have every one of you three months pay to bring you home into your houses and families and shall have a safe convoy of six hundred cuirassiers and eight thousand foot under the conduct of alexander esquire of my body that the clubmen of the country may not do you any injury god be with you i am sorry from my heart that picrochol is not here for i would have given him to understand that this war was undertaken against my will and without any hope to increase either my goods or renown but seeing he is lost and that no man can tell where nor how he went away it was my will that his kingdom remain entire to his son who because he is too young he not being yet full five years old shall be brought up and instructed by the ancient princes and learned men of the kingdom and because a realm thus desolate may easily come to ruin if the covetousness and avarice of those who by their places are obliged to administer justice in it be not curbed and restrained i ordain and will have it so that ponocrates be overseer and superintendent above all his governors with whatever power and authority is requisite thereto and that he be continually with the child until he find him able and capable to rule and govern by himself now i must tell you that you are to understand how a too feeble and dissolute facility in pardoning evil-doers giveth them occasion to commit wickedness afterwards more readily upon this pernicious confidence of receiving favour i consider that moses the meekest man that was in his time upon the earth did severely punish the mutinous and seditious people of israel i consider likewise that julius caesar who was so gracious an emperor that cicero said of him that his fortune had nothing more excellent than that he could and his virtue nothing better than that he would always save and pardon every man he notwithstanding all this did in certain places most rigorously punish the authors of rebellion after the example of these good men it is my will and pleasure that you deliver over unto me before you depart hence first that fine fellow marquet who was the prime cause origin and groundwork of this war by his vain presumption and overweening secondly his fellow cake-bakers who were neglective in checking and reprehending his idle hare-brained humour in the instant time and lastly all the councillors captains officers and domestics of picrochol 
who had been incendiaries or fomenters of the war by provoking praising or counselling him to come out of his limits thus to trouble us end of chapter fifty recording by martin giessen in hazelmere surrey Chapter fifty one of Gargantua and Pentagoral, Book one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gargantua and Pentagoral, Book one, by Francois Rabelais. Translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart. Chapter fifty one. How the victorious Gargantuists were recompensed after the battle. When Gargantua had finished his speech, the seditious men whom he required were delivered up unto him, except Swashbuckler, Dirt Nail, and Small Trash, who ran away six hours before the battle, one of them as far as to Leniel Neck at one course, another to the valley of Vire, and the third even unto Logroigne, without looking back or taking breath by the way and two of the cake-bakers who were slain in the fight. Gargantua did them no other hurt but that he appointed them to pull at the presses of his printing-house, which he had newly set up. Then those who died there he caused to be honourably buried in Black-soiled Valley and Burnhag Field, and gave order that the wounded should be dressed and had care of in his great hospital on Nozacom. After this, considering the great prejudice done to the town and its inhabitants, he reimbursed their charges, and repaired all the losses that by their confession upon oath could appear they had sustained, and, for their better defence and security in times coming against all sudden uproars and invasions, commanded a strong citadel to be built there, with a competent garrison to maintain it. At his departure he did very gracefully thank all the soldiers of the brigades that had been at this overthrow, and sent them back to their winter quarters in their several stations and garrisons. The decuman legion only excepted, whom in the field on that day he saw do some great exploit, and their captains also, whom he brought along with himself unto Grand Gousier. At the sight and coming of them, the good man was so joyful that it is not possible fully to describe it. He made them a feast the most magnificent, plentiful, and delicious that ever was seen since the time of the king Ahasuerus. At the taking up of the table, he distributed amongst them his whole cupboard of plate, which weighed eight hundred thousand and fourteen bezants. Each bezant is worth five pounds English money, of gold, in great antique vessels, huge pots, large basins, big tosses, cups, goblets, candlesticks, comfit boxes, and other such plates, all of pure massy gold, besides the precious stones, enamelling, and workmanship, which by all men's estimation was more worth than the matter of the gold. Then unto every one of them out of his coffers caused he to be given the sum of twelve hundred thousand crowns ready money. And further, he gave to each of them for ever and in perpetuity, unless he should happen to decease without heirs, such castles and neighbouring lands of his as were most commodious for them. To Ponocrates he gave the rock Clermont, to Gymnast the Coudray, to Eudemon, Montpensier, Rivaux to Tolmer, to Ithibol, Montsoreau, to Acamas, Cande, Varenne to Chironict, Gravo to Sébast, Quinconnet to Alexander, Le Gré to Sophron, and so of his other places. End of chapter fifty one. Recording by Iswa in Belgium in November two thousand and nine. Chapter fifty two of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book one. 
this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by martin geeson gargantua and pantagruel book 1 by francois rabelais translated by sir thomas urquhart chapter 52 how gargantua caused to be built for the monk the abbey of telem there was left only the monk to provide for whom gargantua would have made abbot of seville but he refused it he would have given him the abbey of bourgueil or of saint florent which was better or both if it pleased him but the monk gave him a very peremptory answer that he would never take upon him the charge nor government of monks for how shall i be able said he to rule over others that have not full power and command of myself if you think i have done you or may hereafter do any acceptable service give me leave to found an abbey after my own mind and fancy the motion pleased gargantua very well who thereupon offered him all the country of telem by the river of loire till within two leagues of the great forest of port Hio the monk then requested gargantua to institute his religious order contrary to all others first then said gargantua you must not build a wall about your convent for all other abbeys are strongly walled and mured about see said the monk and not without cause seeing wall and mur signify but one and the same thing where there is mur before and mur behind there is store of mur mur envy and mutual conspiracy moreover seeing there are certain convents in the world whereof the custom is if any woman come in i mean chaste and honest women they immediately sweep the ground which they have trod upon therefore was it ordained that if any man or woman entered into religious orders should by chance come within this new abbey all the rooms should be thoroughly washed and cleansed through which they had passed and because in all other monasteries and nunneries all is compassed limited and regulated by ours it was decreed that in this new structure there should be neither clock nor dial but that according to the opportunities and incident occasions all their hours should be disposed of for said gargantua the greatest loss of time that i know is to count the hours what good comes of it nor can there be any greater dotage in the world than for one to guide and direct his courses by the sound of a bell and not by his own judgment and discretion item because at that time they put no women into nunneries but such as were either purblind blinkards lame crooked ill-favoured misshapen fools senseless spoiled or corrupt nor encloistered any men but those that were either sickly subject to defluxions ill-bred louts simple sots or peevish trouble-houses but to the purpose said the monk a woman that is neither fair nor good to what you serve she to make a nun of said gargantua yea said the monk and to make shirts and smocks 
therefore was it ordained that into this religious order should be admitted no women that were not fair well featured and of a sweet disposition nor men that were not comely personable and well conditioned item because in the convents of women men come not but underhand privily and by stealth it was therefore enacted that in this house there shall be no women in case there be not men nor men in case there be not women item because both men and women that are received into religious orders after the expiring of their novitiate or probation year were constrained and forced perpetually to stay there all the days of their life it was therefore ordered that all whatever men or women admitted within this abbey should have full leave to depart with peace and contentment whensoever it should seem good to them so to do item for that the religious men and women did ordinarily make three vows to wit those of chastity poverty and obedience it was therefore constituted and appointed that in this convent they might be honourably married, that they might be rich, and live at liberty. In regard of the legitimate time of the persons to be initiated, and years under and above which they were not capable of reception, the women were to be admitted from ten till fifteen, and the men from twelve till eighteen. End of chapter 52 Recording by Martin Geeson in Hazelmere, Surrey Chapter 53 of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One, by François Rabelais Translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart Chapter 53 How the Abbey of the Telemites was built and endowed for the fabric and furniture of the abbey gargantua caused to be delivered out in ready money seven and twenty hundred thousand eight hundred and one and thirty of those golden rams of berry which have a sheep stamped on the one side and a flowered cross on the other and for every year until the whole work were completed he allotted three score nine thousand crowns of the sun and as many of the seven stars to be charged all upon the receipt of the custom for the foundation and maintenance thereof for ever he settled a perpetual fee-farm rent of three and twenty hundred three score and nine thousand five hundred and fourteen rose nobles exempted from all homage fealty service or burden whatsoever and payable every year at the gate of the abbey and of this by letters patent passed a very good grant the architecture was in a figure hexagonal and in such a fashion that in every one of the six corners there was built a great round tower of threescore foot in diameter and were all of a like form and bigness upon the north side ran along the river of loire on the bank whereof was situated the tower called arctic going towards the east there was another called calaire 
the next following anatole the next mesembrine the next hesperia and the last criere every tower was distant from the other the space of three hundred and twelve paces the whole edifice was everywhere six stories high reckoning the cellars underground for one the second was arched after the manner of a basket handle the rest were sealed with pure wainscot flourished with flanders fretwork in the form of the foot of a lamp and covered over with fine slates with an endorsement of lead carrying the antique figures of little puppets and animals of all sorts notably well suited to one another and gilt together with the gutters which jutting without the walls from betwixt the cross-bars in a diagonal figure painted with gold and azure reached to the very ground where they ended into great conduit pipes which carried all away unto the river from under the house this same building was a hundred times more sumptuous and magnificent than ever was bonivet chambourg or chantilly for there were in it nine thousand three hundred and two and thirty chambers every one whereof had a withdrawing room a handsome closet a wardrobe an oratory and neat passage leading into a great and spacious hall between every tower in the midst of the said body of building there was a pair of winding such as we now call lantern stairs whereof the steps were part of porphyry which is a dark red marble spotted with white part of numidian stone which is a kind of yellowishly streaked marble upon various colours and part of serpentine marble with light spots on a dark green ground each of those steps being two and twenty foot in length and three fingers thick and the just number of twelve betwixt every rest or as we now term it landing-place in every resting-place were two fair antique arches where the light came in and by those they went into a cabinet made even with and of the breadth of the said winding and the reascending above the roofs of the house ended conically in a pavilion by that vice or winding they entered on every side into a great hall and from the halls into the chambers from the arctic tower unto the criere where the fair great libraries in greek latin hebrew french italian and spanish respectively distributed in their several cantons according to the diversity of these languages in the midst there was a wonderful scalia or winding stair the entry whereof was without the house in a vault or arch six fathom broad it was made in such symmetry and largeness that six men-at-arms with their lances in their rests might together in a breast ride all up to the very top of all the palace from the tower anatole to the mesembrine were fair spacious galleries all coloured over and painted with the ancient prowesses histories and descriptions of the world in the midst thereof there was likewise such another ascent and gate as we said there was on the river side upon that gate was written in great antique letters that which followeth End of chapter 53 
Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey. Chapter fifty four of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One, by Francois Rabelais. Translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart chapter fifty four the inscription set upon the great gate of telem here enter not vile bigots hypocrites externally devoted apes base knights puffed up wry-necked beasts worse than the huns or ostrogoths forerunners of baboons cursed snakes dissembled varlets seeming sancts slipshod cafards beggars pretending wants fat chuff-cats smell-feast knockers doltish gulls outstrouting cluster-fists contentious bulls fomenters of divisions and debates elsewhere not here make sale of your deceits your filthy tramperies stuffed with pernicious lies not worth a bubble would do but trouble our earthly paradise your filthy tramperies here enter not attorneys barristers nor bridal champing law practitioners clerks commissaries scribes nor pharisees wilful disturbers of the people's ease judges destroyers with an unjust breath of honest men like dogs even unto death your salary is at the gibbet foot go drink there for we do not here fly out on those excessive courses which may draw a waiting on your courts by suits in law lawsuits debates and wrangling hence are exiled and jangling here we are very frolic and merry and free from all entangling lawsuits debates and wrangling here enter not base pinching usurers pelf-lickers everlasting gatherers gold graspers coin gripers gulpers of mists niggish deformed sots who though your chests vast sums of money should to you afford would ne'ertheless add more unto that hoard and yet not be content you clunch fist dastards insatiable fiends and pluto's bastards greedy devourers chichi sneak-bill rogues hell mastiffs gnaw your bones you ravenous dogs you beastly looking fellows reason doth plainly tell us that we should not to you allot room here but at the gallows you beastly looking fellows here enter not fond makers of demurs in love adventures peevish jealous curs sad pensive dotards razors of garboils hags goblins ghosts firebrands of household broils nor drunkards liars cowards cheaters clowns thieves cannibals faces or cast with frowns nor lazy slugs envious covetous nor blockish cruel nor too credulous here mangy 
pocky folks shall have no place no ugly lusks nor persons of disgrace grace honour praise delight here sojourn day and night sound bodies lined with a good mind do here pursue with might grace honour praise delight here enter you and welcome from our hearts all noble sparks endowed with gallant parts this is the glorious place which bravely shall afford wherewith to entertain you all were you a thousand here you shall not want for anything for what you'll ask we'll grant stay here you lively jovial handsome brisk gay witty frolic cheerful merry frisk spruce jocund courteous furtherers of trades and in a word all worthy gentle blades blades of heroic breasts shall taste here of the feasts both privily and civilly of the celestial guests blades of heroic breasts here enter you pure honest faithful true expounders of the scriptures old and new whose glosses do not blind our reason but make it to see the clearer and who shut its passages from hatred avarice pride factions covenants and all sort of vice come settle here a charitable faith which neighbourly affection nourisheth and whose light chaseth all corrupters hence of the blessed word from the aforesaid sense the holy sacred word may it always afford to us all in common both man and woman a spiritual shield and sword the holy sacred word here enter you all ladies of high birth delicious stately charming full of mirth ingenious lovely mignard proper fair magnetic graceful splendid pleasant rare obliging sprightly virtuous young solacious kind neat quick feet bright compt ripe choice dear precious alluring courtly comely fine complete wise personable ravishing and sweet come joys enjoy the lord celestial hath given enough wherewith to please us all gold give us god forgive us and from all woes relieve us that we the treasure may reap of pleasure and shun whate'er is grievous gold give us god forgive us End of chapter 54 Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey Chapter 55 of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One, by Francois Rabelais. Translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart. Chapter 55. 
what manner of dwelling the telemites had in the middle of the lower court there was a stately fountain of fair alabaster upon the top thereof stood the three graces with their cornucopias or horns of abundance and did jet out the water at their breasts mouth ears eyes and other open passages of the body the inside of the buildings in this lower court stood upon great pillars of chalcedony stone and porphyry marble made archways after a goodly antique fashion within those were spacious galleries long and large adorned with curious pictures the horns of bucks and unicorns with rhinoceroses water horses called hippopotames the teeth and tusks of elephants and other things well worth the beholding the lodging of the ladies for so we may call those gallant women took up all from the tower arctic unto the gate mesembrine the men possessed the rest before the said lodging of the ladies that they might have their recreation between the two first towers on the outside were placed the tilt-yard the barriers or lists for tournaments the hippodrome or riding-court the theatre or public playhouse and natatory or place to swim in with most admirable baths in three stages situated above one another well furnished with all necessary accommodation and store of myrtle water by the river-side was the fair garden of pleasure and in the midst of that the glorious labyrinth between the two other towers were the courts for the tennis and the balloon towards the tower criere stood the orchard full of all fruit trees set and ranged in a quincuncial order at the end of that was the great park abounding with all sort of venison betwixt the third couple of towers were the butts and marks for shooting with a snapwork gun an ordinary bow for common archery or with a crossbow the office houses were without the tower hesperia of one story high the stables were beyond the offices and before them stood the falconry managed by ostrich keepers and falconers very expert in the art and it was yearly supplied and furnished by the candians venetians sarmates now called muscoviters with all sorts of most excellent hawks eagles gerfalcons goshawks sacras lanners falcons sparrow-hawks marlins and other kinds of them so gentle and perfectly well manned that flying of themselves sometimes from the castle for their own disport they would not fail to catch whatever they encountered the venery where the beagles and hounds were kept was a little farther off drawing towards the park all the halls chambers and closets or cabinets were richly hung with tapestry and hangings of divers sorts according to the variety of the seasons of the year all the pavements and floors were covered with green cloth the beds were all embroidered in every back chamber or withdrawing-room there was a looking-glass of pure crystal set in a frame of fine gold garnished all about with pearls
was and was of such greatness that it would represent to the full the whole lineaments and proportion of the person that stood before it at the going out of the halls which belong to the ladies lodgings where the perfumers and trimmers through whose hands the gallants passed when they were to visit the ladies those sweet artificers did every morning furnish the ladies chambers with the spirit of roses orange flower water and angelica and to each of them gave a little precious casket vapouring forth the most odoriferous exhalations of the choicest aromatical scents end of chapter fifty five recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey Chapter fifty six of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One, by Francois Rabelais translated by sir thomas urquhart chapter fifty six how the men and women of the religious order of telem were apparelled the ladies at the foundation of this order were apparelled after their own pleasure and liking but since that of their own accord and free will they have reformed themselves their accoutrement is in manner as followeth they wore stockings of scarlet crimson or ingrained purple dye which reached just three inches above the knee having a list beautified with exquisite embroideries and rare incisions of the cutter's art their garters were of the colour of their bracelets and circled the knee a little both over and under their shoes pumps and slippers were either of red violet or crimson velvet pinked and jagged like lobster waddles next to their smock they put on the pretty kirtle or vasquin of pure silk camlet above that went the taffety or tabby farthingale of white red tawny grey or of any other colour above this taffety petticoat they had another of cloth of tissue or brocade embroidered with fine gold and interlaced with needlework or as they thought good and according to the temperature and disposition of the weather had their upper coats of satin damask or velvet and those either orange tawny green ash-coloured blue yellow bright red crimson or white and so forth or had them of cloth of gold cloth of silver or some other choice stuff enriched with pearl or embroidered according to the dignity of the festival days and times wherein they wore them their gowns being still correspondent to the season were either of cloth of gold frizzled with a silver raised work of red satin covered with gold pearl of tabby or taffety white blue black tawny etc of silk serge silk camlet velvet cloth of silver silver tissue cloth of gold gold wire figured velvet or figured satin tinselled and overcast with golden threads in divers variously purfled draughts 
in the summer some days instead of gowns they wore light handsome mantles made either of the stuff of the aforesaid attire or like moresco rugs of violet velvet frizzled with a raised work of gold upon silver pearl or with a knotted cordwork of gold embroidery everywhere garnished with little indian pearls they always carried a fair panache or plume of feathers of the colour of their muff bravely adorned and tricked out with glistering spangles of gold in the winter time they had their taffety gowns of all colours as above named and those lined with the rich furrings of hind wolves or speckled lynxes black spotted weasels martlet skins of calabria sables and other costly furs of an inestimable value their beads rings bracelets collars carcanets and neck chains were all of precious stones such as carbuncles rubies balius diamonds sapphires emeralds turquoise garnets agates burials and excellent marguerites their head-dressing also varied with the season of the year according to which they decked themselves in winter it was of the french fashion in the spring of the spanish in summer of the fashion of tuscany except only upon the holy days and sundays at which times they were accoutred in the french mode because they accounted it more honourable and better befitting the garb of a matronal pudicity the men were apparelled after their fashion their stockings were of tamine or of cloth serge of white black scarlet or some other ingrained colour their breeches were of velvet of the same colour with their stockings or very near embroidered and cut according to their fancy their doublet was of cloth of gold of cloth of silver of velvet satin damask taffeties etc of the same colours cut embroidered and suitably trimmed up in perfection the points were of silk of the same colours the tags were of gold well enamelled their coats and jerkins were of cloth of gold cloth of silver gold tissue or velvet embroidered as they thought fit their gowns were every whit as costly as those of the ladies their girdles were of silks of the colour of their doublets every one had a gallant sword by his side the hilt and handle whereof were gilt and the scabbard of velvet of the colour of his breeches with a chape of gold and pure goldsmith's work the dagger was of the same their caps or bonnets were of black velvet adorned with jewels and buttons of gold upon that they wore a white plume most prettily and minion-like parted by so many rows of gold spangles at the end whereof hung dangling in a more sparkling resplendency fair rubies emeralds diamonds etc but there was such a sympathy between the gallants and the ladies that every day they were apparelled in the same livery and that they might not miss there were certain gentlemen appointed to tell the youths every morning what vestments the ladies would on that day wear for all was done according to the pleasure of the ladies in these so handsome clothes and habiliments so rich think not that either one or other of either sex did waste any time at all 
for the masters of the wardrobes had all their raiments and apparel so ready for every morning and the chamber ladies so well skilled that in a trice they would be dressed and completely in their clothes from head to foot and to have those accoutrements with the more conveniency there was about the wood of Telem a row of houses of the extent of half a league very neat and cleanly wherein dwelt the goldsmiths lapidaries jewellers embroiderers tailors gold drawers velvet weavers tapestry makers and upholsterers who wrought there every one in his own trade and all for the aforesaid jolly friars and nuns of the new stamp they were furnished with matter and stuff from the hands of the lord nausiclete who every year brought them seven ships from the perlers and cannibal islands laden with ingots of gold with raw silk with pearls and precious stones and if any marguerites called unions began to grow old and lose somewhat of their natural whiteness and lustre those with their art they did renew by tendering them to eat to some pretty cocks as they used to give casting unto hawks End of chapter fifty six. Recording by Martin Geeson in Hazelmere, Surrey. Chapter fifty seven of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One, by François Rabelais. Translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart. Chapter 57. How the Telemites were governed, and of their manner of living all their life was spent not in laws statutes or rules but according to their own free will and pleasure they rose out of their beds when they thought good they did eat drink labour sleep when they had a mind to it and were disposed for it none did awake them none did offer to constrain them to eat drink nor do any other thing for so had gargantua established it in all their rule and strictest tie of their order there was but this one clause to be observed do what thou wilt because men that are free well-born well-bred and conversant in honest companies have naturally an instinct and spur that prompteth them unto virtuous actions and withdraws them from vice which is called honour those same men when by base subjection and constraint they are brought under and kept down turn aside from that noble disposition by which they formerly were inclined to virtue to shake off and break that bond of servitude wherein they are so tyrannously enslaved for it is agreeable with the nature of man to long after things forbidden and to desire what is denied us by this liberty they entered into a very laudable emulation to do all of them what they saw did please one if any of the gallants or ladies should say let us drink they would all drink if any one of them said let us play they all played if one said let us go a-walking into the fields they went all 
if it were to go a hawking or a hunting the ladies mounted upon dainty well-paced nags seated in a stately palfrey saddle carried on their lovely fists mignardly begloved every one of them either a sparrow-hawk or a laneret or a marlin and the young gallants carried the other kinds of hawks so nobly were they taught that there was neither he nor she amongst them but could read write sing play upon several musical instruments speak five or six several languages and compose in them all very quaintly both in verse and prose never were seen so valiant knights so noble and worthy so dexterous and skilful both on foot and a horseback more brisk and lively more nimble and quick or better handling all manner of weapons than they were never were seen ladies so proper and handsome so miniard and dainty less froward or more ready with their hand and with their needle in every honest and free action belonging to that sex than were there for this reason when the time came that any man of the said abbey either at the request of his parents or for some other cause had a mind to go out of it he carried along with him one of the ladies namely her whom he had before that chosen for his mistress and they were married together and if they had formerly in telem lived in good devotion and amity they did continue therein and increase it to a greater height in their state of matrimony and did entertain that mutual love till the very last day of their life in no less vigour and fervency than at the very day of their wedding ah here must not i forget to set down unto you a riddle which was found under the ground as they were laying the foundation of the abbey engraven in a copper plate and it was thus as followeth end of chapter fifty seven recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey chapter fifty eight of gargantua and pantagruel book one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One, by Francois Rabelais, translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart. Chapter Fifty Eight: A Prophetic Riddle. Poor mortals who wait for a happy day, cheer up your hearts and hear what I say if it be lawful firmly to believe that the celestial bodies can give us wisdom to judge of things that are not yet or if from heaven such wisdom we may get as may with confidence make us discourse of years to come their destiny and course i to my hearers give to understand that this next winter though it be at hand yea and before there shall appear a race of men who loath to sit still in one place shall boldly go before all people's eyes suborning men of divers qualities to draw them into covenants and sides in such a manner that whate'er betides they'll move you if you give them ear no doubt with both your friends and kindred to fall out they'll make a vassal to gainstand his lord and children their own parents in a word all reverence shall then be banished no true respect to others shall be had they'll say that every man should have his turn both in his going forth and in his return and hereupon shall there arise such woes such jarrings and confused to and froes 
that never were in history such coils set down as yet such tumults and garboils then shall you many gallant men see by valour stirred up the youthful fervency who trusting too much in their hopeful time live but a while and perish in their prime neither shall any who this course shall run leave off the race which he hath once begun till they the heavens with noise by their contention have filled and with their steps the earth's dimension then those shall have no less authority that have no faith than those that will not lie for all shall be governed by a rude base ignorant and foolish multitude the veriest loud of all shall be their judge o oh, horrible and dangerous deluge deluge i call it and that for good reason for this shall be omitted in no season nor shall the earth of this foul stir be free till suddenly you in great store shall see the waters issue out with whose streams the most moderate of all shall moistened be and justly too because they did not spare the flocks of beasts that innocentest are but did their sinews and their bowels take not to the gods a sacrifice to make but usually to serve themselves for sport and now consider i do you exhort in such commotion so continual what rest can take the globe terrestrial most happy then are they that can it hold and use it carefully as precious gold by keeping it in gaol whence it shall have no help but him who being to it gave and to increase his mournful accident the sun before it set in the occident shall cease to dart upon it any light more than in an eclipse or in the night so that at once its favour shall be gone and liberty with it be left alone and yet before it come to ruin thus its quaking shall be as impetuous as etna's was when titan's sons lay under and yield when lost a fearful sound like thunder in a rhyme did not more quickly move when typhius did the vast huge hills remove and for despite into the sea them threw thus shall it then be lost by ways not few and change suddenly when those that have it to other men that after come shall leave it then shall it be high time to cease from this so long so great so tedious exercise for the great waters told you now by me will make each think where his retreat will be and yet before that they be clean dispersed you may behold in the air where naught was erst the burning heat of a great flame to rise lick up the water and the enterprise it resteth after those things to declare that those shall sit content who chosen are with all good things and with celestial man nay and richly recompensed every man the others at the last all stripped shall be that after this great work all men shall see how each shall have his due this their lot o oh, he is worthy praise that shrinketh not no sooner was this enigmatical monument read over but gargantua fetching a very deep sigh said unto those that stood by it is not now only i perceive that people call to the faith of the gospel and convinced with the certainty of evangelical truths are persecuted but happy is that man that shall not be scandalized but shall always continue to the end in aiming at the mark which god by his dear son hath set before us without being distracted or diverted by his carnal affections and depraved nature the monk then said what do you think in your conscience is meant and signified by this riddle what said gargantua the progress and carrying on of the divine truth by saint Goderin, said the monk that is not my exposition it is the style of the prophet merlin make upon it as many grave allegories and glosses as you will 
and dote upon it you and the rest of the world as long as you please for my part i can conceive no other meaning in it but a description of a set of tennis in dark and obscure terms the suborners of men are the makers of matches which are commonly friends after the two chases are made he that was in the upper end of the tennis court goeth out and the other cometh in they believe the first that saith the ball was over or under the line the waters are the heats that the players take till they sweat again the cords of the rackets are made of the guts of sheep or goats the globe terrestrial is the tennis ball after playing when the game is done they refresh themselves before a clear fire and change their shirts and very willingly they make all good cheer but most merrily those that have gained and so farewell end of chapter fifty eight a prophetical riddle recording by alan davis drake end of gargantua and pantagruel book one by francois rabelais translated by sir thomas urquhart